Introduction 1. Trading the last frontier You can be free. You can live and work anywhere in the world. You can be independent from routine and not answer to anybody. This is the life of a successful trader. Many aspire to it but few succeed. An amateur looks at a quote screen and sees millions of dollars sparkle in front of his face. He reaches for the money and loses. He reaches again and loses more. Traders lose because the game is hard, or out of ignorance, or from lack of discipline. If any of these ail you, I wrote this book for you. How I began to trade In the summer of 1976, I drove from New York to California. I took along a few books on psychiatry, several histories, and put a paperback copy of Engels' How to Buy Stocks into the trunk of my old Dodge. Little did I know that a dog-eared paperback, borrowed from a lawyer friend, would in due time change the course of my life. That friend, incidentally, had a perfect reverse golden touch any investment he touched went underwater. But that's another story. I gulped down the Engel book in campgrounds across America, finishing it on a Pacific beach in La Jolla. I had known nothing about the stock market, and the idea of making money by thinking gripped me. I grew up in the Soviet Union in the days when it was, in the words of a former US president, an evil empire. I hated the Soviet system and wanted to get out, but... 1. 2. Emigration was forbidden. I entered college at 16, graduated medical school at 22, completed my residency, and then took a job as a ship's doctor. Now I could break free. I jumped the Soviet ship in Abidjan, Ivory Coast. I ran to the U.S. Embassy through the clogged dusty streets of an African port city, chased by my ex crewmates The embassy put me in a safe house and then on a plane to New York. I landed at Kennedy Airport in February 1974, arriving from Africa with $25 in my pocket. I spoke some English, but did not know a soul in this country. I had no idea what stocks, bonds, futures, or options were and sometimes got a queasy feeling just from looking at the American dollar bills in my wallet. In the old country, a handful of them could buy you three years in Siberia. Reading how to buy stocks opened a whole new world for me. When I returned to New York, I bought my first stock it was Kindercare. A very bad thing happened I made money on my first trade and then the second one, leaving me with a delusion that making money in the markets was easy. It took me a couple of years to get rid of that notion. My professional career proceeded on a separate track. I completed a residency in psychiatry at a major university hospital, studied at the New York Psychoanalytic Institute, and served as book editor for the largest psychiatric newspaper in the United States. I still have my license, but my professional practice these days is at most an hour or two per month. I am busy trading, love traveling, and do some teaching. Learning to trade has been a long journey with soaring highs and aching lows. In moving forward or in circles I repeatedly knocked my head against the wall and ran my trading account into the ground. Each time I returned to a hospital job, put a stake together, read, thought, did more testing, and then started trading again. My trading slowly improved, but the breakthrough came when I realized that the key to winning was inside my head and not inside a computer. Psychiatry gave me the insight into trading that I will share with you. Do you really want to succeed? For many years I had a friend whose wife was fat. She was an elegant dresser, and she had been on a diet for as long as I had known her. She said she wanted to lose weight and she didn't eat cake or potatoes in front of people but when I came into her kitchen, I'd see her go at it with a big fork. She said she wanted to be slim, but remained fat. The short-term pleasure of eating was stronger for her than the delayed pleasure and health benefits of weight loss. My friend's wife reminded me of a great many traders who say they want to be successful but keep making impulsive trades going for the short-term thrills of gambling in the markets. 
people deceive and play games with themselves. Lying to others is bad, but lying to yourself is hopeless. Bookstores are full of good books on dieting, but the world is still full of overweight people. 2. Psychology is the key. 3. This book will teach you how to analyze and trade the markets, control risks, and deal with your own mind. I can give you the knowledge. Only you can supply the motivation. And remember this, an athlete who wants to enjoy risky sports must follow safety rules. When you reduce risks, you gain an added sense of accomplishment and control. The same goes for trading. You can succeed in trading only if you handle it as a serious intellectual pursuit. Emotional trading is lethal. To help ensure success, practice defensive money management. A good trader watches his capital as carefully as a professional scuba diver watches his air supply. 2. Psychology is the key. Remember how you felt the last time you placed an order? Were you anxious to jump in or afraid of losing? Did you procrastinate before entering your order? When you closed out a trade, did you feel elated or humiliated? The feelings of thousands of traders merge into huge psychological tides that move the markets. Getting off the roller coaster. The majority of traders spend most of their time looking for good trades. Once they enter a trade, they don't manage it but either squirm from pain or grin from pleasure. They ride an emotional roller coaster and miss the essential element of winning the management of their emotions. Their inability to manage themselves leads to poor risk management and losses. If your mind is not in gear with the markets, or if you ignore changes in mass psychology of crowds, you have no chance of making money trading. All winning professionals know the enormous importance of psychology. Most losing amateurs ignore it. Friends and students who know that I am a psychiatrist often ask whether this helps me as a trader. Good psychiatry and good trading have one important principle in common. Both focus on reality, on seeing the world the way it is. To live a healthy life, you have to live with your eyes open. To be a good trader, you need to trade with your eyes open, recognize real trends and turns, and not waste time or energy on fantasies, regrets, and wishful thinking. A man's game? Brokerage house records indicate that most traders are male. The files of my firm, Elder.com, confirm that approximately 85 to 90 percent of traders are male. The percentage of women traders among my clients, however, has more than doubled since the original edition of Trading for a Living was written 20 years ago. 4. The English language being what it is, he flows better than he or she or jumping between the two pronouns. To make reading easier, I'll use the masculine pronoun throughout this book. Of course, no disrespect is intended to the many women traders. As a matter of fact, I find that the percentage of successful traders is higher among women. As a group, they tend to be more disciplined and less arrogant than men. How this book is organized. The three pillars of successful trading are psychology, market analysis, and risk management. Good record keeping ties them together. This book will help you learn the essentials of all these areas. Part 1 of this book will show you how to manage emotions in trading. I discovered this method while practicing psychiatry. It greatly improved my trading, and it can help you too. Part 2 will focus on crowd psychology of the markets. Mass behavior is more primitive than that of individuals. If you understand how crowds behave, you'll be able to profit from their mood swings instead of being swept up in their emotional tides. Part 3 will show how chart patterns reflect crowd behavior. Classical technical analysis is applied social psychology, like poll taking. Support, resistance, breakouts, and other patterns reflect crowd behavior. Part 4 will teach you modern methods of computerized technical analysis. Indicators provide a better insight into mass psychology than classical chart patterns. Trend following indicators help identify market trends, 
while oscillators show when those trends are ready to reverse. Volume and open interest also reflect crowd behavior. Part 5 will focus on them as well as on the passage of time in the markets. Crowds have short attention spans, and a trader who relates price changes to time gains a competitive advantage. Part 6 will focus on the best tools for analyzing the stock market as a whole. They can be especially helpful for stock index futures and options traders. Part 7 will present several trading systems. We'll begin with the triple screen, which has become widely accepted, and then review the impulse and channel trading systems. Part 8 will discuss several classes of trading vehicles. It will outline pluses and minuses of equities, futures, options, and forex, while blowing away the promotional fog that clouds some of these markets. Part 9 will lead you into the all-important topic of money management. This essential aspect of successful trading is neglected by most amateurs. You can have a brilliant trading system, but if your risk management is poor, then a short string of losses will destroy your account. Armed with the iron triangle of risk control and other tools, you'll become a safer and more effective trader. Part 10 will delve into the nitty-gritty of trading setting stops, profit targets, and scanning. These practical details will help you implement any system you like. 3. The odds against you. 5. Part 11 will guide you through the principles and templates of good record keeping. The quality of your records is the single best predictor of your success. I'll offer you free downloads of the templates I like to use. Last but not least, this book has a separate study guide. It asks over 100 questions, each linked to a specific section of the book. All questions are designed to test your level of understanding and discover any blind spots. After you finish reading each section of this book, it'll make sense to turn to the study guide and answer questions relevant to that section. If test results turn out to be less than excellent, don't hurry, reread that section of the book, and retake the test. You are about to spend many hours with this book. When you find ideas that look important to you, test them in the only way that matters on your own market data and in your own trading. You will make this knowledge your own only by questioning and testing it. 3. The Odds Against You Why do most traders lose and wash out of the markets? Emotional and mindless trading are big reasons, but there is another. Markets are actually set up so that most traders must lose money. The trading industry slowly kills traders with commissions and slippage. You pay commissions for entering and exiting trades. Slippage is the difference between the price at which you place your order and the price at which it gets filled. When you place a limit order, it is filled at your price or better, or not at all. When you feel eager to enter or exit and place a market order, it's often filled at a worse price than prevailed when you placed it. Most amateurs are unaware of the harm done by commissions and slippage, just as medieval peasants could not imagine that tiny invisible germs could kill them. If you ignore slippage and deal with a broker who charges high commissions, you're acting like a peasant who drinks from a communal pool during a cholera epidemic. The trading industry keeps draining huge amounts of money from the markets. Exchanges, regulators, brokers, and advisors live off the markets, while generations of traders keep washing out. Markets need a fresh supply of losers just as builders of the ancient pyramids needed a fresh supply of slaves. Losers bring money into the markets, which is necessary for the prosperity of the trading industry. A minus sum game. Winners in a zero sum game make as much as losers lose. If you and I bet $20 on the direction of the next 100 point move in the Dow, one of us will collect $20 and the other will lose $20. A single bet has a component of luck, but the more knowledgeable person will keep winning more often than losing over a period of time. People buy the industry's propaganda about trading being a zero-sum game, take the bait, and open accounts. They don't realize that trading is a minus-sum game. 6. 
winners receive less than what losers lose because the industry drains money from the markets. For example, roulette in a casino is a minus sum game because the casino sweeps away between 3 and 6% of every bet. This makes roulette unwinnable in the long run. You and I can get into in a minus sum game if we make the same $20 bet on the next 100 point move in the Dow through brokers. When we settle, the loser will be out $23, and the winner will collect only $17, while two brokers will smile on their way to the bank. Commissions and slippage are to traders what death and taxes are to all of us. They take some fun out of life and ultimately bring it to an end. A trader must support his broker and the machinery of exchanges before he collects a dime. Being simply better than average is not good enough. You have to be head and shoulders above the crowd to win a minus sum game. Commissions Commissions have become much smaller in the past two decades. Twenty years ago, there were still brokers who charged one-way commissions of between half a percent and one percent of trade value. Buying a thousand shares of GE at $20 a share, with a total value of $20,000, would have set you back $100 to $200 on the way in and again on the way out. Fortunately for traders, commission rates have plummeted. The extortionate rates haven't completely disappeared. While preparing this book for publication, I received an email from a client in Greece with a small account whose broker a major European bank charged him a $40 minimum on any trade. I told him of my broker whose minimum for 100 shares is only $1. Without proper care, even seemingly small numbers can raise a tall barrier to success. Look at a fairly active trader with a $20,000 account, doing one round trip trade per day, 4 days a week. Paying $10 one way, by the end of the week he'll spend $80 in commissions, $40 for entries and $40 for exits. If he does that 50 weeks per year, by the end of the year he will have spent $4,000 on commission. That would be 20% of his account. George Soros, a top money manager, delivers an average 29% annual return. He wouldn't be where he is if he paid 20% a year in commissions. Even a small commission can build up a major barrier to success. I've heard brokers chuckle as they gossiped about clients who beat their brains out just to stay even with the game. Shop for the lowest possible commissions. Don't be shy about bargaining for lower rates. I've heard many brokers complain about a shortage of customers but not many customers complain about the shortage of brokers. Tell your broker it is in his best interest to charge you low commissions because you will survive and remain a client for a long time. Design a trading system that will trade less often. In my own trading, I maintain one major account with a broker who charges me. $7.99 for unlimited size trades and another with a broker who charges a penny a share, with a $1 minimum. When I trade expensive stocks, where I buy fewer than 3 the odds against you 7 800 shares, I give that order to the penny a share broker, otherwise, I go with the $7.99 per trade broker A beginning trader, making his first steps, should look for a penny a share broker Then you can trade your 100 shares for a dollar a futures trader can expect to pay just a couple of dollars for a round-trip trade. Slippage Slippage means having your orders filled at a different price than what you saw on the screen when you placed your order. It is like paying 50 cents for an apple in a grocery store even though the posted price is 49 cents. A penny is nothing but if you're buying a thousand apples or a thousand shares with a penny slippage, it'll come to $10 per order, probably greater than your commission. There are two main types of orders, market and limit. Your slippage depends on which of these types you use. A limit order says give me that apple at 49 cents. It guarantees the price, but doesn't guarantee a fill. You'll pay no more than 49 cents, 
but you may end up without the apple that you wanted. A market order says give me that apple. It guarantees a fill, but doesn't guarantee the price. If prices of apples are rising when you place your order, you may well pay more than you saw on the screen when you pushed the buy button. You may get hit by slippage. Slippage on market orders rises with market volatility. When the market begins to run, slippage goes through the roof. Do you have any idea how much slippage costs you? There is only one way to find out, write down the price at the time you placed a market order, compare it with your fill, and multiply the difference by the number of shares or contracts. Needless to say, you need a good record keeping system, such as a spreadsheet with columns for each of the above numbers. We offer such a spreadsheet to traders as a public service at. You'll be reading record this and record that throughout this book. Remember that good record keeping is essential for your success. You have to keep an eye on your wins and an even sharper eye on your losses because you can learn much more from them. Here's a shocking number, which you can confirm by keeping good records, an average trader spends three times more on slippage than on commissions. Earlier we talked about commissions raising a barrier to success. The barrier from slippage is three times higher. This is why, no matter how tempting a trade, you need to avoid buying at the market. You want to be in control and trade only at prices that suit you. There are thousands of stocks and dozens of futures contracts. If you miss a trade due to a limit order, there'll be countless other opportunities. Do not overpay. I almost always use limit orders and resort to market orders only when placing stops. When a stop level gets hit, it becomes a market order. When a trade is flaming out, it's not the time to economize. Get in slow but get out fast. 8. To reduce slippage, trade liquid, high volume markets and avoid thinly traded stocks, where slippage tends to be higher. Go long or short when the market is quiet, and use limit orders to buy or sell at specified prices. Keep a record of prices at the time you placed your order. Demand your broker fight the floor for a better fill when necessary. Bid ask spreads. Whenever the market is open, there are always two prices for any trading vehicle a bid and an ask. A bid is what people are offering to pay for that security at that moment, an ask is what sellers are demanding in order to sell it. A bid is always lower, an ask higher, and the spread between them keeps changing. Bid ask spreads vary between different markets and even in the same market at different times. Bid ask spreads are higher in thinly traded vehicles, as the pros who dominate such markets demand high fees from those who want to join their party. The bid ask spreads are likely to be razor thin, perhaps only one tick on a quiet day in an actively traded stock, future, or option. They grow wider as prices accelerate on the way up or down and may become huge dozens of ticks after a severe drop or a very sharp rally. Market orders get filled at the bad side of bid-ask spreads. A market order buys at the ask and sells at the bid. Little wonder that many professional traders make a good living from filling market orders. Don't feed the wolves use limit orders whenever possible. The Barriers to Success Slippage and commissions make trading similar to swimming in a piranha-infested river. Other expenses also drain traders' money. The cost of computers and data, fees for advisory services and books including the one you are reading now all come out of your trading funds. Look for a broker with the cheapest commissions and watch him like a hawk. Design a trading system that gives signals relatively infrequently and allows you to enter markets during quiet times. Use limit orders almost exclusively except when placing stops. Be careful on what tools you spend money, there are no magic solutions. Success cannot be bought, only earned. PART1 PART1 Individual Psychology 4. Why Trade? Trading appears deceptively easy. A beginner may cautiously enter the market, win a few times, and start feeling brilliant and invincible. 
that's when he starts taking wild risks and ends up with bad losses. People trade for many reasons some rational and many irrational. Trading offers an opportunity to make a lot of money in a hurry. Money symbolizes freedom to many people, even though they often don't know what to do with it. If you know how to trade, you can make your own hours, live and work anywhere you please, and never answer to a boss. Trading is a fascinating game, chess, poker, and a video game rolled into one. Trading attracts people who love challenges. It attracts risk takers and repels those who avoid risk. An average person gets up in the morning, goes to work, has a lunch break, returns home, has a beer and dinner, watches TV, and goes to sleep. If he makes a few extra dollars, he puts them into a savings account. A trader keeps odd hours and puts his capital at risk. Many traders are loners who abandon the certainties of the routine and take a leap into the unknown. Self-fulfillment Many people have an innate drive to achieve their personal best, to develop their abilities to the fullest. This drive, along with the pleasure of the game and the lure of money, propels traders to challenge the markets. Good traders tend to be hard-working and shrewd people, open to new ideas. The goal of a good trader, paradoxically, is not to make money. His goal is to trade well. 9. 10. Individual Psychology If he trades right, money follows almost as an afterthought. Successful traders keep honing their skills as they try to reach their personal best. A professional trader from Texas invited me to his office and said, if you sit across the table from me while I day trade, you won't be able to tell whether I am $2,000 ahead or $2,000 behind on that day. He has risen to a level where winning does not elate him and losing does not deflate him. He is so focused on trading right and improving his skills that money no longer influences his emotions. The trouble with self-fulfillment is that many people have self-destructive streaks. Accident-prone drivers keep destroying their cars, and self-destructive traders keep destroying their accounts. Markets offer vast opportunities for self-sabotage, as well as for self-fulfillment. Acting out your internal conflicts in the marketplace is a very expensive proposition. Traders who are not at peace with themselves often try to fulfill their contradictory wishes in the markets. If you don't know where you are going, you'll wind up somewhere you never wanted to be. 5. Reality versus Fantasy If a friend with little farming experience told you that he planned to feed himself with food grown on a quarter-acre plot, you'd expect him to go hungry. One can squeeze only so much from a small piece of land. There is, however, a field in which grown UPS let their fantasies fly in trading. A former employee told me that he planned to support himself trading a $6,000 account. When I tried to show him the futility of his plan, he quickly changed the topic. He was a bright analyst, but refused to see that his intensive farming plan was suicidal. In his desperate effort to succeed, he'd have to take on large positions and the slightest wiggle of the market will quickly put him out of business. A successful trader is a realist. He knows his abilities and limitations. He sees what's happening in the markets and knows how to react. He analyzes the markets without cutting corners, observes himself, and makes realistic plans. A professional trader cannot afford illusions. Once an amateur takes a few hits and gets a few margin calls, he swings from cocky to fearful and starts developing strange ideas about the markets. Losers buy, sell, or avoid trades due to their fantastic ideas. They act like children who are afraid to pass a cemetery or look under their bed at night because they are afraid of ghosts. The unstructured environment of the market makes it easy to develop fantasies. Most people who grow up in Western civilization have several similar fantasies. They are so widespread that when I studied at the New York Psychoanalytic Institute, there was a course called Universal Fantasies. For example, many people have a fantasy in childhood that they were adopted. 
This fantasy seems to explain the unfriendly and impersonal world. It consoles a child but prevents him from being aware of a reality he'd rather not see that his parents aren't that good. Our fantasies influence our behavior, even if we aren't consciously aware of them. 5. Reality versus Fantasy 11. In talking to hundreds of traders, I keep hearing several universal fantasies. They distort reality and stand in the way of trading success. A successful trader must identify his fantasies and get rid of them. The Brain Myth Losers who suffer from the brain myth will tell you, I lost because I didn't know trading secrets. Many have a fantasy that successful traders have some secret knowledge. That fantasy helps support a lively market in advisory services and ready-made trading systems. A demoralized trader may whip out his credit card to buy access to trading secrets. He may send money to a charlatan for a $3,000 can't miss, back-tested, computerized trading system. When that system self-destructs, he'll pull out his almost maxed out credit card again for a scientific manual that explains how he can stop losing and begin winning by contemplating the moon, the stars, or even Uranus. At an investment club we used to have in New York, I often ran into a famous financial astrologer. He often asked for free admission because he couldn't afford to pay a modest fee for the meeting and a meal. His main source of income remains collecting money for astrological trading predictions from hopeful amateurs. Losers don't realize that trading is intellectually fairly simple. It is nowhere near as demanding as taking out an appendix, building a bridge, or trying a case in court. Good traders are shrewd, but few are intellectuals. Many have never been to college, and some have dropped out of high school. Intelligent and hard-working people who have succeeded in their careers often feel drawn to trading. Why do they fail so often? What separates winners from losers isn't intelligence or secrets, and certainly not education. The Undercapitalization Myth Many losers think that they would trade successfully if they had a bigger account. People destroy their accounts either by a string of losses or a single abysmally bad trade. Often, after the loser is sold out, unable to meet a margin call, the market reverses and moves in the direction he expected. He starts fuming, had he survived another week, he would have made a fortune instead of losing. Such people look at market reversals that come too late and think that those turns confirm their methods. They may go back to work and earn, save, or borrow enough money to open another small account. History repeats itself, the loser gets wiped out, the market reverses and proves him right, but only too late he's been sold out again. That's when the fantasy is born, if only I had a bigger account, I could have stayed in the market longer and won. Some losers raise money from relatives and friends by showing them a paper track record. It seems to prove that they would have won big, if only they had had more. 12. Individual Psychology Money to work with. But even if they raise more money, they lose that, too as if the market were laughing at them. A loser is not undercapitalized his mind is underdeveloped. A loser can destroy a big account almost as quickly as a small one. An acquaintance of mine once blew out over $200 million in a day. His broker sold him out and then the market turned. He sued the broker and said to me, if only I had a bigger account. Apparently an account with $200 million wasn't big enough. A loser's true problem is not account size but overtrading and sloppy money management. He takes risks that are too big for his account size, however small or big. No matter how good his system may be, a streak of bad trades is sure to put him out of business. Amateurs neither expect to lose nor are prepared to manage losing trades. Calling themselves undercapitalized is a cop-out that helps them avoid two painful truths, their lack of a realistic money management plan and lack of discipline. A trader who wants to survive and prosper must control losses. You do that by risking only a tiny fraction of your equity on any single trade. 
learn from cheap mistakes in a small account. The one advantage of a large trading account is that the price of equipment and services represents a smaller percentage of your money. The owner of a million dollar fund who spends $5,000 on classes is only one half percent behind the game. The same expenditure would represent a deadly 25% of equity for a trader with a $20,000 account. The Autopilot Myth Traders who believe in the autopilot myth think that the pursuit of wealth can be automated. Some people try to develop an automatic trading system, while others buy systems from vendors. Men who have spent years honing their skills as lawyers, doctors, or businessmen plunk down thousands of dollars for canned competence. Most are driven by greed, laziness, and mathematical illiteracy. Systems used to be written on sheets of paper, but now they get downloaded on a computer. Some are primitive, others are elaborate, with built-in optimization and even money management rules. Many traders spend thousands of dollars searching for magic that will turn a few pages of computer code into an endless stream of money. People who pay for automatic trading systems are like medieval knights who paid alchemists for the secret of turning base metals into gold. Complex human activities do not lend themselves to automation. Computerized learning systems have not replaced teachers, and programs for doing taxes haven't created unemployment among accountants. Most human activities call for an exercise of judgment, machines and systems can help but not replace humans. Had there been a successful automatic trading system, its purchaser could move to Tahiti and spend the rest of his life at leisure, supported by a stream of checks from his broker. So far, the only people who've made money from trading systems are their sellers. They form a small but colorful cottage industry. If their systems worked, why would they sell them? They could move to Tahiti themselves and cash checks from their brokers. Meanwhile, every system seller has a line. Some say they like. 5. Reality versus Fantasy 13. Programming better than trading. Others claim that they sell their systems only to raise capital or even out of love for humanity. Markets are always changing and defeating automatic trading systems. Yesterday's rigid rules will work less well today and will probably stop working tomorrow. A competent trader can adjust his methods when he detects trouble. An automatic system is less adaptable and self-destructs. Airlines pay high salaries to pilots despite having autopilots. They do it because humans can handle unforeseen events. When a roof blows off an airliner over the Pacific or when a passenger jet loses both engines to a flock of geese over Manhattan, only a human can handle such crises. These emergencies have been reported in the press, and in each of them, experienced pilots manage to land their airliners by improvising solutions. No autopilot can do that. Betting your money on an automatic system is like betting your life on an autopilot. The first unexpected event will make your account crash and burn. There are good trading systems out there, but they have to be monitored and adjusted using individual judgment. You have to stay on the ball. You cannot abdicate responsibility for your success to a mechanical system. Traders with autopilot fantasies try to repeat what they felt as infants. Their mothers used to fulfill their needs for food, warmth, and comfort. Now they try to recreate the experience of passively lying on their backs and having profits flow to them like an endless stream of free, warm milk. The market is not your mother. It consists of tough men and women who look for ways to take money from you rather than pouring warm milk into your mouth. The Cult of Personality Most people pay lip service to their wish for freedom and independence, but when they come under pressure, they change their tune and start looking for a strong leadership. Traders in distress often seek directions from assorted gurus. When I was growing up in the former Soviet Union, children were taught that Stalin was our great leader. Later we found out what a monster he was, but while he was alive, most people enjoyed following the leader. He freed them from the need to think for themselves. 
Little Stalins were installed in every area of society in economics, biology, architecture, and so on. When I came to the United States and began to trade, I was amazed to see how many traders were looking for a guru their own little Stalin. The fantasy that someone else can make you rich is always with us. There are three types of gurus in the financial markets, market cycle gurus, magic method gurus, and dead gurus. Cycle gurus call important market turns. Method gurus promote new highways to riches. Still others have escaped criticism and invited cult following through the simple mechanism of departing this world. Market Cycle Gurus For many decades, the US stock market has generally followed a four-year cycle. The broad stock market has normally spent 2.5 or 3 years going up and 1 or 1.5 years. 14. Individual Psychology Going Down a new market cycle guru emerges in almost every major stock cycle, once every four years. A guru's fame tends to last for two to three years. The reigning period of each guru coincides with a major bull market in the United States. A market cycle guru forecasts rallies and declines. Each correct forecast increases his fame and prompts even more people to buy or sell when he issues his pronouncements. A market cycle guru has a pet theory about the market. That theory cycles, volume, Elliott wave, whatever is usually developed several years prior to reaching stardom. At first, the market refuses to follow an aspiring guru's pet theory. Then the market changes and for several years comes in gear with the guru's calls. That is when the guru's star rises high above the marketplace. Compare this to what happens to fashion models as public tastes change. One year, blondes are popular, another year, redheads. Suddenly, last year's blonde star is no longer wanted for the front cover of a major magazine. Everybody wants a dark model, or a woman with a birthmark on her face. A model doesn't change public tastes do. Gurus always come from the fringes of market analysis. They are never establishment analysts. Institutional employees play it safe afraid to stick their necks out and almost never achieve spectacular results. A market cycle guru is an outsider with a unique theory. A guru remains famous for as long as the market behaves according to his the, or usually for less than the duration of one four-year market cycle. At some point, the market changes and starts marching to a different tune. A guru continues to use old methods that worked so well in the past and loses his following. When the guru's forecasts stop working, public admiration turns to hatred. It's impossible for a discredited market cycle guru to return to stardom. All market cycle gurus have several traits in common. They become active in the forecasting business several years prior to reaching stardom. Each has a unique theory, a few followers, and some credibility, conferred by sheer survival in the advisory business. The fact that each guru's theory did not work for a number of years is ignored by his followers. When the theory becomes correct, the mass media take notice. When a theory stops working, mass adulation turns to hatred. When you recognize that a successful new guru is emerging, it may be profitable to jump on his bandwagon. It's even more important to recognize when a guru has reached his peak. All gurus crash and by definition, they crash from the height of their fame. When a guru becomes accepted by the mass media, it's a good sign that he has reached his crest. The mainstream media is wary of outsiders. When several mass magazines devote space to a hot market guru, you know that his end is near. Mass psychology being what it is, new gurus will continue to emerge. Magic Method Gurus While cycle gurus are creatures of the stock market, method gurus are more prominent in the derivatives markets. A method guru erupts on the financial scene after discovering a new analytic or trading method. Traders always look for an edge, an advantage over fellow traders. Like knights shopping for swords, they are willing to pay handsomely for their trading tools. No price is too high if it lets them tap into a money pipeline. 
5. Reality versus Fantasy 15. A magic method guru sells a new set of keys to market profits speed lines, cycles, market profile, etc. It may have an edge in the beginning, but as soon as enough people become familiar with a new method and test it in the markets, it inevitably deteriorates and starts losing popularity. Markets are forever grinding down each method's edge, and what worked yesterday is less likely to work today and highly unlikely a year from now. Oddly enough, even in this era of global communications, reputations change slowly. A guru whose image has been destroyed in his own country can make money peddling his theory overseas. That point has been made to me by a guru who compared his continued popularity in Asia to what happens to faded American singers and movie stars. They are unable to attract an audience in the United States, but they can still make a living singing abroad. Dead Gurus The third type of a market guru is a dead guru. His books are reissued, his market courses are scrutinized by new generations of eager traders, and the legend of the dear departed analyst's prowess and personal wealth grows posthumously. The dead guru is no longer among us and cannot capitalize on his fame. Other promoters profit from his reputation and expired copyrights. One dear departed guru is R. N. Eliot, but the best example of such a legend is W. D. Gan. Various opportunists sell GAN courses and GAN software. They claim that GAN was one of the best traders who ever lived, that he left a $50 million estate, and so on. I interviewed W.D. GAN's son, an analyst for a Boston bank. He told me that his famous father could not support his family by trading but earned his living by writing and selling instructional courses. He could not afford a secretary and made his son work for him. When W. D. Gan died in the 1950s, his estate, including his house, was valued at slightly over $100,000. The legend of W. D. Gan, the giant of trading, is perpetuated by those who sell courses and other paraphernalia to gullible customers. The Followers of Gurus A guru has to produce original research for several years, then get lucky when the market turns his way. While some gurus are dead, those who are alive range from serious academic types to great showmen. To read about scandals surrounding many gurus, try Winner Takes All by William R. Gallagher. When we pay a guru, we expect to get back more than we spend. We act like a man who bets a few dollars against a three-card Monte dealer on a street corner. He hopes to win more than he put down on an overturned crate. Only the ignorant or greedy take the bait. Some people turn to gurus in search of a strong leader. They look for a parent-like omniscient provider. As a friend once said, they walk with their umbilical cords in hand, looking for a place to plug them in. A smart promoter provides such a receptacle, for a fee. The public wants gurus, and new gurus will come. As an intelligent trader, you must realize that in the long run, no guru is going to make you rich. You have to work on that yourself. 16. Individual Psychology Occasionally, when I give a talk or appear on TV, someone introduces me as a famous guru. I shudder at those words and interrupt such introductions. A guru is someone claiming to lead the crowds across the desert for a donation. No such pitches here. I always begin by explaining that there are no magic methods, that the field of trading is as huge and diverse as that of medicine, where one needs to choose one specialty and work hard to become good at it. I chose my path a long time ago, and what I do in front of a class is simply think out loud, sharing my modes of research and decision making. Trade with your eyes open. Wishful thinking is stronger than dollars. Recent research has proven that people have a prodigious ability to lie to themselves and avoid seeing the truth. Duke University professor Dan Ariely describes a clever experiment. A group of people are given an intelligence test, but half of them are accidentally shown a response sheet, allowing them to look up correct answers before recording their own. Needless to say, they score above the rest. 
Next, everybody is asked to predict their grades on the next IQ test, in which there will be absolutely no cheat sheets and those who predict correctly will get paid. Surprisingly, the half of the group that scored higher with cheat sheets predicted higher results for the next test. The cheaters wanted to believe they were very smart, even though their incorrect predictions of success would cost them money. A successful trader cannot afford wishful thinking he must be a realist. There are no cheat sheets in the markets you can see the truth in your trade diaries and equity curves. To win in the markets, we need to master three essential components of trading, sound psychology, a logical trading system, and an effective risk management plan. These are like three legs of a stool remove one and the stool will fall. It is a typical beginner mistake to focus exclusively on indicators and trading systems. You have to analyze your feelings as you trade to make sure that your decisions are sound. Your trades must be based on clearly defined rules. You have to structure your money management so that no string of losses can kick you out of the game. 6. Self-destructiveness Trading is a very hard game. A trader who wants to win and remain successful in the long run has to be extremely serious about his craft. He cannot afford to be naive or to trade because of some hidden psychological agenda. Unfortunately, trading often appeals to impulsive people, gamblers, and those who feel that the world owes them a living. If you trade for the excitement, you'll inevitably take trades with bad odds and accept needless risks. The markets are unforgiving, and emotional trading always results in losses. 6. Self-destructiveness 17. Gambling Gambling means betting on games of chance or skill. It exists in all societies, and most people have gambled at some point in their lives. Freud believed that gambling was universally attractive because it was a substitute for masturbation. The repetitive and exciting activity of the hands, the irresistible urge, the resolutions to stop, the intoxicating quality of pleasure, and the feelings of guilt link gambling and masturbation. Dr. Ralph Greenson, a prominent California psychoanalyst, has divided gamblers into three groups, the normal person who gambles for diversion and who can stop when he wishes, the professional gambler, who selects gambling as his means of earning a livelihood, and the neurotic gambler, who gambles because he is driven by unconscious needs and is unable to stop. A neurotic gambler either feels lucky or wants to test his luck. Winning gives him a sense of power. He feels pleased, like a baby feeding at a breast. In the end, a neurotic gambler always loses because he tries to recreate that omnipotent feeling of bliss instead of concentrating on a realistic long-term game plan. Dr. Sheila Bloom, director of the Compulsive Gambling Program at South Oaks Hospital in New York, called gambling an addiction without a drug. Most gamblers are men who gamble for the action. Women tend to gamble as a means of escape. Losers usually hide their losses and try to look and act like winners, but are plagued by self-doubt. Trading stocks, futures, and options gives a gambler a high, while looking more respectable than betting on the ponies. Gambling in the financial markets has a greater aura of sophistication than playing numbers with a bookie. Gamblers feel happy when trades go in their favor. They feel terribly low when they lose. They differ from successful professionals who focus on long-term plans and don't get particularly upset or excited over any single trade. The key sign of gambling is the inability to resist the urge to bet. If you feel that you are trading too much and the results are poor, stop trading for a month. This will give you a chance to reevaluate your trading. If the urge to trade is so strong that you cannot stay away from the action for a month, then it is time to visit your local chapter of Gamblers Anonymous or start using the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, outlined later in this chapter. Self-Sabotage after practicing psychiatry for decades, I became convinced that most failures in life are due to self-sabotage. We fail in our professional, personal, and business affairs not because of bad luck or incompetence, but to fulfill an unconscious wish to fail. 
a brilliant friend of mine had a lifelong history of demolishing his success. As a young man, he was a successful pharmacist but lost his business, became a broker and rose near the top of his firm but was sued, turned to trading but busted out while disentangling himself from previous disasters. He blamed all his failures on envious bosses, incompetent regulators, and an unsupportive wife. 18. Individual Psychology Finally, he hit bottom. He had no job and no money. He borrowed a quote terminal from another busted out trader and raised capital from a few people who had heard that he had traded well in the past. He started making money for his pool, and as the word spread, more people invested. My friend was on a roll. At that point, he went on a speaking tour of Asia but continued to trade from the road. He took a side trip into a country famous for its brothels, leaving a very large open position in bond futures, with no protective stop. By the time he returned to civilization, the market had staged a major move and his pool was wiped out. Did he try to figure out his problem? To learn? No he blamed his broker. Afterwards I helped him get an attractive job at a major data company, but there he began to bite the hands that fed him and was fired. In the end, this brilliant man was going door to door, selling aluminum siding while others made money using his techniques. When traders get in trouble, they tend to blame others, bad luck, or anything else. It hurts to look within yourself for the cause of your failure. A prominent trader came to me for a consultation. His equity was being demolished by a rally in the US dollar, in which he was heavily short. He had grown up fighting an abusive and arrogant father. He had made a name for himself by betting large positions on reversals of established trends. This trader kept adding to his short position because he could not admit that the market, which represented his father, was bigger and stronger than he was. These are just two examples of how people act out their self-destructive tendencies. We sabotage ourselves by acting like impulsive children rather than intelligent adults. We cling to our self-defeating patterns. They can be treated failure is a curable disease. The mental baggage from childhood can prevent you from succeeding in the markets. You have to identify your weaknesses and work to change. Keep a trading diary write down your reasons for entering and exiting every trade. Look for repetitive patterns of success and failure. The Demolition Derby All society members make small allowances to protect one another from the consequences of their mistakes. When you drive, you try to avoid hitting other cars, and they try to avoid hitting you. If someone cuts in front of you on a highway, you may curse, but you will slow down. If someone swings open the door of a parked car, you swerve. You avoid collisions because they are costly for both parties. Almost all professions provide safety nets for their members. Your bosses, colleagues, and clients will warn you when you behave badly or self destructively. There is no such safety net in trading which makes it more dangerous than most human endeavors. The markets offer endless opportunities to self-destruct. Buying at the high point of the day is like swinging your car door open into the traffic. When your order to buy reaches the floor, traders rush to sell to you to tear off your door along with your arm. Other traders want you to fail because when you lose they get your money. 7. Trading Psychology 19. Markets operate without normal human helpfulness. Every trader gets hit by others. Every trader tries to hit others. The trading highway is littered with wrecks. Trading is the most dangerous human endeavor, short of war. Controlling self-destructiveness Most people go through life making the same mistakes decade after decade. Some structure their lives to succeed in one area, while acting out their internal conflicts in another. You need to be aware of your tendency to sabotage yourself. Stop blaming your losses on bad luck or on others, and take responsibility for your results. Start keeping a diary a record of all your trades, with reasons for entering and exiting them. 
look for repetitive patterns of success and failure. Those who don't learn from the past are condemned to repeat it. A trader needs a psychological safety net the way a mountain climber needs his survival gear. I found the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, outlined below, to be of great help at an early stage of trader development. Strict money management rules also provide a safety net, while the diary helps you learn from your mistakes as well as successes. 7. Trading Psychology Your success or failure as a trader depends on your emotions. You may have a brilliant trading system, but if you feel arrogant, frightened, or upset, your account is sure to suffer. If you become aware of fear, greed, or a gambler's high, close your trades. In trading, you compete against the sharpest minds in the world. Commissions and slippage slant the field against you. Now, on top of that, if you allow your emotions to interfere with your trading, the battle is lost. My friend and partner in Spick E Trade. Com Carrie Lovorn is fond of repeating, it is hard enough to know what the market is going to do, if you don't know what you are going to do, the game is lost. Having a good trading system is not enough. Many traders with good systems wash out because psychologically they are not prepared to win. Bending the rules Markets offer enormous temptations, like walking through a gold vault or through a harem. They provoke great surges of greed and even greater waves of fear of losing what we've got. Those feelings cloud our perceptions of market reality. Most amateurs feel like geniuses after a short winning streak. It is exciting to believe that you are so good that all your trades are sure to be winners. That's when traders start deviating from their rules and damage their accounts. Traders gain some knowledge, win, their emotions kick in, and they self-destruct. Most traders promptly give their killings back to the markets, which are full of rags to riches to rags stories. The hallmark of a successful trader is the ability to accumulate equity. 20. Individual Psychology You need to make trading as objective as possible. Be sure to follow money management rules. Keep a spreadsheet listing all your trades, including commissions and slippage. Keep a diary of all your trades with before and after charts. At the early stages of your trading career, you may have to devote as much energy to analyzing yourself as analyzing the markets. When I was learning to trade, I read every book on trading psychology I could find. Many writers offered sensible advice. Some stress discipline, you cannot let the markets sway you. Don't make decisions during trading hours. Plan a trade, and trade a plan. Others stressed flexibility, don't enter the market with any preconceived notions. Change your plans when markets change. Some experts suggested isolation no business news, no Wall Street Journal, no listening to other traders, just you and the market. Others advised being open-minded, keeping in touch with other traders, and soaking up fresh ideas. Each piece of advice seemed to make sense, but they contradicted one another. I kept reading, trading, and focusing on system development. I also continued to practice psychiatry. I never thought the two fields were connected until I had a sudden insight. The idea that changed how I trade came from psychiatry. The insight that changed my trading. Like most psychiatrists, I always had some patients with alcohol problems. I also served as a consultant to a major drug rehabilitation program. It didn't take me long to realize that alcoholics and addicts were more likely to recover in self-help groups than in classical psychiatric settings. Psychotherapy, medications, and expensive hospitals and clinics can sober up a drunk but seldom succeed in helping him remain sober. Most addicts quickly relapse. They have a much better chance to recover if they become active in Alcoholics Anonymous and similar self-help groups. Once I realized that AA members were more likely to stay sober and rebuild their lives, I became a big fan of Alcoholics Anonymous. I began sending patients with drinking problems to AA and related groups, 
such as ACOA. If an alcoholic came to me for treatment, I insisted that he also go to A because otherwise he'd be wasting both our time and his money. One night I stopped by a friend's office on the way to a party. We had two hours before it began, and my friend, who was a recovering alcoholic, said, do you want to take in a movie or go to an AA meeting? I had sent many patients to AA but had never been to a meeting, since I have never had a drinking problem. I jumped at a chance to attend an AA meeting it was a new experience. The meeting was held at a local YMCA. A dozen men and a few women sat on folding chairs in a plain room. The meeting lasted an hour. I was amazed by what I heard these people seemed to talk about my trading. They talked about alcohol, but as long as I substituted the word loss for alcohol, most of what they said applied to me. My account equity was swinging up and down in those days. I left that meeting knowing that I had to handle my losses the way AA handles alcoholism. 8 Trading Lessons from AA 21. 8 Trading Lessons from AA Almost any drunk can stay sober for a few days until the urge to drink drives him back to the bottle. He cannot resist as long as he continues to think and feel like an alcoholic. Sobriety begins inside a person's mind. Alcoholics Anonymous has a system for changing the way people think and feel about drinking. AA members use a 12-step program for changing their minds. These 12 steps, described in the book 12 Steps and 12 Traditions, refer to 12 stages of personal growth. Recovering alcoholics attend meetings where they share their experiences with other recovering alcoholics, supporting each other in their sobriety. Any member can get a sponsor another AA member whom he can call for support when he feels the urge to drink. AA was founded in the 1930s by two alcoholics a doctor and a traveling salesman who began meeting to help each other stay sober. They developed a system that worked so well, others began to join them. AA has only one goal to help its members stay sober. It doesn't ask for money, takes no political positions, and runs no promotional campaigns. AA keeps growing thanks only to word of mouth and owes its success only to its effectiveness. The 12-step program of AA is so effective that people with other problems now use it. There are 12-step groups for children of alcoholics, gamblers, and others. I've become convinced that traders can stop losing money if they apply the key principles of Alcoholics Anonymous to their trading. Denial A social drinker enjoys a cocktail, a glass of wine, or a beer but stops when he feels he's had enough. An alcoholic's chemistry is different. Once an alcoholic takes a drink, he feels an urge to continue until he passes out or his money runs out. A drunk may say that he needs to cut down on drinking, but can't admit that it's out of control. Try telling an alcoholic relative, friend, or employee that his drinking is out of control and damaging his life, and you'll run into a wall of denial. An alcoholic may say, my boss fired me cause I was hung over and came in late. My wife took the kids and left cause she had no sense to begin with. My landlord is trying to kick me out of the apartment cause I'm a little behind on the rent. I'm gonna have to cut down on my drinking, and everything will be alright. This man has lost his family and his job. He is about to lose the roof over his head. His life is spinning out of control but he keeps saying that he can cut down on his drinking. This is denial. Alcoholics deny their problems while their lives are falling apart. As long as an alcoholic believes that he can control his drinking, he is headed downhill. Nothing will ever change, even if he gets a new job, a new wife, and a new landlord. Alcoholics deny that alcohol controls their lives. When they talk of reducing drinking, they talk about managing the unmanageable. They are like a driver whose car spins out of control on a mountain road. When the car careens down a cliff, it is. 22. Individual Psychology Too late to promise to drive carefully. An alcoholic's life careens out of control, while he denies he's an alcoholic. 
there is a stark parallel between an alcoholic and a trader whose account is being demolished by losses. As he keeps changing his trading tactics, he acts like an alcoholic who tries to solve his problem by switching from hard liquor to beer. A loser denies that he's lost control over his trading life. Rock Bottom A drunk can begin his journey to recovery only after he admits that he is an alcoholic. He must see that alcohol controls his life and not the other way around. Most drunks cannot accept this painful truth. They can face it only after they hit rock bottom. Some alcoholics hit rock bottom when they develop a life-threatening illness. Others hit it after being rejected by their family or losing a job. An alcoholic needs to sink to a point so low, so deep down in the gutter, so unbearably painful that it finally penetrates his denial. The pain of hitting rock bottom makes an alcoholic see how deep he has sunk. He sees a simple stark choice either turn his life around or die. Only then is an alcoholic ready to begin his journey to recovery. Prophets give traders an emotional high and a feeling of power. They try to get high again, put on reckless trades, and give back their profits. Most traders cannot stand the pain of severe losses. They die as traders after hitting rock bottom and wash out of the markets. The few survivors realize that the main trouble is not with their methods it is with their thinking. They can change and become successful traders. The first step. An alcoholic who wants to recover has to go through 12 steps 12 stages of personal growth. He needs to change how he thinks and feels, how he relates to himself and others. The first step of AA is the hardest, to admit that one is powerless over alcohol. An alcoholic must recognize that his life has become unmanageable, that alcohol is stronger than he is. Most cannot take that step, drop out, and go on to destroy their lives. If alcohol is stronger than you, then you can never touch it again, not even a sip, for as long as you live. You have to give up drinking forever. Most drunks do not want to give up that pleasure. They destroy their lives rather than take the first step of AA. Only the pain of hitting rock bottom can motivate them to take that first step. One day at a time. You may have seen bumper stickers that say, one day at a time or easy does it. Those are AA slogans, and people who drive those cars are probably recovering alcoholics. Planning for life without alcohol can seem overwhelming. That's why AA encourages its members to live sober one day at a time. 9 Losers Anonymous 23. The goal of every AA member is to stay sober today and go to bed sober tonight. Gradually, days become weeks, then months, then years. AA meetings and other activities help each recovering alcoholic stay sober, one day at a time. Recovering alcoholics receive and give others invaluable support and fellowship at these meetings. They are held at all hours, all over the world. Traders have much to learn from those meetings. An AA meeting One of the best things that a trader can do is go to an AA meeting. I especially recommend it to any trader on a losing streak. Call Alcoholics Anonymous and ask about the next open meeting or beginners meeting in your area. A meeting lasts about an hour. You can sit in the back of the room and listen carefully. There is no pressure to speak, and nobody asks for your last name. Each meeting begins with a long term member getting up and speaking about his or her personal struggle for recovery from alcoholism. Several other members share their experiences. There is a collection to cover expenses, give a dollar if you like. All you have to do is listen carefully. And every time you hear the word alcohol, substitute the word loss for it. You will feel as if the people in the meeting are talking about your trading. 9 Losers Anonymous A social drinker enjoys an occasional drink, but an alcoholic craves alcohol. He denies that alcohol controls and destroys his life until he reaches a personal crisis. It may be a life threatening illness, unemployment, abandonment by the family or another unbearably painful event. A calls it hitting rock bottom. 
The pain of hitting rock bottom punctures an alcoholic's denial. He sees a stark choice to drown or to come up for air. His first step to recovery is to admit that he is powerless over alcohol. A recovering alcoholic can never drink again. Loss is to a loser what alcohol is to an alcoholic. A small loss is like a single drink. A big loss is like a bender. A series of losses is like an alcoholic binge. A loser keeps switching between different markets, gurus, and trading systems. His equity shrinks while he is trying to recreate the pleasurable sensation of winning. Losing traders think and act like alcoholics, except that their speech is not slurred. The two groups are so similar that you can predict what a loser will do by using alcoholics as a model. Alcoholism is a curable disease and so is losing. Losers can change by using the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. The Urge to Trade Successful traders treat drawdowns the way social drinkers treat alcohol. They have a little and stop. If they take several losses in a row, they take that as a signal that. 24. Individual Psychology Something isn't working, perhaps their system isn't in gear with the current market environment. It's time for a break and a fresh look at the markets. Losers, on the other hand, cannot stop they keep trading because they are addicted to the excitement of the game and keep hoping for a big win. A prominent trading advisor who has since busted out wrote that to him the pleasure of trading was higher than that of sex or flying jet aircraft. Just as alcoholics proceed from social drinking to drunkenness, losers take bigger and bigger risks. They cross the hugely important line, the one between taking a business risk and gambling. Many losers don't even know that line exists. Losers feel the urge to trade, just as alcoholics feel the urge to drink. They make impulsive trades, go on trading binges, and try to trade their way out of a hole. Losers bleed money from their accounts. Most of them bust out, but some turn to managing other people's money after losing their own, still others sell advisory services, like burned out drunks who wash glasses in a bar. Most losers hide their losses from themselves and from everyone else. They keep no records and throw away brokerage statements. A loser is like an alcoholic who doesn't want to know how many ounces of liquor he drank into the hole. A loser trades in a fog and doesn't know why he keeps losing. If he knew, he would have done something about it and become a winner. A loser tries to manage his trading the way an alcoholic tries to manage his drinking. Losers desperate hopes for magic solutions help advisors sell their services to the public. They switch to new trading systems, buy more software, and look for tips from new gurus. As losses mount and equity shrinks, a loser grows desperate and converts outright positions into spreads, doubles up on losing positions, reverses and trades in the opposite direction, and so on. All of that does him no more good than switching from hard liquor to wine can help an alcoholic. A losing trader careens out of control, trying to manage the unmanageable. Alcoholics die prematurely and most traders bust out of the markets and never come back. New trading methods, hot tips, and improved software will not help a person who cannot handle himself. A loser keeps getting high from trading while his equity shrinks. Trying to tell him that he is a loser is like trying to take a bottle away from a drunk. A loser has to hit rock bottom before he can begin to recover. You have to change how you think in order to stop losing and begin your recovery as a trader. Traders Rock Bottom Hitting rock bottom feels horrible. It is painful and humiliating. You hit it when you lose money you cannot afford to lose. You hit it when you gamble away your savings. 9 Losers Anonymous 25 you hit it after you tell your friends how smart you are and later have to ask them for a loan. You hit rock bottom when the market comes roaring at you and yells, you fool. Some people hit rock bottom after only a few weeks of trading. Others keep adding money to their accounts to postpone the day of reckoning. It hurts to see a loser in the mirror.
We spend our lifetime building up self-esteem. Most of us have a high opinion of ourselves. Your first impulse may be to hide, but remember, you are not alone. Almost every trader has been there. Many traders who hit rock bottom slink away from the market and never look back. Many who trade today will be gone in a year, if not sooner. They'll hit rock bottom, crumble, and leave. They'll try to forget trading like a bad dream. Some will lick their wounds and wait until the pain fades away and then return, having learned little. They'll be fearful, and their fear will further impair their trading. Fortunately, some traders will recoil from rock bottom to begin the process of change and growth. For these individuals, the pain of hitting rock bottom will break the vicious cycle of getting high from winning and then losing everything and crashing. When you admit that your personal problem causes you to lose, you can begin building a new trading life. You can start developing the discipline of a winner. Trader's First Step Just as an alcoholic needs to admit that he can't control his drinking, a trader needs to admit that he cannot control his losses. The first step of an AA member is to say, I am an alcoholic, I am powerless over alcohol. As a trader, you have to take your first step and say, I am a loser, I am powerless over losses. Recovering alcoholics struggle to stay sober, one day at a time. A trader can recover, using the principles of AA. Now you have to struggle to trade without losses, one day at a time. You may say that's impossible. What if you buy, and the market immediately declines? What if you sell short, and it turns out to be the bottom tick, and the market immediately rallies? Even the best traders lose money on some trades. The answer is to draw a line between a businessman's risk and a loss. As traders, we always take businessman's risks, but we may never take a loss greater than this predetermined risk. For example, a storekeeper takes a risk every time he stocks new merchandise. If it doesn't sell, he'll lose money. An intelligent businessman takes only risks that will not put him out of business, even if he makes several mistakes in a row. Stocking two crates of merchandise may be a sensible business risk, but stocking a full trailer is probably a gamble. As a trader, you are in the business of trading. You need to define your businessman's risk the maximum amount of money you'll risk on any single trade. There is no standard dollar amount, just as there is no standard business. An acceptable businessman's risk depends, first of all, on the size of your trading account. It also depends on your trading method and pain tolerance. 26. Individual Psychology the concept of a businessman's risk will change the way you manage your money. The absolute maximum a trader may risk on any trade is 2% of his account equity. For example, if you have $30,000 in your account, you may not risk more than $600 per trade, and if you have $10,000, you may not risk more than $200. If your account is small, limit yourself to trading fewer shares, less expensive futures, or many contracts. If you see an attractive trade, but a logical stop would have to be placed where more than 2% of equity would be at risk pass on that trade. You may risk less, but you may never risk more. You must avoid risking more than 2% on a trade the way a recovering alcoholic avoids bars. A trader who blames high commissions on a broker and slippage on a floor trader gives up control of his trading life. Try to reduce both, but take responsibility for them. If you lose even a dollar more than your businessman's risk, including commissions and slippage, you are a loser. Do you keep good trading records? Poor record keeping is a sure sign of a gambler. Good businessmen keep good records. Your trading records must show the date and price of every entry and exit, slippage, commissions, stops, all adjustments of stops, reasons for entering, objectives for exiting, maximum paper profit, maximum paper loss after a stop was hit. 
and any other data necessary to review and fully understand your trade later in the future. If you bail out of a trade within your businessman's risk, it is normal business. There is no bargaining, no waiting for another tick, no hoping for a change. Losing a dollar more than your established businessman's risk is like getting drunk, getting into a brawl, getting sick to your stomach on your way home, and waking up in a gutter. You would never want that to happen. A meeting for one. When you go to an AA meeting, you'll see people who have not had a drink in years stand up and say, Hello, my name is so and so, and I am an alcoholic. Why do they call themselves alcoholics after years of sobriety? Because if they think they have beaten alcoholism, they will start drinking again. If a person stops thinking he is an alcoholic, he is free to take a drink, then another, and will probably end up in the gutter again. A person who wants to stay sober must remember that he is an alcoholic for the rest of his life. Traders would benefit from our own self-help organization ID call it Losers Anonymous. Why not Traders Anonymous? Because a harsh name helps focus attention on our self-destructive tendencies. After all, Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't call itself Drinkers Anonymous. As long as you call yourself a loser, you'll focus on avoiding losses. Several traders have argued against what they thought was the negative thinking of Losers Anonymous. A retired woman from Texas, a highly successful trader, described her approach. She is very religious, prays every morning, and then drives to an office where she actively trades. Whenever the market starts moving against her, she cuts her losses very fast because it would not please the Lord for her to lose his. 10 Winners and Losers 27. Money I thought that our methods were similar. The goal is to cut losses due to some objective, external rule. Trading within a businessman's risk is like living without alcohol. A trader has to admit that he is a loser, just as a drunk has to admit that he is an alcoholic. Then he can begin his journey to recovery. This is why every morning before trading I suggest saying, Good morning, my name is so and so, and I am a loser. I have it in me to do serious financial damage to my account. This is like an AA meeting it keeps your mind focused on the first principles. Even if you take thousands of dollars out of the market today, tomorrow you say, good morning, my name is so and so and I am a loser. A friend of mine joked, when I sit in front of my quote screen in the morning, I say, my name is John, and I'm gonna rip your throat out. His thinking generates tension. Losers Anonymous thinking generates serenity. A trader who feels serene and relaxed can focus on looking for the best and safest trades. When a sober man and a drunk enter a race, you know who is more likely to win. A drunk may win once in a while, but the sober man is the one to bet on. You want to be the sober man in that race. 10 Winners and Losers we come to trading from different walks of life and bring along our mental baggage. Many of us find that when we act in the market the way we do in our everyday life, we lose money. Most of all, your success or failure depends on your ability to use intellect rather than act emotionally. A trader who feels overjoyed when he wins and depressed when he loses is at the mercy of market moves and cannot accumulate equity. To be a winner in the market you must act coolly and responsibly. The pain of losing drives people to look for magic methods. At the same time, they discard much of what is useful in their professional or business backgrounds. Like an ocean. The market is like an ocean it moves up and down regardless of what you wish. You may feel joy when you buy a stock and it explodes in a rally. You may feel drenched with fear when you go short but the market rises, melting your equity with every uptick. Those feelings have nothing to do with the market they exist only inside of you. The market doesn't know you exist. You can do nothing to influence it. The ocean doesn't care about your welfare, but it has no wish to hurt you either. You can only control your behavior. A sailor cannot control the ocean, but he can control himself.
he can study currents and weather patterns, learn good sailing techniques, and gain experience. He can learn when to sail and when to stay in the harbor. A successful sailor uses his intelligence. 28. Individual Psychology An ocean can be useful you can fish in it and use its surface to get to other islands. An ocean can be dangerous you can drown in it. The more rational your approach, the more likely you are to get what you want. On the other hand, when you act out your emotions, you cannot focus on the reality of the ocean. A trader has to study trends and reversals in the market the way a sailor studies the ocean. He must trade on a small scale while learning to handle his account. You can never control the market, but you can learn to control yourself. After a string of profitable trades, a beginner may feel he can walk on water. He starts taking wild risks and blows up his account. On the other hand, an amateur who takes several losses in a row often feels so demoralized that he cannot place an order even when his system gives him a signal to buy or sell. If trading makes you feel elated or frightened, you cannot fully use your intellect. When joy sweeps you off your feet, you will make irrational trades and lose. When fear grips you, you'll miss profitable trades. A sailor whose boat is being battered by ocean winds battens his sails reduces sail area. The first remedy for a trader battered by the market is to reduce the size of his trades. Trade small while you're learning or when feeling stressed. A professional trader uses his head and stays calm. Only amateurs become excited or depressed. Emotional trading is a luxury that nobody can afford. Emotional trading Most people crave excitement and entertainment. Singers, actors, and professional athletes command much higher incomes than such mundane workmen as physicians, pilots, or college professors. People love to have their nerves tickled they buy lottery tickets, fly to Las Vegas, and slow down to gawk at road accidents. Emotional trading can be very addictive. Even those who drop money in the markets receive a fantastic entertainment value. The market is a spectator sport and a participant sport rolled into one. Imagine going to a major league ball game in which you are not confined to the bleachers. Pay a few hundred dollars and be allowed to run onto the field and join the game. If you hit the ball right, you'll get paid like a professional. You would probably think twice before running onto the field the first few times. This cautious attitude is responsible for the well-known beginner's luck. Once a beginner hits the ball right a few times and collects his pay, he is likely to get the idea that he is as good as the pros or even better and could make a good living from the game. Greedy amateurs start running onto the field too often, even when there are no good playing opportunities. Before they know what hit them, a short string of losses destroys their accounts. The market is among the most entertaining places on the face of the earth, but emotional decisions are lethal. If you ever go to a racetrack, turn around, and watch the humans instead of horses. Gamblers stomp their feet, jump up and down, and yell at horses and jockeys. Thousands of people act out their emotions. Winners embrace, and losers tear up their tickets in disgust. The joy, the pain, and the intensity of wishful thinking are caricatures of what happens in the markets. A cool handicapper. 10 Winners and Losers 29. Who makes his living at the track does not get excited, yell, or bet the bulk of his role on a single race, or even in a single day. Casinos love drunks. They pour gamblers free drinks to make them more emotional and gamble more. Casinos also throw out calm and intelligent card counters. There is less free liquor on Wall Street than in a casino, but at least here, they do not throw you out for being a good trader. In charge of your life. When a monkey hurts its foot on a tree stump, he flies into a rage and kicks the piece of wood. You laugh at a monkey, but do you laugh at yourself when you act like him? If the market drops while you are long, you may double up on your losing trade or else flip and go short, trying to get even. 
This is acting emotionally instead of using your intellect. What's the difference between a trader trying to get back at the market and a monkey kicking a tree stump? Acting out of anger, fear, or elation destroys the chance of success. You have to analyze your behavior instead of acting out your feelings. We get angry at the market, we become afraid of it and develop silly superstitions. All the while, the market keeps cycling through its rallies and declines like an ocean going through its storms and calm periods. Mark Douglas writes in The Disciplined Trader that in the market, there is no beginning, middle, or end only what you create in your own mind. Rarely do any of us grow up learning to operate in an arena that allows for complete freedom of creative expression, with no external structure to restrict it in any way. We try to cajole or manipulate the market, acting like the ancient emperor Xerxes, who ordered his soldiers to horsewhip the sea for sinking his fleet. Most of us aren't aware of how manipulative we are, how we bargain and act out our feelings. Most of us consider ourselves the center of the universe and expect every person or group to be either good or bad to us. This does not work in the market, which is completely impersonal. Leston Havens, a Harvard University psychiatrist, wrote, Cannibalism and slavery are probably the oldest manifestations of human predation and submission. Although both are now discouraged, their continued existence in psychological forms demonstrates that civilization has achieved great success in moving from the concrete and physical to the abstract and psychological, while persisting in the same purposes. Parents threaten their children, bullies hit them, and teachers try to bend their will in school. Little wonder that most of us grow up either hiding in a shell or learning how to manipulate others in self-defense. Acting independently doesn't feel natural to us but that is the only way to succeed in the market. I carry in my wallet a free lifetime pass to New York's Belmont racetrack that belonged to my late great friend Lou Taylor. It looks like an employee card, but on the position line it says winner. He won many handicapping championships and continued to take money from the racetrack until a few months before he died. 30. Individual Psychology Douglas warns, if the market's behavior seems mysterious to you, it's because your own behavior is mysterious and unmanageable. You can't really determine what the market is likely to do next when you don't even know what you'll do next. Ultimately, the one thing you can control is yourself. As a trader, you have the power either to give yourself money or to give your money to other traders. He adds, the traders who can make money consistently approach trading from the perspective of a mental discipline. All of us have our own demons to exorcise on the journey to becoming successful traders. Here are several rules that worked for me as I grew from a wild amateur into an erratic semi-professional and finally into a calm professional trader. You may change this list to suit your personality. 1. Decide that you are in the market for the long haul that is, you want to be a trader even 20 years from now. 2. Learn as much as you can. Read and listen to experts, but keep a degree of healthy skepticism about everything. Ask questions, and do not accept experts at their word. 3. Do not get greedy and rush to trade. Take your time to learn. The markets will be there, offering more good opportunities in the months and years ahead. 4. Develop a method for analyzing the market that is, if A happens, then B is likely to happen. Markets have many dimensions use several analytic methods to confirm trades. Test everything on historical data and then in the markets, using real money. Markets keep changing you need different tools for trading bull and bear markets and transitional periods as well as a method for telling the difference. 5. Develop a money management plan. Your first goal must be long term survival, your second goal, a steady growth of capital, and your third goal, making high profits. Most traders put the third goal first and are unaware that goals 1 and 2 exist. 6. Be aware that a trader is the weakest link in any trading system. Go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous to learn how to avoid losses or develop your own method for cutting out impulsive trades. 7 Winners think, feel, and act differently than losers. 
you must look within yourself, strip away your illusions, and change your old ways of being, thinking, and acting. Change is hard, but if you want to be a professional trader, you have to work on changing and developing your personality. In order to succeed, you need drive, knowledge, and discipline. Money is important, but less so than any of those qualities. If you have enough drive to work through this book, you'll acquire much knowledge, and then we'll close the circle by returning to the topic of discipline in the final chapters. PART 2 PART 2 Mass Psychology Wall Street is named after a wall that kept farm animals from wandering away from the settlement at the southern tip of Manhattan. The farming legacy lives on in the language of traders. Four animals are mentioned especially often on Wall Street, bulls and bears, hogs, and sheep. Traders say, bulls make money, bears make money, but hogs get slaughtered. A bull fights by striking up with his horns. A bull is a buyer a person who bets on a rally and profits from a rise in prices. A bear fights by striking down with his paws. A bear is a seller a person who bets on a decline and profits from a fall in prices. Hogs are greedy. Some of them buy or sell positions that are too large for their accounts and get slaughtered by a small adverse move. Other hogs overstay their positions they keep waiting for profits even after the trend reverses. Sheep are passive and fearful followers of trends, tips, and gurus. They sometimes put on a bull's horns or a bearskin and try to swagger. You can recognize them by their pitiful bleeding when the market becomes volatile. Whenever the market is open, bulls are buying, bears are selling, hogs and sheep get trampled underfoot, and the undecided traders wait on the sidelines. Quote screens around the world show a steady stream of the latest prices for any trading vehicle. Thousands of eyes are focused on each price as people make trading decisions. There is plenty of room in the market for both, and occasionally even at the same time. It always amuses me in SPIC E-Trade when two elite traders pick the same stock one long and the other short. Often by the end of the week both are profitable, proving that how you manage your trade is more important than what stock and direction you pick. 31. 32. Mass Psychology. 11. What is price? Traders can be divided into three groups, buyers, sellers, and undecided. Buyers want to pay as little as possible, and sellers want to charge as much as possible. Their permanent conflict is reflected in bid-ask spreads, discussed in the introduction. Ask is what a seller asks for his merchandise. Bid is what a buyer offers for that merchandise. A buyer has a choice, to wait until prices come down or pay what the sellers demand. A seller has a similar choice, wait until prices rise or accept a lower offer for his merchandise. A trade occurs when there is a momentary meeting of two minds, an eager bull agrees to a seller's terms and pays up, or an eager bear agrees to a buyer's terms and sells a little cheaper. The presence of undecided traders puts pressure on bulls and bears. Buyers and sellers move fast because they know that they're surrounded by a crowd of undecided traders who may step in and snatch away their deal at any moment. The buyer knows that if he thinks too long, another trader can step in and buy ahead of him. A seller knows that if he tries to hold out for a higher price, another trader may step in and sell at a lower price. The crowd of undecided traders makes buyers and sellers more willing to deal with their opponents. A trade occurs when there is a meeting of two minds. A consensus of value. Each tick on your quote screen represents a deal between a buyer and a seller. Buyers are buying because they expect prices to rise. Sellers are selling because they expect prices to fall. Buyers and sellers are surrounded by crowds of undecided traders who put pressure on them because they may become buyers or sellers themselves. Buying by bulls pushes markets up, selling by bears pushes them down, and undecided traders make everything happen faster by creating a sense of urgency among buyers and sellers. Traders come to the markets from all over the world, 
in person, via computers, or through their brokers. Everybody has a chance to buy and to sell. Each price is a momentary consensus of value of all market participants, expressed in action. Prices are created by masses of traders, buyers, sellers, and undecided people. The patterns of prices and volume reflect mass psychology of the markets. Behavior Patterns Huge crowds trade on stock, commodity, and option exchanges. Big money and little money, smart money and dumb money, institutional money and private money, long-term investors and short-term traders, all meet at the exchange. Each price represents a momentary consensus of value between buyers, sellers, and undecided. 12. What is the market? 33. Traders at the moment of transaction. There is a crowd of traders behind every pattern on the screen. Crowd consensus changes from moment to moment. Sometimes it gets established in a very low-key environment, and at other times the environment turns wild. Prices move in small increments during quiet times. When a crowd becomes either spooked or elated, prices begin to jump. Imagine bidding for a life preserver aboard a sinking ship that's how prices leap when masses of traders become emotional about a trend. An astute trader aims to enter the market during quiet times and take profits during wild times. That, of course, is the total opposite of how amateurs act, they jump in or out when prices begin to run, but grow bored and not interested when prices are sleepy. Chart patterns reflect swings of mass psychology in the financial markets. Each trading session is a battle between bulls, who make money when prices rise, and bears, who profit when they fall. The goal of a serious technical analyst is to discover the balance of power between bulls and bears and bet on the winning group. If bulls are much stronger, you should buy and hold. If bears are much stronger, you should sell and sell short. If both camps are about equal in strength, a wise trader stands aside. He lets bulls and bears fight with each other, and enters a trade only when he is reasonably sure which side is likely to win. Prices and volume, along with the indicators that track them, reflect crowd behavior. Technical analysis is similar to poll taking. Both combine science and art, they are partly scientific because we use statistical methods and computers, they are partly artistic because we use personal judgment and experience to interpret our findings. 12. What is the market? What's the reality behind market quotes, numbers, and graphs? When you check prices in your newspaper, follow ticks on your screen, or plot an indicator on a chart, what exactly are you looking at? What is this market that you want to analyze and trade? Amateurs act as if the market is a giant happening, a ball game in which they can join the professionals and make money. Traders from a scientific or engineering background often treat the market as a physical event and apply the principles of signal processing, noise reduction, etc. By contrast, all professional traders know full well that the market is a huge mass of people. Every trader tries to take money from others by outguessing them on the probable direction of the market. The members of the market crowd live on different continents, but are brought together by modern telecommunications in the pursuit of profit at each other's expense. The market is a huge crowd of people. Each member of the crowd tries to take money from others by outsmarting them. The market is a uniquely harsh environment because everyone is against you, and you are against everyone. Not only is the market harsh, you have to pay whenever you enter and exit. You have to jump over the barriers of commissions and slippage before you can collect a. 34. Mass Psychology Dime. The moment you place an order, you owe your broker a commission you re behind the game the moment you enter. Market makers try to hit you with slippage when your order arrives for execution. They try to take another bite out of your account when you exit. In trading, you compete against some of the brightest minds in the world, while fending off the piranhas of commissions and slippage. Worldwide Crowds 
In the old days, markets were small, and many participants knew one another. The New York Stock Exchange was formed in 1792 as a club of two dozen brokers. On sunny days, they used to gather under a cottonwood tree, and on rainy days, they moved to France's tavern. As soon as those brokers organized the New York Stock Exchange, they stuck the public with fixed commissions, which lasted for the next 180 years. These days, the few remaining floor traders are on the way out. Most of us are linked to the market electronically. Still, as we watch the same quotes on our screens and read the same articles in the financial media, we become members of the market crowd even if we live thousands of miles away from one another. Thanks to modern telecommunications, the world is becoming smaller, while the markets are growing. The euphoria of London flows to New York, and the gloom of Tokyo infects Frankfurt. When you analyze the market, you are looking at crowd behavior. Crowds behave alike in different cultures on different continents. Social psychologists have uncovered several laws that govern crowd behavior, and a trader needs to understand them in order to see how the market crowd influences him. Groups, not individuals. Most people feel a strong urge to join the crowd and act like everybody else. This primitive urge clouds your judgment when you put on a trade. A successful trader must think independently. He needs to be strong enough to analyze the market alone and carry out his trading decisions. Crowds are powerful enough to create trends. The crowd may not be too bright, but it is stronger than any of us. Never buck a trend. If a trend is up, you should only buy or stand aside. Never sell short just because the prices are too high dash never argue with the crowd. You do not have to run with the crowd but you shouldn't run against it. Respect the strength of the crowd but don't fear it. Crowds are powerful, but primitive, their behavior simple and repetitive. A trader who thinks for himself can take money from crowd members. The source of money. Do you ever stop to wonder where your expected profits will come from? Is there money in the markets because of higher company earnings, or lower interest rates? 12. What is the market? 35. Or a good soybean crop? The only reason there is money in the markets is that other traders put it there. The money you want to make belongs to other people who have no intention of giving it to you. Trading means trying to take money from other people, while they are trying to take yours that's why it is such a hard business. Winning is especially difficult because brokers and floor traders take money from winners and losers alike. Tim Slater compared trading to a medieval battle. A man used to go on a battlefield with his sword and try to kill his opponent, who was trying to kill him. The winner took the loser's weapons, his chattels, and his wife, and sold his children into slavery. Now we go to the exchanges instead of an open field. When you take money away from a man, it is not that different from drawing his blood. He may lose his house, his chattels, and his wife, and his children will suffer. An optimistic friend of mine once snickered that there are plenty of poorly prepared people on the battlefield, 90-95% to of the brokers don't know the first thing about research. They don't know what they're doing. We have the knowledge, and some poor people who do not have it are just giving their money away to charity. This theory sounds good, but he soon found out that it was wrong there is no easy money in the market. Sure enough, there are plenty of dumb sheep waiting to be fleeced or slaughtered. The sheep are easy but if you want a piece of their meat, you've got to fight some very dangerous competitors. There are mean professionals, American gunslingers, English knights, German Landsknechts, Japanese Samurai, and other warriors, all going after the same hapless sheep. Trading means battling crowds of hostile people, while paying for the privilege of entering the battle and leaving it, whether alive, wounded, or dead. Inside Information There is at least one group of people who get information before us. Records show that corporate insiders as a group consistently make profits in the stock market.
and those are legitimate trades, reported by insiders to the Securities and Exchange Commission. They represent the tip of the iceberg, but there is a great deal of illegitimate insider trading. People who trade on inside information are stealing our money. The insider trials have landed some of the more notorious insiders in prison. Convictions for insider trading continue at a steady pace, especially after bull markets collapse. After the 2008 debacle, a group of executives from the Galleon Fund, led by its CEO, have been sentenced to lengthy jail terms, while a former board member of several leading U.S. corporations got two years behind bars, and recently a money manager from SAC Capital was convicted. People convicted during the insider trials were caught because they became greedy and careless. The tip of the iceberg has been shaved down, but its bulk continues to float, ready to hit any account that comes in contact with it. Trying to reduce insider trading is like trying to get rid of rats on a farm. Pesticides keep them under control, but do not root them out. A retired chief executive. 36. Mass psychology. Of a publicly traded firm explained to me that a smart man does not trade on inside information but gives it to his golfing buddies at a country club. Later they give him inside information on their companies, and both profit without being detected. The insider network is safe as long as its members follow the same code of conduct and don't get too greedy. Insider trading is legal in the futures markets, and until recently it was legal for congressmen, senators, and their staff. Charts reflect all trades by all market participants including insiders. They leave their footprints on the charts just like everyone else and it is our job as technical analysts to follow them to the bank. Technical analysis can help you detect insider buying and selling. 13. The Trading Scene Humans have traded since the dawn of history it was safer to trade with your neighbors than raid them. As society developed, money became the medium of exchange. Stock and commodity markets are among the hallmarks of an advanced society. One of the key economic developments in Eastern Europe following the collapse of communism was the establishment of stock and commodity exchanges. Today, stock, futures, and options markets span the globe. It took Marco Polo, a medieval Italian merchant, 15 years to get from Italy to China and back. Now, when a European trader wants to buy gold in Hong Kong, he can get his order filled in seconds. There are hundreds of stock and futures exchanges around the world. All exchanges must meet three criteria, first developed in the agoras of ancient Greece and the medieval fairs of Western Europe, an established location, rules for grading merchandise, and defined contract terms. Individual Traders Private traders usually come to the market after a successful career in business or in the professions. An average private futures trader in the United States is a 50-year-old, married, college-educated man. The two largest occupational groups among futures traders are farmers and engineers. Most people trade for partly rational and partly irrational reasons. Rational reasons include the desire to earn a large return on capital. Irrational reasons include gambling and a search for excitement. Most traders are not aware of their irrational motives. Learning to trade takes time, money, and work. Few individuals rise to the level of professionals who can support themselves by trading. Professionals are extremely serious about what they do. They satisfy their irrational goals outside the markets, while amateurs act them out in the marketplace. The major economic role of a trader is to support his broker to help him pay his mortgage bills and keep his children in private schools. In addition, the role of a speculator is to help companies raise capital in the stock market and to assume price risk in the commodities markets, allowing producers to focus on production. These 13. The Trading Scene 37. Lofty economic goals are far from a speculator's mind when he places his orders to buy or sell. Institutional Traders Institutions are responsible for a huge volume of trading, and their deep pockets give them several advantages. 
They pay low institutional commissions. They can afford to hire the best researchers and traders. A friend of mine who headed a trading desk at a bank based some of his decisions on a service provided by a group of former CIA officers. He got some of his best ideas from their reports, while the substantial annual fee was small potatoes for his firm compared to its huge trading volume. Most private traders do not have such opportunities. Some large firms have intelligence networks that enable them to act before the public. One day, when oil futures rallied in response to a fire on a platform in the North Sea, I called a friend at an oil firm. The market was frantic, but he was happy, having bought oil futures half an hour before they exploded. He got a telex from an agent in the area of the fire before the reports appeared on the newswire. Timely information is priceless, but only a large company can afford an intelligence network. An acquaintance who traded successfully for a Wall Street investment bank felt lost when he quit to trade for himself. He discovered that a real-time quote system in his Park Avenue apartment didn't give him news as fast as the squawk box on the trading floor of his old firm. Brokers from around the country used to call him with the latest ideas because they wanted his orders. When you trade from your house, you are never the first to hear the news, he says. The firms that deal in both futures and cash markets have two advantages. They have true inside information, and they are exempt from speculative position limits that exist in many futures markets. I went to visit an acquaintance at a multinational oil company, after passing through security barriers tighter than at an airport, I walked down a glass corridor that overlooked rooms where clusters of men huddled around monitors trading oil products. When I asked my host whether his traders were hedging or speculating, he looked me straight in the eye and said, yes. I asked again and received the same answer. Companies crisscross the thin line between hedging and speculating, using inside information. In addition to the informational advantage, employees of trading firms have a psychological one they can be more relaxed because their own money isn't at risk. When young people tell me of their interest in trading, I tell them to get a job with a trading firm and learn on someone else's dime. Firms almost never hire traders past their mid-twenties. How can an individual coming later to the game compete against institutions and win? The Achilles heel of most institutions is that they have to trade, while an individual trader is free to trade or stay out of the market when he wants. Banks have to be active in the bond market and grain producers have to be active in the grain market at almost any price. An individual trader is free to wait for the best opportunities. 38. Mass Psychology Most private traders fritter away this fantastic advantage by overtrading. An individual who wants to succeed against the giants must develop patience and eliminate greed. Remember, your goal is to trade well, not to trade often. Successful institutional traders receive raises and bonuses. Even a high bonus can feel puny to someone who earns millions of dollars for his firm. Successful institutional traders often talk of quitting and going to trade for themselves. Very few of them manage to make this transition. Most traders who leave institutions get caught up in the emotions of fear, greed, elation, and panic when they start risking their own money. They seldom do well trading for their own accounts another sign that psychology is at the root of trading success or failure. Few institutional traders realize to what a large extent they owe their success to their trading managers, who control their risk levels. Going out on your own means becoming your own manager will return to this in a later chapter, when we focus on how to organize your trading. The Sword Makers Just as medieval knights shopped for the sharpest swords, modern traders shop for the best trading tools. The growing access to good software and declining commission rates are creating a more level playing field. A computer allows you to speed up your research and follow more leads. It helps you analyze more markets in greater depth. We'll return to computers and software in Chapter 21, Computers in Trading, but here it is in brief. There are three types of trading software, 
toolboxes, black boxes, and gray boxes. A toolbox allows you to display data, draw charts, plot indicators, change their parameters, and test your trading systems. Toolboxes for options traders include option valuation models. Adapting a good toolbox to your needs can be as easy as adjusting the seat of your car. In 1977, I bought the first ever toolbox for computerized technical analysis. It cost $1,900 plus monthly data fees. Today, inexpensive, and even free, software places powerful tools at everyone's fingertips. I illustrated most of the concepts in this book using stock charts. Com because I wanted my new book to be useful to as many traders as possible. Stockcharts.com evens out the playing field for traders. It is clear, intuitive, and rich in features. Its basic version is free, although I used its inexpensive members version for higher quality charting. I still remember how hard it was in the beginning and want to show you how much analytic power you can have for free or at a very minimal cost. What goes on inside a black box is secret. You feed it data, and it tells you what and when to buy and sell. It is like magic a way to make money without thinking. Black boxes are usually sold with excellent historical track records. This is only natural because they were created to fit old data. Markets keep changing, and black boxes keep blowing up, but new generations of losers keep buying them. If you're in the market for a black box, remember that there is a guy in Brooklyn who has a bridge for sale. 14. The Market Crown and You 39. Gray boxes straddle the fence between toolboxes and black boxes. These packages are usually put out by prominent market personalities. They disclose the general logic of their system and allow you to adjust some of their parameters. Advisors Some newsletters provide useful ideas and point readers in the direction of trading opportunities. A few offer educational value. Most sell an illusion of being an insider. Newsletters are good entertainment. Your subscription rents you a pen pal who sends often amusing and interesting letters and never asks you to write back, except for a check at renewal time. Freedom of the press in the United States allows even a convicted felon to go online and start sending out a financial advisory letter. Quite a few of them do. The track records of various newsletters are largely an exercise in futility because hardly anybody takes every trade suggested by a newsletter. Services that rate newsletters are for-profit affairs run by small businessmen whose well-being depends on the well-being of the advisory industry. Rating services may occasionally tut-tut an advisor, but they dedicate most of their energy to loud cheerleading. I used to write an advisory newsletter decades ago, worked hard, delivered straight talk, and received good ratings. I saw from the inside a tremendous potential for fudging results. This is a well-kept secret of the advisory industry. After looking at my letters, a prominent advisor told me that I should spend less time on research and more on marketing. The first principle of letter writing is, if you have to make forecasts, make a lot of them. Whenever a forecast turns out right, double the volume of promotional mail. 14. The Market Crowd and You Markets are loosely organized crowds whose members bet that prices will rise or fall. Since each price represents crowd consensus at the moment of transaction, traders are betting on the future opinion and mood of the crowd. The crowd keeps swinging from hope to fear and from indifference to optimism or pessimism. Most people don't follow their own trading plans because they get swept up in the crowd's feelings and actions. As bulls and bears battle in the market, the value of your open position soars or sinks, depending on the actions of total strangers. You can't control the markets. You can only set your position size and decide whether and when to enter or exit your trades. Most traders feel jittery entering a trade. Their judgment becomes clouded after they join the crowd. Caught up in crowd emotions, many traders deviate from their plans and lose money. 40. Mass Psychology 
Experts on Crowds Charles McKay, a Scottish barrister, wrote his classic book, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, in 1841. He described several mass manias, including the tulip mania in Holland in 1634 and the South Seas investment bubble in England in 1720. The tulip craze began as a bull market in tulip bulbs. The long bull market convinced the prosperous Dutch that tulips would continue to appreciate. Many abandoned their businesses to grow tulips, trade them, or become tulip brokers. Banks accepted tulips as collateral and speculators profited. Finally, that mania collapsed in waves of panic selling, leaving people destitute and the nation shocked. McKay sighed, men go mad in crowds, and they come back to their senses slowly and one by one. In 1897, Gustave L. E. Bone, a French philosopher and politician, wrote the crowd. A trader who reads it today can see his reflection in a century old mirror. L. E. Bone wrote that when people gather in a crowd, whoever be the individuals that compose it, however like or unlike be their mode of life, their occupations, their character, or their intelligence. The fact that they have been transformed into a crowd puts them in possession of a sort of collective mind which makes them feel, think, and act in a manner quite different from that in which each individual of them would feel, think, and act were he in a state of isolation. People change when they join crowds. They become more credulous and impulsive, anxiously search for a leader, and react to emotions instead of using their intellect. An individual who becomes involved in a group becomes less capable of thinking for himself. Group members may catch a few trends, but they get killed when trends reverse. Successful traders are independent thinkers. Why join? People have been joining crowds for safety since the dawn of time. If a Stone Age hunter encountered a saber-toothed tiger, he had a very slim chance of coming out alive, but if hunters went as a group, most were likely to survive. Loners got killed and left fewer offspring. Since group members were more likely to survive, the tendency to join groups appears to have been bred into our genes. Our society glorifies free will, but we carry many primitive impulses beneath the thin veneer of civilization. We want to join groups for safety and be led by strong leaders. The greater the uncertainty, the stronger our wish to join and to follow. No saber-toothed tigers roam the canyons of Wall Street, but your financial survival is at risk. The value of your position rises and falls because of buying and selling by total strangers. Your fear swells up because you can't control prices. This uncertainty makes most traders look for a leader who will tell them what to do. You may have rationally decided to go long or short, but the moment you put on a trade, the crowd starts sucking you in. You start losing your independence when you watch prices like a hawk and become elated when they go your way or depressed if they go against you. You are in trouble when you impulsively add to losing positions. 14. The market crown and you. 41. Or reverse them. You lose your independence when you start trusting gurus more than yourself and don't follow your own trading plan. When you notice this happening, try to come back to your senses. If you can't regain your composure, exit your trades and go flat. Crowd Mentality When people join crowds, their thinking becomes primitive and they become more prone to act on impulse. Crowds swing from fear to glee, from panic to euphoria. A scientist can be cool and rational in his lab but make harebrained trades after being swept up in the mass hysteria of the market. A group can suck you in, whether you trade from a crowded brokerage office or a remote mountaintop. When you let others influence your trading decisions, your chance of success goes up in smoke. Group loyalty was essential for a prehistoric hunter's survival. Joining a union can help even an incompetent performer keep his job. The market is different, joining a group tends to hurt you. Many traders are puzzled why markets reverse immediately after they dump their losing position. This happens because crowd members are gripped by the same fear and everybody dumps at the same time. 
Once the selling fit has ended, the market has nowhere to go but up. Optimism returns to the marketplace, and the crowd forgets fear, grows greedy, and goes on a new buying binge. The crowd is bigger and stronger than you. No matter how smart you are, you cannot argue with the crowd. You have only one choice to join the crowd or to act independently. Crowds are primitive, and your trading strategies should be simple. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to design a winning trading method. If the trade goes against you cut your losses and run. Never argue with the crowd simply use your judgment to decide when to join and when to leave. Your human nature leads you to give up your independence under stress. When you put on a trade, you feel the desire to imitate others, overlooking objective signals. This is why you need to write down and follow your trading system and money management rules. They represent your rational individual decisions, made before you entered a trade. Who leads? An inexperienced trader may feel intense joy when prices move in his favor. He may feel angry, depressed, and fearful when prices move against him, anxiously waiting to see what the market will do to him next. Traders become crowd members when they feel stressed or threatened. Battered by emotions, they lose their independence and begin imitating other group members, especially the group leader. When children feel frightened, they want their parents and other grown UPS to tell them what to do. They transfer that attitude to teachers, doctors, ministers, bosses, and assorted experts. Traders turn to gurus, trading system vendors, newspaper columnists, and other market leaders. But, as Tony Plummer brilliantly pointed out in his book, Forecasting Financial Markets, the main leader of the market is price. 42. Mass Psychology Price is the leader of the market crowd. Traders all over the world follow the upticks and downticks. Price seems to say to traders, follow me, and I'll show you the way to riches. Most traders consider themselves independent. Few of us realize how strongly we focus on the behavior of our group leader. A trend that flows in your favor symbolizes a strong and generous parent calling you to share a meal. A trend that goes against you feels like dealing with an angry and punishing parent. Being gripped by such feelings, it's easy to overlook objective signals that tell you to stay or to exit a trade. You may feel happy or frightened, bargain or beg forgiveness while avoiding the rational act of accepting reality and getting out of a losing trade. Independence You need to base your trades on a carefully prepared plan instead of jumping in response to price changes. A proper plan is a written one. You need to know exactly under what conditions you will enter and exit a trade. Don't make decisions on the spur of the moment, when you are vulnerable to being sucked in by the crowd. You can succeed as a trader only when you think and act as an individual. The weakest part of any trading system is the trader himself. Traders fail when they trade without a plan or deviate from their plans. Plans are created by reasoning individuals. Impulsive trades are made by sweaty group members. You have to observe yourself and notice changes in your mental state as you trade. Write down your reasons for entering a trade and the rules for getting out of it, including money management rules. You may not change your plan while you have an open position. Sirens were sea creatures of Greek myths who sang so beautifully that sailors jumped overboard and swam to them only to be killed. When Odysseus wanted to hear the sirens' songs, he ordered his men to seal their ears with beeswax but to tie him to the mast. Odysseus heard the sirens' song but survived because he couldn't jump overboard. You ensure your survival as a trader when on a clear day you tie yourself to the mast of a trading plan and money management rules. A Positive Group you don't have to be a hermit steering clear of the crowd's impulsivity doesn't mean you have to trade in total solitude. While some of us prefer doing it that way, intelligent and productive groups can exist. Their key feature has to be independent decision making. This concept is clearly explained in a book, The Wisdom of Crowds, by a financial journalist James Suroyeki. 
he acknowledges that members of most groups constantly influence one another, creating waves of shared feelings and actions. A smart group is different, all members make independent decisions without knowing what others are doing. Instead of impacting each other and creating emotional waves, members of an intelligent group benefit from combining their knowledge and expertise. The function of a group leader is to maintain this structure and to bring individual decisions up for a vote. 15. Psychology of Trends 43. In 2004, a year prior to reading The Wisdom of Crowds, I organized a group of traders along those lines. I continue to manage it with my friend Carrie Lovorn the Spicky Trade Group. We run a trading competition, with each round lasting one week. After the market closes on Friday, the stock picks section of the website becomes closed to viewing by members until 3 p.m. on Sunday. During that time, any group member may submit one favorite pick for the week ahead without knowing what other group members are doing. The pick section of the website reopens on Sunday afternoon, allowing all members to see all picks. The race begins on Monday and ends on Friday, with prizes to winners. Throughout the week members exchange comments and answer questions. The site is built to encourage communication except for weekends, when everyone must work independently. The results of leading group members, posted on the site, have been spectacular. The key point is that all decisions about stock selection and direction must be made in solitude, without seeing what the leaders or other members are doing. The sharing begins after all votes are in. This combination of independent decision making with sharing brings forth the wisdom of crowds, tapping the collective wisdom of the group and its leaders. 15 Psychology of Trends Each price represents a momentary consensus of value among market participants. Each tick reflects the latest vote on the value of a trading vehicle. Any trader can put in his two cents worth by giving an order to buy or sell, or by refusing to trade at the current level. Each price bar or candle reflects a battle between bulls and bears. When buyers feel strongly bullish, they buy more eagerly and push markets up. When sellers feel strongly bearish, they sell more actively and push markets down. Charts are a window into mass psychology. When you analyze charts, you analyze the behavior of trading masses. Technical indicators help make this analysis more objective. Technical analysis is for profit social psychology. Strong feelings. Ask a trader why prices went up, and you'll probably get a stock answer more buyers than sellers. This isn't true. The number of shares or futures contracts bought and sold in any market is always equal. If you want to buy 100 shares of Google, someone has to sell them to you. If you want to sell 200 shares of Amazon, someone has to buy them from you. This is why the number of shares bought and sold is equal in the stock market. Furthermore, the number of long and short positions in the futures markets is always equal. Prices 44. Mass Psychology Move up or down not because of different numbers but because of changes in the intensity of greed and fear among buyers and sellers. When the trend is up, bulls feel optimistic and don't mind paying up. They buy high because they expect prices to rise even higher. Bears feel afraid in an uptrend, and they agree to sell only at a higher price. When greedy and optimistic bulls meet fearful and defensive bears, the market rallies. The stronger their feelings, the sharper the rally. The rally ends only when bulls start losing their enthusiasm. When prices slide, bears feel optimistic and don't quibble about selling short at lower prices. Bulls are fearful and agree to buy only at a discount. While bears feel like winners, they continue to sell at lower prices, and the downtrend continues. It ends when bears start feeling cautious and refuse to sell at lower prices. Rallies and declines Few traders are purely rational human beings. There is a great deal of emotion in the markets. Most participants act on the principle of monkey see, monkey do. 
the waves of fear and greed sweep up bulls and bears. The sharpness of any rally depends on how traders feel. If buyers feel just a little stronger than sellers, the market rises slowly. When they feel much stronger than sellers, the market rises fast. It is the job of a technical analyst to find when buyers are strong and when they start running out of steam. Short sellers feel trapped by rising markets, as their profits melt and turn into losses. When short sellers rush to cover, a rally can become parabolic. Fear is a much stronger emotion than greed. Rallies driven by short covering are especially sharp, although they do not last very long. Markets fall because of fear among bulls and greed among bears. Normally bears prefer to sell short on rallies, but if they expect to make a lot of money on a decline, they don't mind shorting on the way down. Fearful buyers agree to buy only below the market. As long as short sellers are willing to meet those demands and sell at a bid, the decline will continue. As bulls' profits melt and turn into losses, they panic and sell at almost any price. They are so eager to get out that they hit the bids under the market. Markets can drop fast when hit by panic selling. Price Shocks Loyalty to the leader is the glue that holds groups together. Group members expect leaders to inspire and reward them when they are good but punish them when they are bad. Some leaders are very authoritarian, others quite democratic and informal, but every group has a leader a leaderless group can't exist. Price functions as the leader of the market crowd. Fear is three times stronger than greed, according to research cited by Professor Daniel Kahneman, a Nobel Prize winning behavioral economist, whose findings we'll return to again in this book. 15 Psychology of Trends 45 Winners feel rewarded when price moves in their favor, and losers feel punished when it moves against them. Crowd members remain blissfully unaware that by focusing on price they create their own leader. Traders who feel mesmerized by prices create their own idols. When the trend is up, Bulls feel rewarded by a bountiful parent. The longer an uptrend lasts, the more confident they feel. When a child's behavior is rewarded, he continues to do what he did. When bulls make money, they add to long positions. While new bulls enter the market, bears feel they are being punished for selling short. Many of them cover shorts, go long, and join the bulls. Buying by happy bulls and covering by fearful bears pushes up trends higher. Buyers feel rewarded, while sellers feel punished. Both feel emotionally involved, but few traders realize that they are creating the uptrend and setting up their own leader. Eventually a price shock occurs a major sale hits the market, and there aren't enough buyers to absorb it. The uptrend takes a dive. Bulls feel mistreated like children whose father slapped them during a meal, but bears feel encouraged. A price shock plants the seeds of an uptrend's reversal. Even if the market recovers and reaches a new high, bulls feel more skittish and bears become bolder. This lack of cohesion in the dominant group and growing optimism among its opponents makes the uptrend ready to reverse. Several technical indicators identify tops by tracing a pattern called bearish divergence. It occurs when prices reach a new high but the indicator reaches a lower high than it did on the previous rally. Bearish divergences mark the ends of uptrends and some of the best shorting opportunities. When the trend is down, bears feel like good children, praised and rewarded for being smart. They feel increasingly confident, add to short positions, and the downtrend continues. New bears come into the market. People admire winners, and the financial media keeps interviewing bears during bear markets. Bulls lose money in downtrends, making them feel bad. They start dumping their positions, and some of them switch sides to join bears. Their selling pushes markets lower. After a while, bears grow confident and bulls feel demoralized. Suddenly, a price shock occurs. A cluster of buy orders soaks up all available sell orders and lifts the market. 
Now bears feel like children whose father has lashed out at them in the midst of a happy meal. A price shock plants the seeds of a downtrend's eventual reversal because bears become more fearful and bulls grow bolder. When a child begins to doubt that Santa Claus exists, he'll seldom believe in Santa again. Even if bears recover and prices fall to a new low, several technical indicators will help identify their weakness by tracing a pattern called a bullish divergence. It occurs when prices fall to a new low but an indicator traces a shallower bottom than during the previous decline. Bullish divergences identify some of the best buying opportunities. Social Psychology Free will makes individual behavior hard to predict. Group behavior is more primitive and easier to track. When you analyze markets, you analyze group behavior. 46. Mass Psychology You need to identify the direction in which groups are running and their changes of speed. Groups suck us in and cloud our judgment. The problem for most analysts is that they get caught in the emotional pull of the groups they try to analyze. The longer a rally continues, the more analysts get caught up in mass bullishness, ignore danger signs, and miss the eventual reversal. The longer a decline goes on, the more analysts get caught up in bearish gloom and ignore bullish signs. This is why it helps to have a written plan for analyzing markets. We have to decide in advance what indicators we will watch, how we will interpret them, and how we'll act. Professionals use several tools for tracking the intensity of the crowd's feelings. They watch the crowd's ability to break through recent support and resistance levels. Floor traders used to listen to the changes in pitch and volume of the roar on the exchange floor. With floor trading rapidly receding into history, you'll need special tools for analyzing crowd behavior. Fortunately, your charts and indicators reflect mass psychology in action. A technical analyst is an applied social psychologist, usually armed with a computer. 16 Managing versus Forecasting I once ran into a very fat surgeon at a seminar. He told me that he had lost a quarter of a million dollars in three years trading stocks and options. When I asked him how he made his trading decisions, he sheepishly pointed to his ample gut. He gambled on hunches and used his professional income to support his habit. There are two alternatives to gut feel, one is fundamental analysis, the other is technical analysis. Fundamental analysts study the actions of the Federal Reserve, follow earnings reports, examine crop reports, and so on. Major bull and bear markets reflect fundamental changes in supply and demand. Still, even if you know those factors, you can lose money trading if you are out of touch with intermediate and short-term trends, which depend on the crowd's emotions. Technical analysts believe that prices reflect everything known about the market, including fundamental factors. Each price represents the consensus of value of all market participants large commercial interests and small speculators, fundamental researchers and technicians, insiders and gamblers. Technical analysis is a study of mass psychology. It is partly a science and partly an art. Technicians use many scientific methods, including mathematical concepts of game theory, probabilities, and so on. They use computers to track indicators. Technical analysis is also an art. The bars or candles on our charts coalesce into patterns and formations. The movement of prices and indicators produces a sense of flow and rhythm, a feeling of tension and beauty that helps us sense what is happening and how to trade. Individual behavior is complex, diverse, and difficult to predict. Group behavior is primitive. Technicians study the behavior patterns of market crowds. They trade when they recognize patterns that preceded previous market moves. 16 Managing versus Forecasting 47. Poll Taking Politicians want to know their chances of being elected or re-elected. They make promises to voters and have poll takers measure a crowd's response. Technical analysis is similar to political poll taking, as both aim to read the intentions of masses. 
Poll takers do it to help their clients win elections, while technicians do it for financial gain. Poll takers use scientific methods, statistics, sampling procedures, and so on. They also need a flair for interviewing and phrasing questions, they have to be plugged into the emotional undercurrents of their party. Poll taking is a combination of science and art. If a poll taker says he is a scientist, ask him why every major political poll taker in the United States is affiliated with either the Democratic or Republican Party. True science knows no party. A market technician must rise above party affiliation. Be neither a bull nor a bear, but only seek the truth. A biased bull looks at a chart and says, where can I buy? A biased bear looks at the same chart and tries to find where he can go short. A top flight analyst is free of bullish or bearish biases. There is a trick to help you detect your bias. If you want to buy, turn your chart upside down and see whether it looks like a sell. If it still looks like a buy after you flip it, then you have to work on getting a bullish bias out of your system. If both charts look like a sell, then you have to work on purging a bearish bias. A crystal ball. Many traders believe that their aim is to forecast future prices. The amateurs in most fields ask for forecasts, while professionals simply manage information and make decisions based on probabilities. Take medicine, for example. A patient is brought to an emergency room with a knife wound and the anxious family members have only two questions, will he survive, and when can he go home? They ask the doctor for a forecast. But the doctor isn't forecasting he is managing problems as they emerge. His first job is to prevent the patient from dying from shock, and so he gives him painkillers and starts an intravenous drip to replace lost blood. Then he sutures damaged organs. After that, he has to watch against infection. He monitors the trend of the patient's health and takes measures to prevent complications. He is managing not forecasting. When a family begs for a forecast, he may give it to them, but its practical value is low. To make money trading, you don't need to forecast the future. You have to extract information from the market and find out whether bulls or bears are in control. You need to measure the strength of the dominant market group and decide how likely the current trend is to continue. You need to practice conservative money management aimed at long term survival and profit accumulation. You must observe how your mind works and avoid slipping into greed or fear. A trader who does all of this will succeed ahead of any forecaster. 48. Mass Psychology Read the market, manage yourself. A tremendous volume of information pours out of the markets during trading hours. Changing prices reflect the battles of bulls and bears. Your job is to analyze this information and bet on the dominant market group. Whenever I hear a dramatic forecast, my first thought is a marketing gimmick. Advisors issue them to attract attention in order to raise money or sell services. Good calls attract paying customers, while bad calls are quickly forgotten. My phone rang while I was writing the first draft of this chapter. A famous guru, down on his luck, told me that he had identified a once-in-a-lifetime buying opportunity in corn. He asked me to raise money for him and promised to multiply it a hundredfold in six months. I do not know how many fools he hooked, but dramatic forecasts have always been good for fleecing the public. Most people do not change. While working on this update 21 years later, I read in the Wall Street Journal that this same guru was recently punished for professional misconduct by the National Futures Association. Use common sense in analyzing markets. When some new development puzzles you, compare it to life outside the markets. For example, Indicators may give you buy signals in two markets. Should you buy the one that declined a lot before the buy signal or the one that declined a little? Compare this to what happens to a man after a fall. If he falls down a few steps, he may dust himself off and run up again. But if he falls out of a second story window, he's not going to run anytime soon, he needs time to recover.
successful trading stands on three pillars. You need to analyze the balance of power between bulls and bears. You need to practice good money management. You need personal discipline to follow your trading plan and avoid getting high or depressed in the markets. PART3 PART3 Classical Chart Analysis When I bought my first stock, classical charting was the only game in town. I use quadruled paper and a sharp pencil to update my charts by hand. A few years later, pocket calculators became available, and I added simple moving averages. Later, a TI programmable calculator made it possible to insert tiny magnetic strips into its slit to perform more complex calculations, such as exponential moving averages and the directional system. Finally, an Apple personal computer appeared on the scene, you could use its joystick to move a cursor to draw trend lines. In contrast, today's traders have access to immense analytic power at a very low cost. While the key concepts of classical charting remain valid, many of its tools have been eclipsed by much more powerful computerized methods. The best quality of computerized technical analysis is its objectivity. A moving average or any other indicator is either rising or falling, and there can be no argument about its direction. You may puzzle over how to interpret its signals, but the signals themselves are clear as day. Classical charting, on the other hand, is quite subjective, and invites wishful thinking and self-deception. You can draw a trend line across the extreme prices or across the edges of congestion zones, which will change its angle as well as its message. If you're in a mood to buy, you can draw your trend line a little steeper. If you feel like shorting and squint at a chart, you'll recognize a head and shoulders top. None of those patterns are objective. Because of their subjectivity, I've grown increasingly skeptical of claims regarding classical formations, such as pennants, head and shoulders, etc. 49. 50. Classical Chart Analysis After having looked at hundreds of thousands of charts, I've concluded that the market doesn't know diagonals. It remembers price levels, which is why horizontal support and resistance lines make sense, but diagonal trend lines are subjective and open to self-deception. In my own trading, I use only a small number of chart patterns that are objective enough to trust. I pay attention to support and resistance zones, based on horizontal price levels. The relationship between the opening and closing prices and between the high and the low points of a price bar or a candle are also objective. I recognize fingers, also called kangaroo tails dash very long bars that protrude from a tight weave of prices. We'll explore these and a few other patterns in this section. 17 Charting Chartists study market data to identify price patterns and profit from them. Most chartists work with bar or candlestick graphs that show open, high, low, and closing prices and volume. Futures traders also watch open interest. Point and figure chartists track only price changes and ignore time, volume, and open interest. Classical charting requires only a pencil and paper. It appeals to visually oriented people. Those who plot data by hand can develop a physical feel for prices. One of the costs of switching to computerized charting is losing some of that feel. The biggest problem with classical charting is wishful thinking. Traders seem to identify bullish or bearish patterns, depending on whether they're in a mood to buy or sell. Early in the 20th century, Hermann Rorschach, a Swiss psychiatrist, designed a test for exploring a person's mind. He dropped ink on 10 sheets of paper and folded each in half, creating symmetrical ink blots. Most people who peer at these sheets describe what they see, parts of the anatomy, animals, buildings, and so on. In reality, there are only ink blots. Each person sees what's on his mind. Most traders use charts as a giant Rorschach test. They project their hopes, fears, and fantasies onto the charts. Brief History The first chartists in the United States appeared at the turn of the 20th century. 
They included Charles Dow, the author of a famous stock market theory, and William Hamilton, who succeeded Dow as the editor of the Wall Street Journal. Dow's famous maxim was the averages discount everything, by which he meant that the industrial and rail averages reflected all knowledge about the economy. Dow never wrote a book, only his Wall Street Journal editorials. Hamilton took over the job after Dow died and laid out the principles of Dow theory in his book, The Stock Market Barometer. He wrote a famous The Turn of the Tide editorial following the 1929 crash. Robert Rea, a newsletter publisher, brought the theory to its pinnacle in his 1932 book, The Dow Theory. 51. The decade of the 1930s was the golden age of charting. Many innovators found themselves with time on their hands after the crash of 1929. Shabaker, Rhea, Elliott, Wyckoff, Gann, and others published their books during that decade. They went in two distinct directions. Some, such as Wyckoff and Shabaker, saw charts as a graphic record of supply and demand. Others, such as Elliott and Gann, searched for a perfect order in the markets a fascinating but ultimately futile undertaking. In 1948, Edwards and McGee published Technical Analysis of Stock Trends, in which they popularized such concepts as triangles, rectangles, head and shoulders, and other chart formations, as well as support, resistance, and trend lines. Other chartists applied these concepts to commodities. Markets have changed a great deal since the days of Edwards and McGee. In the 1940s, the daily volume of an active stock on the New York Stock Exchange was only several hundred shares, while now it is measured in millions. The balance of power in the stock market has shifted in favor of bulls. Early chartists wrote that stock market tops were sharp and fast, while bottoms took a long time to develop. That was true in their deflationary era but the opposite has been true since the 1950s. Now bottoms tend to form quickly, while tops tend to take longer. The meaning of a bar chart Chart patterns reflect the sum of buying and selling, greed and fear among investors and traders. Many charts in this book are daily, with each bar representing one trading day, but the rules for understanding weekly, daily, or intraday charts are remarkably similar. Remember this key principle, each price is a momentary consensus of value of all market participants expressed in action. Based on it, each price bar provides several important pieces of information about the tug of war between bulls and bears. The opening price of a daily bar tends to reflect the amateur's opinion of value. They read morning papers, find out what happened the day before, perhaps ask for a wife's approval to buy or sell, and place their orders before driving to work. Amateurs are especially active early in the day and early in the week. Traders who researched the relationship between opening and closing prices found that opening prices most often occur near the high or the low of the daily bar. Buying or selling by amateurs early in the day creates an emotional extreme from which prices tend to recoil later in the day. In bull markets, Prices often make their low for the week on Monday or Tuesday, when amateurs take profits from the previous week, then rally to a new high on Thursday or Friday. In bear markets, the high for the week is often set on Monday or Tuesday, with a new low toward the end of the week. The closing prices of daily and weekly bars tend to reflect the actions of professional traders. They watch the markets throughout the day, respond to changes, and tend to dominate the last hour of trading. Many of them take profits at that time to avoid carrying trades overnight. 52. Classical Chart Analysis Figure 17.1 TSLA Daily The Meaning of a Bar Chart Opening prices are set by amateurs, whose orders accumulate overnight and hit the market in the morning. Closing prices are largely set by market professionals who trade throughout the day. You can see a reflection of their conflict in how often opening and closing prices occur at the opposite ends of price bars. The high of each bar marks the maximum power of bulls during that bar. The low of each bar marks the maximum power of bears during that bar. 
slippage tends to be less when you enter or exit positions during short bars. Professionals as a group usually trade against the amateurs. They tend to buy lower openings, sell short higher openings, and unwind their positions as the day goes on. Traders need to pay attention to the relationship between opening and closing prices. If prices closed higher than they opened, then market professionals were probably more bullish than amateurs. If prices closed lower than they opened, then market professionals were probably more bearish than amateurs. It pays to trade with the professionals and against the amateurs. Candlestick charting is based, to a large extent, on the relationship between the opening and closing prices of each bar. If the close is higher, the candle is white, but if it is lower, the candle is black. The high of each bar represents the maximum power of bulls during that bar. Bulls make money when prices go up. Their buying pushes prices higher, and every uptick adds to their profits. Finally, bulls reach a point where they cannot lift prices not even by one more tick. The high of a daily bar represents the maximum power of bulls during the day, while the high of a weekly bar marks the maximum power of bulls during the week. The highest point of a bar represents the maximum power of bulls during that bar. A tick is the smallest price change allowed for any given trading vehicle. It may be one cent or even one hundredth of a cent, a quarter point for S&P E-minis, ten cents for gold futures, etc. 53. The low of each bar represents the maximum power of bears during that bar. Bears make money when prices decline. They keep selling short, their selling pushes prices lower, and every downtick adds to their profits. At some point they run out of either capital or enthusiasm, and prices stop falling. The low of a daily bar marks the maximum power of bears during that day, and the low of a weekly bar identifies the maximum power of bears during that week. The low of each bar shows the maximum power of bears during that bar. The closing price of each bar reveals the outcome of the battle between bulls and bears during that bar. If prices close near the high of the daily bar, it shows that bulls won the day's battle. If prices close near the low of the day, it shows that bears won the day. Closing prices on the daily charts of futures are especially important because your account equity is marked to market each night. The distance between the high and the low of any bar reflects the intensity of conflict between bulls and bears. An average bar marks a relatively cool market. A bar that's only half as tall as average reveals a sleepy, disinterested market. A bar that's two times taller than average shows a boiling market where bulls and bears battle all over the field. Slippage tends to be less in quiet markets. It pays to enter trades during short or normal bars. Tall bars are good for taking profits. Trying to enter a position when the market is running is like jumping onto a moving train. It would be safer to wait for the next one. Japanese Candlesticks Japanese rice traders began using candlestick charts some two centuries before the first chartists appeared in America. Instead of bars, their charts had rows of candles with wicks at both ends. The body of each candle represents the distance between the opening and closing prices. If the closing price is higher than the opening, the body is white, but if the closing price is lower, the body is black. The tip of the upper wick represents the high of the day, while the bottom of the lower wick represents the low of the day. The Japanese consider highs and lows relatively unimportant, according to Steve Nizan, author of Japanese candlestick charting techniques. They focus on the relationship between opening and closing prices and on patterns that include several candles. The main advantage of a candlestick chart is its focus on the struggle between amateurs who control openings and professionals who control closings. Unfortunately, many candlestick chartists neglect western tools, such as volume and technical indicators. Candlesticks have become quite popular worldwide, and some traders ask me why I continue to use bar charts. I am familiar with candlesticks, but I've learned to trade using bar charts 
and I believe that using open high low close bars plus technical indicators gives me more information. Your choice of a bar or a candlestick chart is a matter of personal preference. All concepts expressed in this book can be used with candlestick as well as bar charts. 54. Classical Chart Analysis Efficient Markets, Random Walk, Chaos Theory, and Nature's Law Efficient market theory is an academic notion that nobody can outperform the market because any price at any given moment incorporates all available information. Warren Buffett, one of the most successful investors of the century, commented, I think it's fascinating how the ruling orthodoxy can cause a lot of people to think the earth is flat. Investing in a market where people believe in efficiency is like playing bridge with someone who's been told it doesn't do any good to look at the cards. The logical flaw of efficient market theory is that it equates knowledge with action. People may have knowledge, but the emotional pull of the crowd often leads them to trade irrationally. A good analyst can detect repetitive patterns of crowd behavior on his charts and exploit them. Theorists claim that market prices change at random. Sure, there is a fair bit of randomness or noise in the markets, just as there is randomness in any crowd. Still, an intelligent observer can identify repetitive behavior patterns of a crowd and make sensible bets on their continuation or reversal. People have memories, they remember past prices, and their memories influence their decisions to buy or sell. Memories help create support under the market and resistance above it. Random walkers deny that memories influence our behavior. As Milton Friedman pointed out, prices carry information about the availability of supply and the intensity of demand. Market participants use that information when deciding to buy or sell. For example, consumers buy more merchandise when it is on sale and less when prices are high. Financial traders are just as capable of logical behavior as homemakers. When prices are low, bargain hunters step in. A shortage can lead to a buying panic, but high prices choke off demand. Has achieved prominence in the recent decades. Markets are largely chaotic, and the only time you can have an edge is during orderly periods. In my view, markets are chaotic much of the time, but out of that chaos, islands of order and structure keep emerging and disappearing. The essence of market analysis is recognizing the emergence of orderly patterns and having enough courage and conviction to trade them. If you trade during chaotic periods, the only ones to benefit will be your broker, who will collect his commission, and a professional day trader, who will scalp you. The key point to keep in mind is that once in a while a pattern emerges from chaos. Your system should recognize this transition, and that's when you should put on a trade. Earlier we spoke about the one great advantage of a private trader over professionals he may wait for a good trade instead of having to be active each day. The chaos theory confirms that message. The chaos theory also teaches us that orderly structures that emerge from chaos are fractal. The sea coast appears equally jagged whether you look down on it from space or an airplane, from a standing position or on your knees through a magnifying glass. Market patterns are fractal as well. If I show you a set of charts of the same. 18 Support and Resistance 55. Market, having removed time markings, you will not be able to tell whether it is monthly, weekly, daily, or a 5-minute chart. Later in this book, we'll return to this theme, and you'll see why it is so important to analyze markets in more than one time frame. We'll have to make sure that buy or sell messages in both time frames confirm each other, because if they don't it means that the market is too chaotic and we should stand aside. Is the rallying cry of a clutch of mystics who claim there is a perfect order in the markets. They say that markets move like clockwork in response to immutable natural laws. R. N. Eliot even titled his last book Nature's Law. The perfect order crowd gravitates to astrology, numerology, conspiracy theory, and other superstitions. Next time someone talks to you about natural order in the markets, ask him about astrology. 
he'll probably jump at the chance to come out of the closet and talk about the stars. The believers in perfect order in the markets claim that tops and bottoms can be predicted far into the future. Amateurs love forecasts, and mysticism is a great marketing gimmick. It helps sell courses, trading systems, and newsletters. Mystics, random walk academics, and efficient market theorists have one trait in common. They are equally divorced from the reality of the markets. 18. Support and Resistance A ball hits the floor and bounces. Toss it up, and it'll drop after hitting the ceiling. Support and resistance are like a floor and a ceiling, with prices sandwiched between them. Understanding support and resistance is essential for understanding price trends. Rating their strength helps you decide whether the trend is likely to punch through or to reverse. Support is a price level where buying is strong enough to interrupt or reverse a downtrend. When a downtrend hits support, it bounces like a diver who hits the bottom and pushes away from it. Support is represented on a chart by a horizontal line connecting two or more bottoms. Resistance is a price level where selling is strong enough to interrupt or reverse an uptrend. When an uptrend hits resistance, it acts like a man who hits his head on a branch while climbing a tree he stops and may even tumble down. Resistance is represented on a chart by a horizontal line connecting two or more tops. It is better to draw support and resistance lines across the edges of congestion areas where the bulk of the bars stopped rather than across extreme prices. Those congestion zones show where masses of traders have changed their minds, while the extreme points reflect only panic among the weakest traders. Minor support or resistance causes trends to pause, while major support or resistance causes them to reverse. Traders buy at support and sell at resistance, making their effectiveness a self-fulfilling prophecy. 56. Classical Chart Analysis Figure 18.1 NFLX Weekly Support and Resistance Draw horizontal lines across the upper and lower edges of congestion areas. The bottom line marks the level of support at which buyers overcome sellers. The upper line identifies resistance, where sellers overpower buyers. Support and resistance areas often switch roles. Note how after a decisive upside breakout in area 1 prices hit resistance, but when they broke above that level it turned into a zone of support. The strength of these barriers increases each time prices touch them and bounce away. Beware of false breakouts from support and resistance. They are marked by letter F on this chart. Amateurs tend to follow breakouts, while professionals tend to fade them. At the right edge of the chart NFLX is rallying from support at the level where its previous rally ran into resistance. How do we identify trends? Not by trend lines. My favorite tools are exponential moving averages that we'll review in the next section. Trend lines are wildly subjective they are among the most self-deceptive tools. Trend identification is an area in which computerized analysis is miles ahead of classical charting. Memories, Pain, and Regret Our memories of previous market turns prompt us to buy and sell at certain levels. Buying and selling by crowds create support and resistance. Support and resistance exist because people have memories. If traders remember that prices have recently stopped falling and turned up from a certain level, they are likely to buy when prices approach that level again. If traders remember that an uptrend has recently reversed after rising to a certain peak, they tend to sell and go short when prices approach that level again. For example, all major rallies in the stock market from 1966 until 1982 ended whenever the Dow Jones Industrial Average rallied into the area between 950 and 1050. That resistance zone was so strong that traders named it a graveyard in the sky. Once the bulls rammed the market through that level, it became a major support area. In recent years, we saw a similar occurrence in gold, whose chart is shown here. It hit the level of $1,000 per ounce four times, dropping after each. 18. Support and Resistance 57. 
Figure 18.2 Gold Weekly Resistance turns into support. Notice how gold hit its overhead resistance at the $1,000 per ounce level five times. Usually, reversals occur on the first, second, or third hit. When a market hits the same level for the fourth time, it shows that it really wants to go that way. Gold broke above $1,000 per ounce on its fifth attempt. Afterwards, gold made two attempts to pull down to its old resistance level, in areas marked 6 and 7. Its inability to decline to that level showed that bears were weak, marking the start of a major bull market in gold. Attempt After the price of gold broke above that level on its fifth attempt, the level of $1,000 per ounce turned into a massive support level. Support and resistance exist because masses of traders feel pain and regret. Traders who hold losing positions feel intense pain. Losers are determined to get out as soon as the market gives them another chance. Traders who missed an opportunity to buy or sell short feel regret and also wait for the market to give them a second chance. Feelings of pain and regret are mild in trading ranges when swings are relatively small and losers do not get hurt too badly. Breakouts from those ranges create much more intense pain and regret. When the market stays flat for a while, traders get used to buying near the lower edge of its range and selling or even shorting near the upper edge. When an uptrend begins, bears who sold short feel a great deal of pain. At the same time bulls feel an intense regret that they didn't buy more. Both are determined to buy if the market declines to the breakout point and gives them a second chance to cover shorts or to get long. The pain of bears and regret of bulls makes them eager to buy creating support during reactions in an uptrend. When prices break down from a trading range, bulls who bought are in pain, they feel trapped and wait for a rally to get out even. Bears, on the other hand, regret that they haven't shorted more, they wait for a rally as a second chance to sell short. Bulls pain and bears regret create resistance a ceiling above the market in downtrends. The strength of support and resistance depends on the strength of feelings among masses of traders. 58. Classical Chart Analysis Strength of Support and Resistance The longer prices stay in a congestion zone, the stronger the emotional commitment of bulls and bears to that area. A congestion area hit by several trends is like a battlefield with craters from explosions, its defenders have plenty of cover and are likely to slow down any attacking force. When prices approach that zone from above, it serves as support. When prices rally into it from below, it acts as resistance. A congestion area can reverse those roles, serving as either support or resistance. The strength of those zones depends on three factors, their length, height, and the volume of trading that has taken place in them. You can visualize these factors as the length, the width, and the depth of a congestion zone. The longer a support or resistance area its length of time or the number of hits it took the stronger it is. Support and resistance, like good wine, become better with age. A two-week trading range provides only minimal support or resistance, a two-month range gives people time to become used to it and creates intermediate support or resistance, while a two-year range becomes accepted as a standard of value and offers major support or resistance. As support and resistance levels grow very old, they gradually become weaker. Losers keep washing out of the markets, replaced by newcomers who don't have the same emotional commitment to very old price levels. People who lost money only recently remember full well what happened to them. They are probably still in the market, feeling pain and regret, trying to get even. People who made bad decisions several years ago may well be out of that market, and their memories matter less. The strength of support and resistance increases each time that area is hit. When traders see that prices have reversed at a certain level, they tend to bet on a reversal the next time prices reach that level. The taller the support and resistance zone, the stronger it is. A tall congestion zone is like a tall fence around a property. If a congestion zone's height equals 1% of current market value, 
it provides only minor support or resistance. If it's 3% tall, it provides intermediate support or resistance, and a congestion zone that's 7% tall or higher can grind down a major trend. The greater the volume of trading in a support and resistance zone, the stronger it is. High volume shows active involvement by traders a sign of strong emotional commitment. Low volume shows that traders have little interest in transacting at that level a sign of weak support or resistance. You can measure the strength of support and resistance in dollars if you multiply the number of days a stock spent in its congestion zone by its average daily volume and price. Of course, when making such comparisons, we should measure support and resistance zones for the same stock. You can't compare apples with oranges or AAPL with some $10 stock that trades a million shares on a good day. Trading Rules 1. Whenever the trend you're riding approaches support or resistance, tighten your protective stop. 18. Support and resistance. 59. A protective stop is an order to sell below the market when you are long or to cover shorts above the market when you are short. A stop protects you from getting badly hurt by a reversal. A trend reveals its health by how it acts when it hits support or resistance. If it's strong enough to penetrate that zone, your tight stop will not be triggered. If a trend bounces away from support or resistance, it reveals its weakness. In that case, your tight stop will salvage a good chunk of profits. Two support and resistance are more important on long-term charts than on short-term charts. A good trader monitors his market using several time frames, but assigns more weight to the longer ones. Weekly charts are more important than dailies. If the weekly trend is strong, it is less alarming that the daily trend is hitting resistance. When a weekly trend approaches major support or resistance, you should be more inclined to exit. Three support and resistance levels point to trading opportunities. The bottom of a congestion area identifies the bottom line of support. As prices decline towards it, be alert to buying opportunities. One of the best patterns in technical analysis is a false breakout. If prices dip below support and then rally back into the support zone, they show that bears have lost their chance. A price bar closing within a congestion zone after a false downside breakout marks a buying opportunity, set a protective stop in the vicinity of the bottom of the recent false downside breakout. Similarly, a true upside breakout should not be followed by a pullback into the range, just as a rocket is not supposed to sink back to its launching pad. A false upside breakout gives a signal to sell short as a price bar returns into the congestion zone. When shorting, place a protective stop near the top of the false breakout. On placing stops experienced traders tend to avoid placing them at round numbers. If I buy a stock near $52 and want to protect my position in the area of $51, I'll put a stop a few cents below $51. If I go long at 33.70 in a day trade and want to protect my position in the area of $33.50, I'll put that stop a few cents below. $33.50 Because of a natural human tendency to use round numbers, clusters of stops accumulate there. I prefer to place my stops at the far ends of such clusters. True and False Breakouts Markets spend more time in trading ranges than in trends. Most breakouts from trading ranges are false breakouts. They suck in trend followers just before prices return into their ranges. False breakouts hurt amateurs, but professional traders love them. Professionals expect prices to fluctuate most of the time, without going anywhere far. They wait until an upside breakout stops reaching new highs or a downside breakout stops making new lows. Then they pounce fade the breakout. 60. Classical Chart Analysis Figure 18.3 Ego and the Euro Daily False Breakouts On the left, a chart of Eldorado Gold Corp shows a false downside breakout during Gold Bear's final attempt to push gold stocks lower in December 2013.
prices opened sharply below support, having gapped down from the previous day's close. From there, a rally began. Notice a pullback to the support line a week later, marked by a green arrowhead. Such pullbacks don't always occur, but when they do, they offer an excellent opportunity to hop aboard a new trend. On the right, a chart of the euro shows how an uptrend culminated in a false upside breakout. Prices gapped above the line of resistance, triggering stops and shaking out weak shorts, and that's when the downtrend began. There was no second chance pullback in this market. And place a protective stop near the latest extreme point. It's a tight stop, and their monetary risk is low, with a big profit potential from prices returning towards the middle of the congestion zone. The risk slash reward ratio is so good that professionals can afford to be wrong half the time and still come out ahead of the game. The best time to buy an upside breakout on a daily chart is when your analysis of the weekly chart suggests that a new uptrend is developing. True breakouts are confirmed by heavy volume, while false breakouts tend to have light volume. True breakouts are confirmed when technical indicators reach new extremes in the direction of the new trend, while false breakouts are often marked by divergences between prices and indicators, which we'll discuss later in the book. 19 Trends and Trading Ranges A trend exists when prices keep rising or falling over a period of time. In a perfect uptrend, each rally reaches a higher high than the preceding rally, while each decline stops at a higher level than the preceding decline. In a perfect downtrend, each decline falls to a lower low than the preceding decline and each rally tops out. 19 Trends and Trading Ranges 61. At a lower level than the preceding rally. In a trading range, most rallies stop at about the same high level, and declines peter out at about the same low level. Perfect patterns, of course, aren't that common in financial markets, and multiple deviations make life harder for analysts and traders. Even a quick look at most charts reveals that markets spend most of the time in trading ranges. Trends and trading ranges call for different tactics. When you go long in an uptrend or sell short in a downtrend, you have to give that trend the benefit of the doubt and use a wider stop, so as not to be shaken out easily. In a trading range, on the other hand, you have to use tight stops, be nimble and close out positions at the slightest sign of a reversal. Another difference in trading tactics between trends and ranges is the handling of strength and weakness. You have to follow strength during trends by in uptrends and short in downtrends. When prices are in a trading range, you aim to do the opposite by weakness and sell strength. Figure 19.1 FB Daily, 22 Day Emma Trend and the Trading Range A pattern of higher tops and higher bottoms defines uptrends while a pattern of lower bottoms and lower tops defines downtrends. In the middle of this chart of Facebook Incorporated, you see a downtrend defined by three lower lows, marked 1, 3, and 5, and two lower highs, marked 2 and 4. Notice the downtrend of a slow 22-day exponential moving average confirming the price downtrend. Its upturn signaled an upside reversal, confirmed by new price peaks 6 and 8. We've looked at false breakouts in the previous chapter, and you can see them again in action here. False breakouts occur when prices cross their support or resistance lines, spend one or two days beyond that line, and then return, marking a failed move in the direction of the breakout, afterwards prices tend to turn in the opposite direction. Here, a false downside breakout, followed by the upturn of a moving average gave a strong buy signal. We see a mirror image of this pattern after the top 8. There are two false upside breakouts, and after the second one, the moving average turns down, giving a sell signal. At the right edge of the chart, prices are pulling back up to their declining moving average. Such patterns tend to create good opportunities for selling short. 62. Classical Chart Analysis Mass Psychology when the trend is up, 
bulls are more eager than bears, and their buying forces prices higher. If bears manage to push prices down, bulls return to bargain hunt. They stop the decline, and force prices to rise again. A downtrend occurs when bears are more aggressive and their selling pushes markets down. Whenever a flurry of buying lifts prices, bears sell short into that rally, stop it, and send prices to new lows. When bulls and bears are about equal in strength, prices stay in a trading range. When bulls manage to push prices up, bears sell short into that rally and prices fall. As they decline, bargain hunters step in and buy. Then, as bears cover shorts, their buying helps fuel a rally. This cycle can go on for a long time. A trading range is like a fight between two equally strong street gangs. They push one another back and forth, but neither can control the city block. A trend is like a fight in which a stronger gang chases the weaker gang down the street. Every once in a while the weaker gang stops and puts up a fight but then turns and runs again. Crowds spend most of their time aimlessly milling around, which is why markets spend more time in trading ranges than in trends. A crowd has to become agitated and surge to create a trend. Crowds do not stay excited for long they go back to aimlessness. Professionals tend to give the benefit of the doubt to trading ranges. The hard right edge. Trends and ranges are easy to see in the middle of a chart, but as you get close to its right edge, the picture becomes increasingly foggy. The past is fixed and clear, but the future is fluid and uncertain. Trends are easy to recognize on old charts, but, unfortunately, our brokers don't allow us to trade in the past we have to make trading decisions at the hard right edge. By the time a trend becomes perfectly clear, a good chunk of it is already gone. Nobody will ring a bell when a trend dissolves into a trading range. Many chart patterns and indicator signals contradict one another at the right edge of the chart. You have to base your decisions on probabilities in an atmosphere of uncertainty. Most people feel very uncomfortable dealing with uncertainty. When their trade doesn't go the way their analysis suggested, they hang on to losing positions, waiting for the market to turn and make them whole. Trying to be right is an unaffordable luxury in the markets. Professional traders get out of losing trades fast. When the market deviates from your analysis, you have to cut losses without fuss. Methods and techniques Keep in mind that there is no single magic method to clearly and reliably identify all trends and trading ranges. It pays to combine several analytic tools. None of them is perfect, but when they confirm each another, a correct message is much more likely. When they contradict one another, it's better to pass up a trade. 19 Trends and Trading Ranges 63 Figure 19.2 UNP Daily, 22-Day EMA, Directional System, MACD Histogram Trend Identification The single most important identifier of any trend is the pattern of its highs and lows. Look, for example, at this daily chart of Union Pacific Corp. Once it broke out of its trading range, its highs, marked by horizontal green lines, kept reaching higher and higher. Similarly, its reaction lows, marked by red horizontal lines, kept bottoming out at higher and higher levels. Trying to draw a trend line would be a very subjective exercise because the bottoms of UNP did not line up in a straight line. The 22-day exponential moving average, represented by a red line superimposed on prices, confirms the uptrend by its steady rise. Notice excellent buying opportunities, signaled by quick price dips to their moving average. The directional system signaled the start of a new trend when the average directional index fell below 20 and then rallied above that level and penetrated above the lower directional line. MACD histogram identified a very powerful trend when it rallied to its highest peak in several months. Near the right edge of the chart the trend is up, while prices are slightly below their recent high. A pullback to the EMA is likely to create a fresh buying opportunity. 
1. Analyze the pattern of highs and lows. When rallies keep reaching higher levels and declines keep stopping at higher levels, they identify an uptrend. The pattern of lower lows and lower highs identifies a downtrend, and the pattern of irregular highs and lows points to a trading range. 2. Plot a 20 to 30 bar exponential moving average. The direction of its slope identifies the trend. If a moving average has not reached a new high or low in a month, then the market is probably in a trading range. 64. Classical Chart Analysis 3. When an oscillator, such as MACD histogram rises to a new peak, it identifies a powerful trend and suggests that the latest market top is likely to be retested or exceeded. 4. Several market indicators, such the directional system, help identify trends. The directional system is especially good at catching early stages of new trends. Trade or wait. Having identified an uptrend, you need to decide whether to buy immediately or wait for a dip. If you buy fast, you'll get in gear with the trend, but on the minus side, your stops are likely to be farther away, increasing your risk. If you wait for a dip, your risk will be smaller, but you'll have four groups of competitors, longs who want to add to their positions, shorts who want to get out even, traders who never bought, and traders who sold too early but are eager to buy again. The waiting areas for pullbacks are notoriously crowded. Furthermore, a deep pullback may signal the beginning of a reversal rather than a buying opportunity. The same reasoning applies to shorting in downtrends. If the market is in a trading range and you're waiting for a breakout, you'll have to decide whether to buy in anticipation of a breakout, during a breakout, or on a pullback after a valid breakout. If you aren't sure, consider entering in several steps, buy a third of the planned position in anticipation, a third on a breakout, and a third on a pullback. Whatever method you use, remember to apply the key risk management rule, the distance from your entry to the protective stop, multiplied by position size can never be more than 2% of your account equity. No matter how attractive a trade, pass it up if it would require putting more than 2% of your account at risk. Finding good entry points is extremely important in trading ranges. You have to be very precise and nimble because the profit potential is limited. A trend is more forgiving of a sloppy entry, as long as you trade in the right direction. Old traders chuckle, don't confuse brains with a bull market. Specific risk management tactics are different for trends and trading ranges. When trend trading, it pays to put on smaller positions with wider stops. You'll be less likely to get shaken out by any counter trend moves, while still controlling risk. You may put on bigger positions in trading ranges but with tighter stops. Conflicting time frames Markets move in several time frames at the same time. They move simultaneously, and sometimes in the opposite directions on 10-minute, hourly, daily, weekly and monthly charts. The market may look like a buy in one time frame but a sell in another. Even indicator signals in different time frames of the same stock may contradict one another. Which will you follow? 20 Kangaroo Tales 65 most traders ignore the fact that markets move in different directions at the same time in different time frames. They pick one time frame, such as daily or hourly, and look for trades there. That's when trends from other time frames sneak up on them and wreak havoc with their plans. Those conflicts between signals in different time frames of the same market are one of the great puzzles in market analysis. What looks like a trend on a daily chart may show up as a blip on a flat weekly chart. What looks like a flat trading range on a daily chart shows rich uptrends and downtrends on an hourly chart, and so on. The sensible course of action is this, before examining a trend on your favorite chart, step back to explore the charts in a time frame one order of magnitude greater than your favorite. This search for a greater perspective is one of the key principles of the triple screen trading system, which we'll discuss in a later chapter. When professionals are in doubt, they look at the big picture, 
while amateurs tend to focus on the short-term charts. Taking a longer view works better and is a lot less nerve-wracking. 20 Kangaroo Tails Just when you think a runaway trend will keep on going pop, dash a 3-bar pattern forms a kangaroo tail that flags a reversal. A kangaroo tail consists of a single, very tall bar, flanked by two regular bars, that protrudes from a tight weave of prices. Upward pointing kangaroo tails flash sell signals at market tops, while downward pointing kangaroo tails occur at market bottoms. While daily charts are shown in the illustration, you can find kangaroo tails on the charts of all time frames. The longer the time frame, the more meaningful its signal, a kangaroo tail on a weekly chart is likely to lead to a more significant move than a tail on a 5 minute chart. Kangaroo tails, also called fingers, are on my short list of reliable chart formations. They leap at you from the charts and are easy to recognize. If you doubt whether a kangaroo tail is present, assume it is not. Real kangaroo tails are unmistakable. They occur in the broad market indexes as well as individual stocks, futures, and other trading vehicles. Markets constantly fluctuate, seeking levels that generate the highest volume of trade. If a rally attracts no orders, the market will reverse and look for orders at lower levels. If volume dries up during a decline, the market is likely to rally, seeking orders at higher prices. Kangaroo tails reflect failed bull or bear raids. A kangaroo tail pointing up reflects a failed attempt by the bulls to lift the market. They're like a group of soldiers that take a hill from the enemy, only to discover that the main force has failed to follow. Now they escape and run downhill for their lives. Having failed to hold the hill, the army is likely to move away from it. I am grateful to Margarita Fokova, my translator in Moscow, who came up with this name for the pattern. 66. Classical Chart Analysis Figure 20.1 BIIB and FDO Daily Kangaroo Tales Biogen Iduk, Inc. was rising in a steady uptrend when it developed an upward kangaroo tail. The stock opened slightly below its previous close but then traced a very tall bar, triple the average height. It reached a record new high but then slid closing near its opening price. The next day's bar was of average height it completed the kangaroo pattern and the trend reversed down. The stock of Family Dollar Stores Incorporated was falling when its decline sharply accelerated, producing a downward pointing bar several times the average bar height for this stock. Notice that both opening and closing prices for that bar were well within the previous day's range. That downward stab marked the end of the downtrend, the next bar was of average height and after that the trend reversed up. A kangaroo tail that points down reflects a failed bear raid. Bears aggressively sold the market, pushing it lower but low prices did not attract volume and bears retreated back into the range. What do you think the market is likely to do next, after it failed to continue moving down? Since it found no orders below, it's likely to turn up and rally. When markets recoil from kangaroo tails, they offer trading opportunities. It was J. Peter Stiedelmeyer who pointed out years ago that a bar that looks like a finger sticking out of a tight chart pattern provides a valuable reference point for short-term traders. A kangaroo tail shows that a certain price has been rejected by the market. It usually leads to a swing in the opposite direction. As soon as you recognize a tail, trade against it. An experienced trader can recognize a kangaroo tail during its third bar, before it closes. For example, you may see a range that held for several days on a daily chart, but then on Monday the stock explodes in a very tall bar. If on Tuesday it opens near the base of the Monday's bar base and refuses to rally, consider selling short before the market closes on Tuesday. If the market has been in a trading range for a week and then traces a tall bar down on Wednesday, get ready on Thursday, if prices trade in a narrow range near the top of the Wednesday bar, go long before the market closes on Thursday. 20 Kangaroo Tales 67 
Figure 20.2 IGT Daily Trading Kangaroo Tails Kangaroo tails mark the final splash of bullishness or bearishness, depending on their direction. Here the kangaroo tail helped identify the end of an uptrend in the stock of international game technology. Notice the bar is more than double the usual height and is bracketed by shorter bars. If entering a short trade during the third bar, place your stop about halfway up the tail. Putting a stop at the tip of the tail would mean accepting too much risk. Notice a tail pointing down, marked by a green arrow. It stopped the downtrend and augured in a week-long rally. Remember that trading against the tails is a short-term tactic, on the daily charts, these signals fizzle out after a few days. Evaluate kangaroo tails against the background of the current market. For example, when running a long-term bullish campaign in a stock, be alert to kangaroo tails. A tail pointing up may well suggest profit taking on existing positions, while a tail pointing down identifies a good spot to add to long positions. Using stops is essential for survival and success in the markets. Putting a stop at the end of a tail would make your stop too wide, risking too much capital. When trading against the tail, place your protective stop about halfway through the tail. If the market starts chewing its tail, it is time to get out. PART4 PART4 Computerized Technical Analysis Computers were a novelty at the time I wrote trading for a living. My first computer for technical analysis was an Apple IIe desktop with a boxy modem and two floppy drives. Each held a 300 KB diskette, one for the analytic program and the other for market data. When the first hard drives came out, I had a choice of buying a 2-5 or 10 megabytes drive. 10 megabytes seemed too huge for anyone to ever need, so I sprang for a 5 megabytes hard drive. How technology has changed. A trader without a computer is like a man traveling on a bicycle. His legs grow strong and he sees a lot of scenery, but his progress is slow. When you travel on business and want to get to the point fast, you get a car. Today, very few people trade without computers. Our machines help track and analyze more markets in greater depth. They liberate us from the routine updating of charts, freeing up time for thinking. Computers allow us to use more complex indicators and spot more opportunities. Trading is an information game. A computer helps you process more information. On the minus side, with computers we lose a physical feel for price moves that comes from pencil and paper charting. 21 Computers in Trading Computerized technical analysis is more objective than classical charting. You can argue whether support or resistance is present but there can be no argument about an indicator's direction. Of course, you still need to decide what to do after you identify an indicator's message. 69. 70. Computerized technical analysis. Toolboxes. When working with wood or metal, you can go to a hardware store and buy a set of tools that can help you work smartly and efficiently. A technical analysis toolbox provides a set of electronic tools for processing market data. When you decide to get into computerized technical analysis, begin by drawing a list of tasks you want your computer to perform. This will take some serious thinking, but it's much better than getting a package first and scratching your head later, trying to figure out what it might do for you. Decide what markets you want to track, what types of charts to view and what indicators to use. A toolbox draws weekly, daily, and intraday charts, it splits the screen into several window panes for plotting prices and indicators. A good toolbox includes many popular indicators, such as moving averages, channels, MACD, stochastic, relative strength index, along with dozens if not hundreds of others. It allows you to modify all indicators and even construct your own. A good toolbox allows you to compare any two markets and analyze their spreads. If you trade options, your toolbox must include an options valuation model. 
advanced packages allow you to backtest trading systems. Another feature of a good toolbox is its ability to scan stocks. For example, you may want to find all stocks among the Nasdaq 100 whose exponential moving averages are rising, but whose prices are no more than 1% above their EMAs. Can your software scan for that? Can it add fundamental parameters to your search, such as rising earnings? Think what you want to find and then ask software vendors whether their products can do it for you. There are good toolboxes at all price levels. A beginner making his first steps may sign up with an online service that offers a basic set of computerized tools for free, you can upgrade to a paid level later. Most charts in this book are drawn using just such a service, stockcharts.com, because I want you to see how much you can do while spending very little. Some traders find that sufficient, while many of us buy programs that reside on our computers, allowing greater customization. With prices of software in a steady decline, you don't have to worry too much. Buy something simple and inexpensive and upgrade later it's a date, not a marriage. Once you've decided what package to use, you may want to hire somebody who already uses it to help you set it up on your machine. This can save a great deal of time and energy for inexperienced users. A growing number of brokerage firms offer free analytic software to their clients, the price is right, but they tend to have two serious limitations. First, for legal reasons, they make their software very hard to modify and second, it only works online. Traders often ask how to add my indicators to their brokerage software, and the usual answer is you can't. Most brokerage house programs enable you to place and change your orders using the same analytic software. This can be quite handy and useful for day traders, but less important for longer term traders. Be sure to disable a common feature that shows your equity gains or losses in real time. Watching dollars jump up or down at every tick is stressful and distracting. As the song goes, never count your money. 21 Computers in Trading 71 While you're sitting at the table there'll be time enough for counting when the dealing's done. Focus on prices and indicators instead of watching dollars and thinking what you can buy with them. Technical analysis software is constantly changing and evolving, a book is not the right place for software recommendations. My firm elder. Com maintains a brief software guide, which we periodically update and email to any trader who asks for it, as a public service. As mentioned earlier in this book, most programs for technical analysis fall into one of three groups, toolboxes, black boxes, and gray boxes. Toolboxes are for serious traders, black boxes are for people who believe in Santa Claus, and gray boxes are in between. When considering a new software package, be sure to know which group it belongs to. Black boxes and gray boxes. Software is pure magic. It tells you what and when to buy and sell without telling you why. You download the data and push a button. Lights blink, gears click, and a message lights up, telling you what to do. Magic. Black boxes always come with impressive track records that show profitable past performance. Every black box eventually self-destructs because markets keep changing. Even systems with built-in optimization don't survive because we don't know what kind of optimization will be needed in the future. There is no substitute for human judgment. The only way to make money from a black box is to sell one. Most black boxes are sold by hustlers to gullible or insecure traders. Each black box is guaranteed to fail, even if sold by an honest developer. Complex human activities, such as trading, cannot be automated. Machines can help but not replace humans. Trading with a black box means using a slice of someone else's intelligence, as it existed at some point in the past. Markets change, and experts change their minds, but a black box keeps churning out its buy and sell signals. It would have been funny if it wasn't so expensive for losers. Generates trading signals based on proprietary formulas. 
Unlike a black box, it discloses its general principles and allows you to adjust its parameters to some degree. The closer a gray box is to a toolbox, the better it is. Computers While online programs can run on any computer, most standalone programs are written for the Windows environment. Some traders run them on Macs, using emulation software. There are even programs for tablets, such as iPads. Technical analysis software tends to be not very demanding of processing power, but still, it makes sense to get the most modern machine so that it remains useful for years. Many day traders like to use multiple screens for a multidimensional view of the markets and the ability to watch several trading vehicles at once. Since I like to travel. 72. Computerized Technical Analysis I carry a small external screen that helps me monitor markets and trade from the road. It's the size of my laptop but much thinner and attaches to it with a USB cable, without a power cord. Market data. Swing and position traders enter and exit trades within days or weeks, while day traders enter and exit within a few hours if not minutes. End of day data is sufficient for position traders, but day traders need real time data. When you download the daily data for research, it pays to cover two bull and bear market cycles, or about 10 years. Whenever I approach a stock, I like to look back at 12 years of trading history to see whether it is cheap or expensive relative to its 12-year range. Whenever you approach a trade, you must know your edge what will help you make money. The ability to recognize patterns is a part of my edge, but if a stock's history is too short, there are no reliable patterns to identify. That's why I avoid trading very young stocks, those with less than a year's history. When collecting and analyzing data, don't chase too many markets at once. Focus on quality and depth rather than quantity. Begin by following the key market indexes, such as the Dow, the Nasdaq, and the S&P. Many professional traders focus on a relatively small number of stocks. They get to know them well and become familiar with their behavior patterns. You could start out by focusing on a dozen stocks. Many professionals limit themselves to fewer than 100 stocks, which they review every weekend and mark their opinions in a fresh column of their spreadsheet. They may select fewer than 10 stocks from that pool that look promising for the week ahead and focus on them. Build your watch list gradually from the popular stocks of the year, add a few stocks from the most promising industries and some stocks you've traded before. Building a watch list is like gardening. You can't get a beautiful garden in a single season, but you can get there over several seasons. Try to stick to the data in your own time zone. When I teach overseas, traders often ask whether I trade in their country. I remind them that whenever you put on a trade, you're trying to take money out of some other trader's pocket, while others are trying to pick yours. This game is hard enough when you're awake, but it is risky to trade in a different time zone, allowing locals to pick your pockets while you sleep. This is why I largely limit my trading to the US markets. Many overseas traders complain that they find their domestic markets too thin and ask whether it would make sense for them to trade in the huge and liquid US market. The answer depends on how different their time zone is from the US market's time zone. For example, the US markets are easy to trade from Europe where they open at 3.30 p.m. local time and close at 10 p.m. It is much harder to do from Asia or Australia, but it can work if you take a longer view and aim to catch longer term trends. Beginning traders should steer clear of day trading. It demands instant decision making, and if you stop to think, you're dead. Learn to trade in a slower environment. 21 computers in trading 73 become a competent position or swing trader before you consider day trading if you compare swing trading and day trading it is like playing the same video game at level 1 or level 9 you run the same mazes and dodge the same monsters but the pace of the game is so fast at level 9 that your reactions must be automatic 
Learn to analyze markets at level 1 become a swing trader before attempting to day trade. We'll return to this topic in chapter 33, trading time frames. A good place to get started is swing trading, i.e., holding positions for several days. Select popular stocks that have good swings on a good volume. Start out by following just a handful. Some swing traders who hold positions for only a few days use real-time data for timing entries and exits, while others manage quite well with end-of-day data. Three major groups of indicators. Indicators help identify trends and reversals. They are more objective than chart patterns and provide insight into the balance of power between bulls and bears. A great challenge is that various indicators may contradict one another. Some of them work best in trending markets, others in flat markets. Some are good at catching turning points, while others are better at riding trends. That's why it pays to select a small number of indicators from various groups and learn to combine them. Many beginners look for a silver bullet dash a single magic indicator, but markets are too complex to be handled with a single tool. Others try to poll a multitude of indicators and average their signals. The results of such a poll will be heavily skewed by the indicators you select. Most indicators are based on the same five pieces of data open, high, low, close, and volume. Prices are primary, indicators are derived from them. Using 10, 20, or 50 indicators will not deepen your analysis because they share the same base. We can divide indicators into three groups, trend-following indicators, oscillators, and miscellaneous. Trend-following indicators work best when markets are moving, but the quality of their signals sharply deteriorates when the markets go flat. Oscillators catch turning points in flat markets but give premature and dangerous signals when the markets begin to trend. Miscellaneous indicators provide insights into mass psychology. Before using any indicator, be sure to understand what it measures and how it works. Only then can you have confidence in its signals. Trend following indicators include moving averages, MACD lines, the directional system, on balance volume, accumulation slash distribution, and others. Trend following indicators are coincident or lagging indicators they turn after trends reverse. Help identify turning points. They include MACD histogram, force index, stochastic, rate of change, momentum, the relative strength index, elder ray, Williams percent R, and others. Oscillators are leading or coincident indicators that often turn ahead of prices. 74. Computerized technical analysis. Miscellaneous indicators provide insights into the intensity of bullish or bearish camps. They include the new high, new low index, the put call ratio, bullish consensus, commitments of traders, and others. They can be leading or coincident indicators. It pays to combine several indicators from different groups so that their negative features cancel each other out, while their positive features remain undisturbed. This is the aim of the triple screen trading system. As we begin to explore indicators, a few words of caution. Sometimes their signals are very clear, while at other times they are quite vague. I've learned long ago to enter trades only when indicator signals grab me by the face. If I find myself squinting at a chart while trying to understand its signals, I flip the page and move to the next stock. If you look at a familiar indicator but can't understand its message, it is most likely because the stock you are trying to analyze is in a chaotic stage. If indicator signals aren't clear, don't start massaging them or piling on more indicators, but simply leave that stock alone for the time being and look for another one. One of the great luxuries of private traders is that no one pushes us to trade we can wait for the best and clearest signals. As you read about the signals of different indicators, remember that you cannot base trading decisions on a single indicator. We need to select several indicators we understand and trust and combine them into a trading system. In the following chapters, we'll be exploring indicators, 
while later in the book we'll see how to build your own system from them. 22 Moving Averages Wall Street old-timers say that moving averages were brought to the financial markets after World War II. Anti-aircraft gunners used moving averages to sight guns on enemy planes and after the war, applied this method to moving prices. The two early experts on moving averages were Richard Donkian and J. M. Hurst neither apparently a gunner. Donkian was a Merrill Lynch employee who developed trading methods based on moving average crossovers. Hearst was an engineer who applied moving averages to stocks in his classic book, The Profit Magic of Stock Transaction Timing. A moving average reflects the average value of data in its time window. A 5-day MA shows the average price for the past 5 days, a 20-day MA for the past 20 days, and so on. Connecting each day's MA value gives you a moving average line. Plus P plus plus pp simple ma equals n where p is the price being averaged n is the number of days in the moving average the level of a moving average reflects values that are being averaged and depends on the width of the ma window suppose you want to calculate a three day simple 22 moving averages 75 moving average of a stock if it closes at 19, 21, and 20 on three consecutive days, then a three-day simple MA of closing prices is 20. Suppose that on the fourth day the stock closes at 22. It makes its three-day MA rise to 21 the average of the last three days, divided by three. There are three main types of moving averages, simple, exponential, and weighted. Simple MAS used to be popular because they were easy to calculate in pre-computer days, and both Donkian and Hearst used them. Simple MAS, however, have a fatal flaw they change twice in response to each price. Twice as much bark. First, a simple MA changes when a new piece of data comes in. That's good we want our MA to reflect the latest prices. The bad thing is that MA changes again when an old price is dropped off at the end of its window. When a high price is dropped, a simple MA ticks down. When a low price is dropped, a simple MA rises. Those changes have nothing to do with the current reality of the market. Imagine that a stock hovers between 80 and 90, and its 10-day simple MA stands at 85 but includes one day when the stock reached 105. When that high number is dropped at the end of the 10-day window, the MA will dive, as if in a downtrend. That meaningless dive has nothing to do with the current trend. When an old piece of data gets dropped off, a simple moving average jumps. This problem is worse with short MAS but not so bad with long MAS. If you use a 10-day MA, those drop-offs can really shake it because each day constitutes 10% of the total value. On the other hand, if you use a 200-day MA, where each day is responsible for only 0.5%, dropping off a day isn't going to influence it a lot. Still, a simple MA is like a guard dog that barks twice once when someone approaches the house, and once again when someone walks away from it. After a while, you don't know when to believe that dog. This is why a modern computerized trader is better off using exponential moving averages, which we'll discuss later in this chapter. Market psychology Each price is a snapshot of the current consensus of value among all market participants. Still, a single price doesn't tell you whether the crowd is becoming more bullish or bearish just as you can't tell from a single photo whether a person is an optimist or a pessimist. If, on the other hand, you take a daily photo of a person for 10 days, bring them to a lab, and order a composite picture, it'll reveal that person's typical features. You can monitor trends in that person's mood by updating that composite photo each day. A moving average is a composite photograph of the market it combines prices for several days. The market consists of huge crowds, and the MAS slope identifies the direction of mass inertia. A moving average represents an average consensus of value for the period of time in its window. The most important message of a moving average is the direction of its slope. 
when it rises, it shows that the crowd is becoming more optimistic bullish. When 76. Computerized technical analysis. It falls, it shows that the crowd is becoming more pessimistic bearish. When prices rise above a moving average, the crowd is more bullish than before. When prices fall below a moving average, the crowd is more bearish than before. Exponential moving averages. An exponential moving average is a better trend following tool because it gives greater weight to the latest data and responds to changes faster than a simple MA. At the same time, an EMA doesn't jump in response to dropping old data. This guard dog has better ears, and it barks only when someone approaches the house. EMA equals PK plus EMA where 2K equals N plus 1N equals the number of days in the EMA. Equals today's price. P equals the EMA of yesterday. EMA. Technical analysis software allows you to select EMA length. An EMA has two major advantages over a simple MA first, it assigns greater weight to the last trading day. The latest mood of the crowd is more important. In a 10-day EMA, the last closing price is responsible for 18% of EMA value, while in a simple MA all days are equal. Second. EMA does not drop old data the way a simple MA does. Old data slowly fades away, like a mood of the past lingering in a composite photo. Choosing the length of a moving average. It pays to monitor your EMA slope because a rising line reflects bullishness and a declining one bearishness. A relatively narrow window makes an EMA more sensitive to price changes. It catches new trends sooner, but leads to more whipsaws. A whipsaw is a rapid reversal of a trading signal. An EMA with a wider time window produces fewer whipsaws but misses turning points by a wider margin. You can take several approaches to deciding how long to make your moving average or any other indicator. It would be nice to tie EMA length to a price cycle if you can find it. A moving average should be half the length of the dominant market cycle. If you find a 22-day cycle, use an 11-day moving average. If the cycle is 34 days long, then use a 17-day moving average. Trouble is, cycles keep changing and disappearing. There is no single magic best number for the EMA window. Good indicators are robust not too sensitive to small changes in their parameters. When trying to catch longer trends, use a longer moving average. You need a bigger fishing rod to catch a bigger fish. A 200-day moving average works for long-term stock investors who want to ride major trends. Most traders can use an EMA between 10 and 30 days. A moving average should not be shorter than 8 days to avoid defeating its purpose as a trend-following tool. Among the numbers I like are 22 because there are approximately 22 trading days in a month and 26 half of the number of trading weeks in a year. 22 moving averages 77 creating individualized parameters for every trading vehicle is practical only if you track a tiny handful of stocks or futures once their number reaches double digits individualized parameters create confusion it is better to have a yardstick that's one yard long and use the same parameters for all your moving averages in the same time frame don't change indicator parameters while looking for trades. Fiddling with parameters to obtain signals you'd like to see robs your indicators of their most valuable feature their objectivity. It is better to set your parameters and live with them. Trading Rules Beginning traders try to forecast the future. Professionals don't forecast, they measure the relative power of bulls and bears, monitor the trend, and manage their positions. Moving averages help us trade in the direction of the trend. The single most important message of a moving average comes from the direction of its slope. It reflects the market's inertia. When an EMA rises, it is best to trade the market from the long side, and when it falls, it pays to trade from the short side. 1. When an EMA rises, trade that market from the long side. Buy when prices dip near the moving average. Once you are long, place a protective stop below the latest minor low, 
and move it to the break-even point as soon as prices close higher. 2. When the EMA falls, trade that market from the short side. Sell short when prices rally toward the EMA and place a protective stop above the latest minor high. Lower your stop to break even as prices drop. 3. When the EMA goes flat and only wiggles a little, it identifies an aimless, trendless market. Do not trade using a trend following method. Figure 22.1 Dis Daily 22 Day EMA An Exponential Moving Average The direction of the slope of a moving average helps identify trends of trading vehicles, such as the Walt Disney Company. 78. Computerized Technical Analysis Old traders used to follow fast and slow ma crossovers. The favorite approach of Donkian, one of the originators of trading with moving averages, was to use crossovers of 4-9- and 18-day MOS. Trading signals were given when all three MOS turned in the same direction. His method, like other mechanical trading methods, only worked during strongly trending markets. Trying to filter out whipsaws with mechanical rules is self-defeating filters reduce profits as much as losses. An example of a filter is a rule that requires prices to close on the other side of MA not once, but twice, or to penetrate MA by a certain margin. Mechanical filters reduce losses, but they also diminish the best feature of a moving average its ability to lock onto a trend at an early stage. A trader must accept that an EMA, like any other trading tool, has good and bad sides. Moving averages help you identify and follow trends, but they lead to whipsaws in trading ranges. We will look for an answer to this dilemma in the chapter on the triple screen trading system. More on moving averages. Moving averages often serve as support and resistance. A rising MA tends to serve as a floor below prices, and a falling MA serves as a ceiling above them. That's why it pays to buy near a rising MA, and sell short near a falling MA. Moving averages can be applied to indicators as well as prices. For example, some traders use a 5-day moving average of volume. When volume falls below its 5-day MA, it shows reduced public interest in the minor trend and indicates that it is likely to reverse. When volume overshoots its MA, it shows strong public interest and confirms the price trend. We'll be using moving averages of an indicator when we work with force index. The proper way to plot a simple moving average is to lag it behind prices by half its length. For example, a 10-day simple MA properly belongs in the middle of a 10-day period and it should be plotted underneath the 5th or 6th day. An exponential moving average is more heavily weighted toward the latest data, and a 10-day EMA should be lagged by 2 or 3 days. Most software packages allow you to lag a moving average. Moving averages can be based not only on closing prices but also on the mean between the high and the low, which can be useful for day traders. An exponential moving average assigns greater weight to the latest day of trading, but a weighted moving average allows you to assign any weight to any day, depending on what you deem important. WMAs are so complicated that traders are better off using EMAs. Dual EMAs Whenever I analyze charts, I like to use not one but two exponential moving averages. The longer EMAs shows a longer term consensus of value. The shorter term EMAs shows a shorter term consensus of value. 22 moving averages 79 I keep the ratio between them at approximately 2 to 1. For example, I may use a 26-week and a 13-week EMA on a weekly chart, or a 22-day and an 11-day EMA on a daily chart. Please understand there is no magic set of numbers. You should feel free to play with these values, selecting a set that will be unique to you. Just keep in mind to keep the difference between the two EMAs near 2 colon 1. It might be simpler and more efficient to use the same set of values in all time frames, weekly, daily, and even intraday. Since the shorter EMA represents the short-term consensus of value and the longer-term EMA the long-term consensus, 
I believe that value lives between these two lines. I call the space between the two M as the value zone. Moving averages and channels. A channel consists of two lines drawn parallel to a moving average. Oddly enough, the distance between the upper and the lower channel lines is sometimes described as height and at other times as width of the channel, even though both refer to the same measurement. A well-drawn channel should contain approximately 95% of all prices that occurred during the past 100 bars. Longer-term markets have wider channels because prices can cover greater distances in 100 weeks than in 100 days. Volatile markets have wider channels than quiet, sleepy markets. Channels are very useful for trading and performance tracking. We'll review the first in Chapter 41 and the second in Chapter 59. Prices, Values, and the Value Zone one of the key concepts in market analysis the concept that all of us intuitively understand but almost never spell out is that prices are different from values. We buy stocks when we feel that their current prices are below their true value and expect prices to rise. We sell and sell short when we think that stocks are priced above their real value and are likely to come down. We buy undervalued stocks and sell overvalued shares but how to define value? Fundamental analysts do it by studying balance sheets and annual reports, but those sources aren't nearly as objective as they seem. Companies often massage their financial data. Fundamental analysts don't have a monopoly on the concept of value. Technical analysts can define values by tracking the spread between a fast and a slow EMA. One of these EMAs reflects a short-term and the other a long-term consensus of value. Value lives in the zone between the two moving averages. Very important, it's impossible to trade successfully with just a single indicator or even a pair of moving averages. Markets are too complex to extract money from them with a single tool. We need to build a trading system using several indicators as well as analyze markets in more than one time frame. Keep this in mind as we review. 80. Computerized Technical Analysis Figure 22.2 Dis Daily, 26 and 13 Day Emmas Emmas and the Value Zone A short-term MA identifies a short-term consensus of value, while a long-term MA reflects a long-term consensus of value. Value lives in the zone between the two moving averages. Select the parameters for this pair so that the long-term average is approximately twice the length of the short-term EMA. Looking at a chart, you can immediately tell which EMA is longer or shorter the fast one hugs prices more closely, while the slow one moves more slowly. The slow EMA helps identify the trend, while the fast MA sets the boundary of the value zone. When looking to buy a stock, it pays to do it in the value zone, rather than overpay and buy above value. Similarly, when shorting, it pays to wait for a rally into the value zone to establish a short position rather than sell short when prices collapse. During the uptrend shown on this chart, you can see pullbacks to value, offering attractive buying opportunities in areas marked 1, 2, 3, and 4. The downward reversal of the slow EMA marks the end of the uptrend. At the right edge of the chart, the trend is down, while a pullback to value in Area 5 offers a shorting opportunity. Various indicators they are the building blocks of trading systems, which we'll review later in the book. Keeping this in mind will help you become a more rational trader. Once you know how to define value, you can aim to buy at or below value and sell above value. We'll return to look for trading opportunities in overvalued and undervalued markets when we examine price channels or envelopes in Chapter 41 on the Channel Trading System. 23 Moving Average Convergence Divergence, MACD Lines and MACD Histogram Moving averages help identify trends and their reversals. A more advanced indicator was constructed by Gerald Appel, an analyst and money manager in New York. 23 Moving Average Convergence Divergence 81 Moving Average Convergence Divergence, or MACD for short, consists of not one, 
but three exponential moving averages. It appears on the charts as two lines whose crossovers give trading signals. How to create MACD The original MACD indicator consists of two lines, a solid line and a dashed line. The MACD line is made up of two exponential moving averages. It responds to changes in prices relatively quickly. The signal line smooths the MACD line with another EMA. It responds to changes in prices more slowly. In Appel's original system, buy and sell signals were given when the fast MACD line crossed above or below the slow signal line. The MACD indicator is included in most programs for technical analysis. To create MACD by hand. 1. Calculate a 12-day EMA of closing prices. 2. Calculate a 26-day EMA of closing prices. 3. Subtract the 26-day EMA from the 12-day EMA, and plot their difference as a solid line. This is the fast MACD line. 4. Calculate a 9-day EMA of the fast line, and plot the result as a dashed line. This is the slow signal line. Market Psychology Each price reflects the consensus of value among the mass of market participants at the moment of the trade. A moving average represents an average consensus of value for a selected period of time it is a composite photo of mass consensus. A longer moving average tracks longer term consensus, and a shorter moving average tracks shorter term consensus. Crossovers of the MACD and signal lines identify shifts in the balance of power of bulls and bears. The fast MACD line reflects mass consensus over a shorter time period. The slow signal line reflects mass consensus over a longer period. When the fast MACD line rises above the slow signal line, it shows that bulls dominate the market, and it is better to trade from the long side. When the fast line falls below the slow line, it shows that bears dominate the market and it pays to trade from the short side. Trading Rules for MACD Lines Crossovers of the MACD and signal lines identify changes of market tides. Trading in the direction of a crossover means going with the flow of the market. This system generates fewer trades and whipsaws than mechanical systems based on a single moving average. 82. Computerized Technical Analysis 1. When the fast MACD line crosses above the slow signal line, it gives a buy signal. Go long and place a protective stop below the latest minor low. 2. When the fast line crosses below the slow line, it gives a sell signal. Go short, and place a protective stop above the latest minor high. Bottoms A, B, and C of ABX could be seen as an inverted head and shoulders bottom. Still, our technical indicators deliver much more objective messages than classical chart patterns. More on MACD lines. Sophisticated traders tend to personalize their MACD lines by using other moving averages than the standard 12 26 and 9 bar EMAs. Beware of optimizing MACD too often. If you fiddle with MACD long enough, you can make it give you any signal you'd like. Figure 23.1 ABX weekly, 26 and 13 week EMAs. 12-26-9 MACD lines MACD lines Barrick Gold Corporation, which has the largest market capitalization of all U.S. listed gold companies, was dragged down in 2012 and 2013 by the bear market in gold. Notice the sell signal, marked by a red vertical arrow, when the fast line crossed below the slow line. That signal reversed more than a year later, when the fast line crossed above the slow line, marked with a green vertical arrow. Notice several additional patterns on this chart. When ABX fell to a record low, marked B, MACD lines refused to confirm, they didn't fall to a new low but traced out a double bottom. That new low B turned out to be a false downside breakout, a bullish sign. Bear's last attempt to drive ABX lower, in area C, wasn't confirmed by MACD lines, which maintained a steady uptrend. At the right edge of the chart, 
MACD lines have reached a new high for the up move, indicating strength. Both EMAs are rising, confirming the bullish trend. 23 Moving Average Convergence Divergence 83 A quick and dirty way to plot MACD can be used by traders whose software doesn't include this indicator. Some packages allow you to draw only two EMAs. In that case, you can use crossovers between two EMAs, such as 12-day and 26-day EMAs as a proxy for MACD and signal lines. MACD Histogram MACD Histogram offers a deeper insight into the balance of power between bulls and bears than the original MACD lines. It shows not only whether bulls or bears are in control but also whether they are growing stronger or weaker. It is one of the best tools available to market technicians. MACD Histogram equals MACD Line Signal Line MACD Histogram measures the difference between the MACD line and the signal line. It plots that difference as a histogram a series of vertical bars. That distance may appear puny, but a computer rescales it to fill the screen. EA GC B HD F Figure 23.2 DJIA Daily, 26 and 13 Day Emma's, 12 26 9 MACD Lines MACD Histogram When MACD lines cross over, MACD Histogram, which is derived from them, crosses above or below its zero line. You can see buy and sell signals of MACD lines marked by green and red arrows. These signals are often delayed, but MACD histogram gives its own fine signals. We'll return to them later in this chapter, but at this point let's look at just one. Compare the Dow bottoms D and F. The second bottom was slightly lower, but the corresponding bottom of MACD histogram was more shallow than the first, warning that bears were weaker than before and an upside reversal was likely to occur. 84. Computerized Technical Analysis If the fast line is above the slow line, MACD histogram is positive and plotted above the zero line. If the fast line is below the slow line, MACD histogram is negative and plotted below the zero line. When the two lines touch, MACD histogram equals zero. When the spread between the MACD and signal lines increases, MACD histogram becomes taller or deeper, depending on its direction. When the two lines draw closer, MACD histogram becomes shorter. The slope of MACD histogram is defined by the relationship between any two neighboring bars. If the last bar is higher, the slope of MACD histogram is up. If the last bar is lower, then the slope of MACD histogram is down. Market Psychology MACD histogram reveals the difference between long-term and short-term consensus of value. The fast MACD line reflects market consensus over a shorter period. The slow signal line reflects market consensus over a longer period. MACD histogram tracks the difference between them. The slope of MACD histogram identifies the dominant market group. A rising MACD histogram shows that bulls are becoming stronger. A falling MACD histogram shows that bears are becoming stronger. When the fast MACD line rallies ahead of the slow signal line, MACD histogram rises. It shows that bulls are becoming stronger than they have been it is a good time to trade from the long side. When the fast MACD line drops faster than the slow line, MACD histogram falls. It shows that bears are becoming stronger it's a good time to trade from the short side. When the slope of MACD histogram moves in the same direction as prices, the trend is safe. When the slope of MACD histogram moves in a direction opposite to that of prices, the health of the trend is in question. The slope of MACD histogram is more important than its position above or below the center line. It is best to trade in the direction of the slope of MACD histogram because it shows whether bulls or bears dominate the market. The best buy signals occur when MACD histogram is below its center line but its slope turns up, 
showing that bears have become exhausted. The best cell signals are given when MACD histogram is above its center line but its slope turns down, showing that bulls have become exhausted. Trading Rules MACD histogram gives two types of trading signals. One is common, occurring at every price bar. The other is rare but extremely strong. It may occur only a few times a year on the daily chart of a stock. It's even more rare on the weekly charts, but more frequent on the intraday charts. The common signal is given by the slope of MACD histogram. When the current bar is higher than the preceding bar, the slope is up. It shows that bulls are in control. 23 Moving Average Convergence Divergence 85 And it's time to buy. When the current bar is lower than the preceding bar, the slope is down. It shows that bears are in control and it's time to be short. When prices go one way but MACD histogram moves the other way, it shows that the dominant crowd is losing its enthusiasm and the trend is weaker than it appears. One by when MACD histogram stops falling and ticks up. Place a protective stop below the latest minor low. Two sell short when MACD histogram stops rising and ticks down. Place a protective stop above the latest minor high. MACD histogram ticks up and down on the daily chart so often that it's not practical to buy and sell every time it turns. The changes of slope of MACD histograms are much more meaningful on the weekly charts, which is why it is included in the triple screen trading system. A combination of an exponential moving average and MACD histogram helps create the impulse system, described in Chapter 40. When to expect a new peak or valley. A record peak for the past three months of daily MACD histogram shows that bulls are very strong and prices are likely to rise even higher. A record new low for MACD histogram for the past three months shows that bears are very strong and lower prices are likely ahead. When MACD histogram reaches a new high during a rally, the uptrend is healthy and you can expect the next rally to retest or exceed its previous peak. If MACD histogram falls to a new low during a downtrend, it shows that bears are strong and prices are likely to retest or exceed their latest low. MACD histogram works like headlights on a car it gives you a glimpse of the road ahead. Not all the way home, mind you, but enough to drive safely at a reasonable speed. More on MACD histogram. MACD histogram works in all time frames, weekly, daily, and intraday. Signals in longer time frames lead to greater price moves. For example, the signals of weekly MACD histogram lead to greater price changes than the daily or intraday MACD. This principle applies to all technical indicators. When you use MACD lines and MACD histogram on the weekly charts, you don't have to wait until Friday to find your signals. A trend can turn in the middle of the week the market does not watch the calendar. It makes sense to perform weekly studies each day. I set my software to plot weekly charts in the traditional manner, from Monday through Friday, but with a twist, the latest weekly bar reflects trading for the current week, starting on Monday. After the market closes on Monday, my latest weekly bar is identical to Monday's daily bar. The weekly bar on Tuesday reflects two trading days, and so on. Because of this, on Monday I take the new weekly bar at a heavy discount, but by Thursday I start trusting it a great deal more. 86. Computerized Technical Analysis Divergences Divergences are among the most powerful signals in technical analysis. In this subchapter, we'll focus on MACD histogram, but this concept applies to most indicators. Divergences between MACD histogram and prices are infrequent, but they give some of the most powerful signals. They often mark major turning points. They don't occur at every important top or bottom, but when you see one, you know that a big reversal is probably at hand. Bullish divergences occur towards the ends of downtrends they identify market bottoms. 
A classical bullish divergence occurs when prices and the oscillator both fall to a new low, rally, with the oscillator rising above its zero line, then both fall again. This time, prices drop to a lower low, but an oscillator traces a higher bottom than during its previous decline. Such bullish divergences often precede sharp rallies. B. C. A. Figure 23.3 DJIA Weekly, 26 and 13 day Emma's, 12 26 9 MACD lines and MACD histogram. A bullish divergence. Here you see a divergence that signaled the 2007 to 2009 bear market bottom, giving a strong buy signal right near the lows. In area A, the Dow appeared in a free fall, as Lehman Brothers went bust and waves of selling hit the market. The record low A of MACDH indicated that bears were extremely strong and that the price bottom A was likely to be retested or exceeded. In area B, MACDH rallied above its center line, breaking the back of the bear. Notice that the brief rally reached the value zone between the two moving averages. This is a fairly common target for bear market rallies. In area C, the Dow slid to a new bear market low, but MACDH traced a much more shallow low. Its uptick completed a bullish divergence, giving a strong buy signal. 23 Moving Average Convergence Divergence 87 I'm showing you this weekly chart of DJIA and its MACD histogram as a perfect example of a divergence. It deserves to be pinned to a wall near your trading desk. You won't always get such a perfect picture, but the closer you get to it, the more reliable it'll be. Notice that the breaking of the center line between two indicator bottoms is an absolute must for a true divergence. MACD histogram has to cross above that line before skidding to its second bottom. If there is no crossover, there is no divergence. Another key point, MACDH gives a buy signal when it ticks up from the second bottom. It does not have to cross above the center line for the second time. The buy signal occurs when MACDH, still below zero, simply stops declining and traces out a bar that is less negative than its preceding bar. This divergence of MACD histogram in figure 23.3 was reinforced when MACD lines traced a bullish pattern between the bottoms A and C, with the second bottom more shallow than the first. Such patterns of MACD lines are quite rare. They indicate that the coming uptrend is likely to be especially strong, even though we cannot call them divergences because this indicator has no zero line. The rally that began in 2009 lasted almost a year before its first meaningful correction. Also, we can't call the pattern of lower indicator tops after the bottom C a divergence. The lower tops reflect a gradual weakening of the uptrend with the passage of time. In order to count as a divergence, MACD histogram has to cross and recross its zero line. Bearish divergences occur in uptrends they identify market tops. A classical bearish divergence occurs when prices reach a new high and then pull back, with an oscillator dropping below its zero line. Prices stabilize and rally to a higher high, but an oscillator reaches a lower peak than it did on a previous rally. Such bearish divergences usually lead to sharp breaks. A bearish divergence shows that bulls are running out of steam, prices are rising out of inertia, and bears are ready to take control. Valid divergences are clearly visible they seem to jump at you from the charts. If you need a ruler to tell whether there is a divergence, assume there is none. The previous chart featured a striking bullish divergence at the 2009 stock market bottom. Now, for a similarly striking illustration of a massive bearish divergence, let's roll back the clock and examine the 2007 bull market top. Notice that the breaking of the center line between the two indicator tops is an absolute must for a true divergence. MACD histogram has to drop below its zero line before rising to the second top. Another key point, MACDH gives a sell signal when it ticks down from the second top. We don't need to wait for it to cross below the center line again. 
The cell signal occurs when MACDH, still above zero, simply stops rising and traces out a bar shorter than the preceding bar. The message of a bearish divergence in figure 23.4 was reinforced by MACD lines, which traced a bearish pattern between the tops X and Z. The second top of 88. Computerized Technical Analysis X Z Y Figure 23.4 DJIA Weekly, 26 and 13 Day Emma's 12-26-9 MACD lines and MACD histogram A bearish divergence In area X, the Dow rallied to a new bull market high and MACD histogram rallied with it, rising above its previous peak and showing that bulls were extremely strong. This indicated that the price peak X was likely to be retested or exceeded. Note that the top X of MACD, despite its complex form, was not a divergence because the valley in its middle never sank below zero. In area Y, MACDH fell below its center line, breaking the back of the bull. Notice that prices punched below the value zone between the two moving averages. This is a fairly common target for bull market breaks. Notice also a kangaroo tail at the bottom Y. In area Z, the Dow rallied to a new bull market high, but the rally of MACDH was feeble, reflecting the bull's weakness. Its downtick from peak Z completed a bearish divergence, giving a strong sell signal and auguring in the nastiest bear market in a generation. MACD lines was more shallow than the first, confirming the bearish divergence of MACDH. Such patterns of MACD lines tell us that the coming downtrend is likely to be especially severe. Missing right shoulder divergences in which the second peak fails to cross the zero line are quite rare, but produce very strong trading signals. An experienced trader can look for them, but they are definitely not for beginners. They are described and illustrated in the ebook Two Roads Diverge Trading Divergences. Kerry Lovorn performed extensive research to find that the most tradable divergences occur when the distance between the two peaks or the two bottoms of MACDH is between 20 and 40 bars and the closer to 20, the better. In other words, the two tops or two bottoms cannot be too far apart. 20 bars translate into 20 weeks on a weekly chart, 20 days on a daily chart, and so on. Kerry also found 24 The Directional System 89 That the best signals come from divergences in which the second top or bottom is no more than half the height or the depth of the first. Triple bullish or bearish divergences consist of three price bottoms and three oscillator bottoms or three price tops and three oscillator tops. They are even stronger than regular divergences. In order for a triple divergence to occur, a regular bullish or bearish divergence first has to abort. That's another good reason to practice tight money management. If you lose only a little on a whipsaw, you will preserve both the money and psychological strength to re-enter a trade. The third top or bottom has to be more shallow than the first but not necessarily the second. The Hound of the Baskervilles this signal occurs when a reliable chart or indicator pattern doesn't lead to the action you expected and prices move in the opposite direction. A divergence may indicate that an uptrend is over, but if prices continue to rise, they give the hound of the Baskerville signal. This signal is named after the story by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle in which Sherlock Holmes was called to investigate a murder at a country estate. He found the essential clue when he realized that the family dog didn't bark while the murder was being committed. That meant the dog knew the criminal and the murder was an inside job. The signal was given by the lack of expected action by the lack of barking. When the market refuses to bark in response to a perfectly good signal, it gives you the hound of the Baskerville signal. This shows that something is fundamentally changing below the surface. Then it is time to get in gear with the new powerful trend. I am not a fan of stop and reverse orders, but make an exception for the Hound of the Baskervilles. On those rare occasions when a bearish divergence aborts, I may go long. In the rare instances when a bullish divergence aborts, 
I look to go short. 24. The directional system. The directional system is a trend following method developed by J. Wells Wilder, Jr. in the mid 1970s and modified by several analysts. It identifies trends and shows when a trend is moving fast enough to make it worth following. It helps traders to profit by taking chunks out of the middle of important trends. How to construct the directional system? Directional movement is defined as the portion of today's range that is outside of the previous day's range. The directional system checks whether today's range extends above or below the previous day's range and averages that data over a period of time. These complex calculations are best performed on a computer. The directional system is included in most programs for technical analysis. 90. Computerized Technical Analysis one identify directional movement by comparing today's high-low range with yesterday's high-low range. Directional movement is the largest part of today's range outside of yesterday's range. There are four types of DM. DM is always a positive number. Two identify the true range of the market you analyze. TR is always a positive number, the largest of the following three, A the distance from today's high to today's low B. The distance from today's high to yesterday's close C. The distance from today's low to yesterday's close. 3. Calculate daily directional indicators. They allow you to compare different markets by expressing their directional movement as a percentage of each market's true range. Each D is a positive number, plus D equals A B DM plus DM 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 plus DM plus DM DM equals zero DM equals zero C D Figure 24.1 Directional Movement Directional movement is the largest part of today's range that is outside of yesterday's range. 1. If today's range extends above yesterday's range, directional movement is positive. 2. If today's range extends below yesterday's range, directional movement is negative. 3. If today's range is inside of yesterday's range or extends above and below it by equal amounts, there is no directional movement. If today's range extends both above and below yesterday's range, DM is positive or negative, depending on which part of the outside range is larger. 4. On a limit up day, plus DM equals the distance from today's close to yesterday's high. On a limit down day, DM equals the distance from today's close to yesterday's low. 24. The directional system. 91. 0 on a day with no directional movement up, D equals 0 on a day with no directional movement down. Plus DM plus D equals. DM D equals TR. TR. 4. Calculate smoothed directional lines. Smooth and D and D are created with moving averages. Most software packages allow you to pick any period for smoothing, such as a 13 day moving average. You get two indicator lines, smoothed positive and negative directional lines, plus D and D. Both numbers are positive. They are usually plotted in different colors. The relationship between positive and negative lines identifies trends. When and D is on top, it shows that the trend is up, and when D is on top, it shows that the trend is down. The crossovers of and D and D give buy and sell signals. 5. Calculate the average directional indicator. This unique component of the directional system shows when a trend is worth following. ADX measures the spread between directional lines and D and D. It is calculated in two steps, A calculate the daily directional indicator DX plus D, D DX equals 100 plus D plus D for example, if plus D equals 34 and D equals 18, then 34 18 DX equals 100 equals 30.77, rounded off to 31 34 plus 18.
B. Calculate the average directional indicator ADX by smoothing DX with a moving average, such as a 13-day EMA. During a persistent trend, the spread between two smoothed directional lines increases, and ADX rises. ADX declines when a trend reverses or when a market enters a trading range. It pays to use trend following methods only when ADX is rising. Crowd behavior The directional system tracks changes in mass bullishness and bearishness by measuring the capacity of bulls and bears to move prices outside of the previous day's range. If today's high is above yesterday's high, it shows that the market crowd is more bullish. If today's low is below yesterday's low, it shows that the market crowd is more bearish. The relative positions of directional lines identify trends. When the positive directional line is above the negative directional line, it shows that bullish traders dominate the market. When the negative directional line rises above the positive. 92. Computerized Technical Analysis Directional line, it shows that bearish traders are stronger. It pays to trade with the upper directional line. The average directional indicator rises when the spread between directional lines increases. This shows that market leaders, for example bulls in a rising market, are becoming stronger, the losers weaker, and the trend is likely to continue. ADX declines when the spread between directional lines narrows down. This shows that the dominant market group is losing its strength, while the underdogs are gaining. It suggests that the market is in turmoil, and it's better not to use trend-following methods. ABC Figure 24.2 ANV Daily, 22-Day EMA, Directional System Directional System Swings between strength and weakness are a typical market feature. Strong stock groups grow weak while the weak ones become strong, and then they swap roles again. Gold and silver stocks were the two weakest stock industry groups in 2013, but they began bottoming out in December. Allied Nevada Gold Corp was one of several stocks I began buying at that time. The low at point A was $3.07, at point B the stock dipped to $3.01 and recoiled, leaving behind a false downside breakout, and at point C it retested support by declining to $3.08 and from there it was off to the races, with its EMA turning up. The directional system gave its buy signal during the bar marked with a vertical green arrow, the green bullish directional line was above the red bearish line, while the ADX penetrated above the red line. You may find a similar shorting signal in the lettered area, but a discretionary trader doesn't trade every signal he sees, shorting a stock near $3 that has already declined from $45 would mean chasing a very old trend. Near the right edge you see a pullback to value, offering a good opportunity to add to the long position. 24 The Directional System 93 Trading Rules One trade only from the long side when the positive directional line is above the negative one. Trade only from the short side when the negative directional line is above the positive one. The best time to trade is when the ADX is rising, showing that the dominant group is getting stronger. 2. When ADX declines, it shows that the market is becoming less directional. There are likely to be many whipsaws. When ADX points down, it is better not to use a trend following method. 3. When ADX falls below both directional lines, it identifies a flat, sleepy market. Do not use a trend following system but get ready to trade, because major trends emerge from such lulls. 4. The single best signal of the directional system comes after ADX falls below both directional lines. The longer it stays there, the stronger the base for the next move. When ADX rallies from below both directional lines, it shows that the market is waking up from a lull. When ADX rises by 4 steps from its lowest point below both directional lines, it rings a bell on a new trend. It shows that a new bull market or bear market is being born, depending on what directional line is on top. 
5. When ADX rallies above both directional lines, it identifies an overheated market. When ADX turns down from above both directional lines, it shows that the major trend has stumbled. It is a good time to take profits on a directional trade. If you trade large positions, you definitely want to take partial profits. Market indicators give hard signals and soft signals. For example, when a moving average changes direction, it is a hard signal. A downturn of ADX is a soft signal. Once you see ADX turn down, you ought to be very, very careful about adding to positions. You should start taking profits, reducing positions, and looking to get out. Average True Range Help from Volatility Average True Range is an indicator that averages true ranges over a selected period of time, such as 13 days. Since volatility is a key factor in trading, you can track it by plotting a set of ATR lines above and below a moving average. They will help you visualize current volatility and you can use that for decision making. Carrie Lovorn likes to plot three sets of lines around a moving average, at 1, 2, and 3 address above and below an EMA. These can be used for setting up entry points and stops, as well as profit targets. In the chapter on moving averages, we saw that it was a good idea to buy below value below the EMA. But how far below? Normal pullbacks tend to bottom out near the minus 1 ATR. You want your stop to be at least 1 ATR away from your entry. Anything less than that would place your stop within the zone of normal market noise. 94. Computerized Technical Analysis AD Plus 3 Plus 2 Plus 1 C 1 2 3 B Figure 24.3 Lulu Daily, 21 Emma, Volume with 8 Emma, ATR Channels ATR Channels This Diary of a Trade, Lululemon Athletic Inc., was posted by Carrie in Spick E-Trade com, where we post diaries of our trades. It shows using ATR channels for profit taking. Lulu gap down on a wide range bar on September 18th after an earnings announcement. There was no downside follow through, and as the stock rallied, Carey drew a horizontal line at the midpoint of its tall bar A, which tends to serve as short term support. As Lulu pulled back, its daily ranges narrowed and volume dried up in area B carry bought Lulu at $72.02 on Monday September 30th, during bar C, as it recovered from a false downside breakout. He took profits on January 3rd of his position at $73.70 later that day, as Lulu came within a few cents of plus 1 ATR. On Thursday, during bar D, Lulu hit its plus 2 ATR at $76.63, and Carey exited another one-third of his position. He took the remaining one-third near the mid-range of bar D. Making it likely to be hit by a random short-term move. Placing your stop further away makes it more likely that only a real reversal can hit your stop. Targets after you buy a stock, depending on how bullish it appears to you, you can place an order to take profits at plus one, plus two, or even plus three adverse. Carey likes to get out of his winning positions in several steps, placing orders for taking profits for one third at 1 ATR, another third at 2 ATR, and the rest at 3 ATR. It is highly unusual for any market to trade outside of 3 ATR's 3 times average true range for a long time. Those tend to be the extreme moves. Whenever you see a market trade outside of its 3 adverse, either up or down, it is reasonable to expect a pullback. ATR channels work not only with prices. We can also use them to bracket technical indicators to help identify the extreme levels where trends are likely to reverse. I use ATR channels on the weekly charts of Force Index. 95. 25 Oscillators While trend-following indicators, 
such as MACD lines or directional system, help identify trends, oscillators help catch turning points. Whenever masses of traders become gripped by greed or fear, they surge but after a while their intensity fizzles out. Oscillators measure the speed of any surge and show when its momentum is starting to break. Oscillators identify emotional extremes of market crowds. They allow you to find unsustainable levels of optimism and pessimism. Professionals tend to fade those extremes. They bet against deviations and for a return to normalcy. When the market rises and the crowd gets up on its hind legs and roars from greed, professionals get ready to sell short. They get ready to buy when the market falls and the crowd howls in fear. Oscillators help us time those trades. Overbought and oversold. Overbought means a market is too high and ready to turn down. An oscillator becomes overbought when it reaches a high level associated with tops in the past. Oversold means a market is too low and ready to turn up. An oscillator becomes oversold when it reaches a low level associated with bottoms in the past. Be sure to remember that those aren't absolute levels. An oscillator can stay overbought for weeks when a new strong uptrend begins, giving premature sell signals. It can stay oversold for weeks in a steep downtrend, giving premature buy signals. Knowing when to use oscillators and when to rely on trend following indicators is a hallmark of a mature analyst. We can mark overbought and oversold oscillator levels by horizontal reference lines. Place those lines so that they cut across only the highest peaks and the lowest valleys of that oscillator for the past 6 months. The proper way to draw those lines is to place them so that an oscillator spends only about 5% of its time beyond each line. Readjust these lines once every 3 months. When an oscillator rises or falls beyond its reference line, it helps identify an unsustainable extreme, likely to precede a top or a bottom. Oscillators work spectacularly well in trading ranges, but they give premature and dangerous signals when a new trend erupts from a range. We've already reviewed one important oscillator MACD histogram. We looked at it ahead of schedule because it's derived from a trend following indicator, MACD lines. We'll now explore very popular oscillators, stochastic and relative strength index. 26 Stochastic Stochastic is an oscillator popularized by the late George Lane. It's now included in many software programs and widely used by computerized traders. Stochastic tracks the relationship of each closing price to the recent high-low range. It consists of two lines, a fast line called percent %K and a slow line called percent %D. 96. Computerized Technical Analysis one the first step in calculating stochastic is to obtain raw stochastic or percent %k l percent %k equals c100 lh equals today's close where c equals the lowest point for the selected number of days l equals the highest point for the selected number of days hn equals the number of days for stochastic selected by the trader the standard width of stochastic's time window is 5 days although some traders use higher values. A narrow window helps catch more turning points, but a wider window helps identify more important turning points. 2. The second step is to obtain percent %D. It is done by smoothing percent %K usually over a 3-day period. It can be done in several ways, such as L, 100. Percent %D equals 3-day sum of 3-day sum of H. There are two ways to plot stochastic fast and slow. Fast stochastic consists of two lines percent %K and percent %D plotted on the same chart. It's very sensitive but leads to many whipsaws. Many traders prefer to use slow stochastic, adding an extra layer of smoothing. The percent %D of fast stochastic becomes the percent %K of slow stochastic and is smoothed by repeating step 2 to obtain percent %D of slow stochastic. Slow stochastic does a better job of filtering out market noise and leads to fewer whipsaws. Stochastic is designed to fluctuate between 0 and 100. 
Reference lines are usually drawn at 20% and 80% levels to mark overbought and oversold areas. Crowd psychology. Each price is the consensus of value of all market participants at the moment of transaction. Daily closing prices are important because the settlement of trading accounts depends on them. The high of any period marks the maximum power of bulls during that time. The low of that period shows the maximum power of bears during that time. Stochastic measures the capacity of bulls or bears to close the market near the upper or lower edge of the recent range. When prices rally, markets tend to close near the high. If bulls can lift prices during the day but can't close them near the top, stochastic turns down. It shows that bulls are weaker than they appear and gives a sell signal. Daily closes tend to occur near the lows in downtrends. When a bar closes near its high, it shows that bears can only push prices down during the day but cannot hold them down. An upturn of stochastic shows that bears are weaker than they appear and flashes a buy signal. 26 Stochastic 97 Figure 26.1 CVX Daily, 26 Day Emma 5 Day Slow Stochastic Stochastic. This chart of Chevron Corporation illustrates both helpful and dangerous aspects of stochastic. As long as the stock stays in a sideways trading range, which is where it was for most of the time covered by this chart, stochastic keeps nailing down short term tops and bottoms. Stochastic gives buy signals, marked here with vertical green arrows, when it rises above its lower reference line. It gives sell signals, marked by vertical red arrows, by sinking below its upper reference line. Those signals are reinforced by broad, downsloping stochastic tops, marked by diagonal black arrows. A careful reader will find several instances of false breakouts in figure 26.1 that reinforce stochastic signals. Using stochastic signals during a trading range is like going to a cash machine. That machine stops working and eats your card after a trend erupts from the trading range. A sharp downtrend near the right edge overrides the stochastic buy signal. A trader may rely on stochastic in a trading range, but should use protective stops because the last trade in a range always creates a loss when a trend begins. We'll focus on stop placement in Chapter 54. Trading Rules Stochastic shows when bulls or bears become stronger or weaker. This information helps decide whether bulls or bears are likely to win the current fight. It pays to trade with winners and against losers. Stochastic gives three types of trading signals, listed here in the order of importance, divergences, the level of stochastic lines, and their direction. Divergences the most powerful buy and sell signals of stochastic are given by divergences between this indicator and prices. 98. Computerized Technical Analysis One a bullish divergence occurs when prices fall to a new low, but stochastic traces a higher bottom than during its previous decline. It shows that bears are losing strength and prices are falling out of inertia. As soon as stochastic turns up from its second bottom, it gives a strong buy signal, go long and place a protective stop below the latest low in the market. The best buy signals occur when the first bottom is below the lower reference line and the second above it. 2. A bearish divergence occurs when prices rally to a new high, but stochastic traces a lower top than during its previous rally. It shows that bulls are becoming weaker and prices are rising out of inertia. As soon as stochastic turns down from the second top, it gives a sell signal, go short and place a protective stop above the latest price peak. The best sell signals occur when the first top is above the upper reference line and the second below. Overbought and oversold When stochastic rallies above its upper reference line, it shows that the market is overbought. It means that a stock or even the entire market is unusually high and ready to turn down. When stochastic falls below its lower reference line, it shows that a stock or even the entire market is oversold, too low and ready to turn up. These signals work fine during trading ranges but not when a market develops a trend. 
In uptrends, stochastic quickly becomes overbought and keeps giving sell signals while the market rallies. In downtrends, it quickly becomes oversold and keeps giving premature buy signals. It pays to combine stochastic with a long-term trend following indicator. The triple screen trading system allows traders to take buy signals from daily stochastic only when the weekly trend is up. When the weekly trend is down, it allows traders to take only sell signals from daily stochastic. 1. When you identify an uptrend on a weekly chart, wait for daily stochastic lines to decline below their lower reference line. Then, without waiting for their crossover or an upturn, place a buy order above the high of the latest price bar. Once you are long, place a protective stop below the low of the trade day or the previous day, whichever is lower. The shape of stochastic's bottom often indicates whether a rally is likely to be strong or weak. If the bottom is narrow and shallow, it shows that bears are weak and the rally is likely to be strong. If it is deep and wide, it shows that bears are strong and the rally is likely to be weak. It is better to take only strong buy signals. 2. When you identify a downtrend on a weekly chart, wait for daily stochastic lines to rally above their upper reference line. Then, without waiting for their crossover or a downturn, place an order to sell short below the low of the latest price bar. By the time stochastic lines cross over, the market is often in a free fall. Once you are short, place a protective stop above the high of the trade day or the previous day, whichever is higher. 27 Relative Strength Index 99 the shape of stochastic's top often indicates whether a decline is likely to be steep or sluggish. A narrow top of stochastic shows that bulls are weak and a severe decline is likely. A stochastic top that is high and wide shows that bulls are strong it is safer to pass up that sell signal. 3. Do not buy when stochastic is overbought, and don't sell short when it is oversold. This rule filters out most bad trades. Line Direction when both stochastic lines are headed in the same direction, they confirm the short-term trend. When prices rise and both stochastic lines rise, the uptrend is likely to continue. When prices slide and both stochastic lines fall, the short-term downtrend is likely to continue. More on stochastic. You can use stochastic in any time frame, including weekly, daily, or intraday. Weekly stochastic usually changes its direction one week prior to weekly MACD histogram. If weekly stochastic turns, it warns you that MACD histogram is likely to turn the next week time to tighten stops on existing positions or start taking profits. Choosing the width of the stochastic window is important. Shorter term oscillators are more sensitive. Longer term oscillators turn only at important tops and bottoms. If you use stochastic as a standalone oscillator, a longer stochastic is preferable. If you use stochastic as part of a trading system, combined with trend following indicators, then a shorter stochastic is preferable. 27 Relative Strength Index Relative Strength Index is an oscillator developed by J. Wells Wilder, JR. It measures any trading vehicle's strength by monitoring changes in its closing prices. It's a leading or a coincident indicator never a laggard. RSI equals 100 101 plus RS RS equals average of net up closing changes for selected period of days average of net down closing changes for the same number of days. RSI fluctuates between 0 and 100 dot when it reaches a peak and turns down, it identifies a top. When it falls and then turns up, it identifies a bottom. The pattern of RSI peaks and valleys doesn't change in response to the width of its time window. Trading signals become more visible with shorter RSI, such as 7 or 9 days. Overbought and oversold RSI levels vary from market to market and even from year to year in the same market. There are no magical levels for all tops and 100. Computerized Technical Analysis Figure 27.1 CVX daily, 13-day RSI. Relative Strength Index. 
Here we apply a 13-day RSI to the chart of Chevron Corporation that we already examined in figure 26.1, in the chapter on stochastic. Both RSI and stochastic work well in trading ranges, but give premature and dangerous signals when prices begin to trend. RSI, based exclusively on closing prices, is less noisy than stochastic. It calls for rallies when it rises above its lower reference line, marked here by vertical green arrows. It signals declines by sinking below its upper reference line, marked here by vertical red arrows. Comparing both charts, you see that the RSI signals emerge earlier. A very powerful sell signal is given by a bearish divergence of RSI, marked here by a diagonal solid arrow and a dashed red arrow. The stock rallied to a new high, while RSI couldn't reach its upper reference line, pointing to that rally's hidden weakness. The sharp break near the right edge pushes prices lower despite the RSI buy signal. To avoid getting hurt, we must use protective stops because the last trade in a range can easily create a loss when a new trend begins. Bottoms Oversold and overbought signals are like hot and cold readings on a window thermometer. The same temperature levels mean different things in summer or winter. Horizontal reference lines must cut across the highest peaks and the lowest valleys of RSI. They are often drawn at 30% and 70%. Some traders use 40% and 80% levels in bull markets or 20% and 60% in bear markets. Use the 5% rule. Draw each line at a level beyond which RSI has spent less than 5% of its time in the past 4 to 6 months. Adjust reference lines once every 3 months. Mass Psychology Each price represents the consensus of value of all market participants at the moment of transaction. The closing price reflects the most important consensus of the 27 Relative Strength Index 101 day because the settlement of traders accounts depends on it. When the market closes higher, bulls make money and bears lose. When the market closes lower, bears make money and bulls lose. Traders pay more attention to closing prices than to any other prices of the day. In the futures markets, money is transferred from losers to winners accounts at the end of each trading day. RSI shows whether bulls or bears are stronger at closing time the crucial money counting time in the market. Trading Rules RSI gives three types of trading signals. They are, in order of importance, divergences, chart patterns, and the level of RSI. Bullish and bearish divergences Divergences between RSI and prices tend to occur at important tops and bottoms. They show when the trend is weak and ready to reverse. One bullish divergences give buy signals. They occur when prices fall to a new low but RSI makes a higher bottom than during its previous decline. Buy as soon as RSI turns up from its second bottom, and place a protective stop below the latest minor price low. Buy signals are especially strong if the first RSI bottom is below its lower reference line and the second bottom is above that line. Two bearish divergences give sell signals. They occur when prices rally to a new peak but RSI makes a lower top than during its previous rally. Sell short as soon as RSI turns down from its second top, and place a protective stop above the latest minor high. Sell signals are especially strong if the first RSI top is above its upper reference line and the second top is below it. Charting Patterns RSI often breaks through support or resistance a few days ahead of prices, providing hints of likely trend changes. RSI trend lines are usually broken one or two days before price trend changes. 1. When RSI breaks above its downtrend line, place an order to buy above the latest price peak to catch an upside breakout. 2. When RSI breaks below its uptrend line, Place an order to sell short below the latest price low to catch a downside breakout. RSI Levels When RSI rises above its upper reference line, it shows that bulls are strong but the market is overbought and entering its sell zone. When RSI declines below its lower reference line, 
it shows that bears are strong but the market is oversold and entering its buy zone. 102. Computerized Technical Analysis It pays to buy using overbought signals of daily RSI only when the weekly trend is up. It pays to sell short using sell signals of daily RSI only when the weekly trend is down. 1. Buy when RSI declines below its lower reference line and then rallies above it. 2. Sell short when RSI rises above its upper reference line and then crosses below it. When we analyze markets, we deal with only a few numbers the opening, high, low, and closing prices for each bar, plus volume, and also open interest for derivatives, such as futures and options. A typical beginner error is shopping for indicators. A trader may feel bullish about the stock market, but then he notices that the moving averages of the Dow and the S&P are still declining. Their bearish message doesn't sit well with him, he starts scrolling through his software menu and finds several oscillators, such as stochastic or RSI. Sure enough, they look oversold, which is normal in a downtrend. The eager beginner takes those oversold readings as a signal to buy. The downtrend continues, he loses money and then complains that technical analysis didn't work. It is much better to use only a small number of indicators with a strict hierarchy for their analysis, including multiple time frames. We'll return to this essential topic in the chapter on the triple screen trading system. PART5 PART5 Volume and Time Many traders focus exclusively on price quotes, but while those are extremely important, there's more to the market than price. Volume of transactions provides a valuable additional dimension. Joseph Granville, a pioneer of volume studies, was fond of saying volume is the steam that makes the choo-choo go. Another hugely important factor of market analysis is time. Markets live and move in different time frames at the same time. No matter how carefully you analyze the daily chart, its trend can be upended by a move that erupts from another time frame. In this section we'll focus on volume and volume based indicators. We'll also look into tying all market decisions to their time frames. 28 Volume Volume reflects the activity of traders and investors. Each unit of volume represents actions of two individuals, one sells a share or a contract and another buys that share or a contract. Daily volume is the number of shares or contracts traded in one day. Traders usually plot volume as a histogram vertical bars whose height reflects each day's volume. They usually draw it underneath prices. Changes in volume show how bulls and bears react to price swings and provide clues to whether trends are likely to continue or to reverse. Some traders ignore volume. They think that prices already reflect all information known to the market. They say, you get paid on price and not on volume. 103. 104. Volume and time. A. B. E. C. D. Figure 28.1 bid daily, 22 day Emma, volume. Volume. Sotheby's Holdings Inc. is the world's biggest publicly traded auction house. It provides a window into what the world's big money is doing in terms of their conspicuous consumption. This company's business was buoyed in 2013 by the influx of new money from Asia, but the stock hit its head on the ceiling during that year's last quarter. In areas A and B, volume increased during the rally, confirming the uptrend and calling for higher prices ahead. In area C and D, volume flashed warning signs for the bulls it shrank during each rally attempt. Notice false upside breakouts in those areas and an atypical form of a kangaroo tail in area C rising volume near the right edge confirms the power of bears. Professionals, on the other hand, know that analyzing volume can help them understand markets deeper and trade better. Volume depends on the size of the trading crowd and the activity levels of buyers and sellers. If you compare volumes of two markets, 
you'll see which is more active or liquid. You are likely to receive better fills and suffer less slippage in liquid markets than in thin, low volume markets. There are three ways to measure volume. 1. The actual number of shares or contracts traded. For example, the New York Stock Exchange reports volume this way. This is the most objective way of measuring volume. 2. The number of trades that took place. Some international exchanges report volume this way. This method is less objective because it doesn't distinguish between a 100 share trade and a 5000 share trade. 3. Tick volume is the number of price changes during a selected period of time, such as 10 minutes or an hour. It is called tick volume because most changes equal one tick. Some exchanges don't report intraday volume, forcing day traders to use tick volume as a proxy for real volume. 105. A note to Forex traders, since that market is decentralized and reports no volume, you can use the volume of currency futures as its proxy. Futures of all major currencies, measured against the US dollar, are traded in Chicago and on the electronic exchanges. We can assume that their volume trends are reasonably similar to those in the forex markets, since both respond to the same market forces. Crowd psychology. Volume reflects the degree of financial and emotional involvement, as well as pain, among market participants. A trade begins with a financial commitment by two persons. The decision to buy or sell may be rational, but the act of buying or selling creates an emotional commitment in most people. Buyers and sellers crave to be right. They scream at the market, pray, or use lucky talismans. The level of volume reflects the degree of emotional involvement among traders. Each tick takes money away from losers and gives it to winners. When prices rise, longs make money and shorts lose. When prices fall, shorts gain and longs lose. Winners feel happy and elated, while losers feel depressed and angry. Whenever prices move, about half of the traders are hurting. When prices rise, bears are in pain, and when prices fall, bulls suffer. The greater the volume, the more pain in the market. Traders react to losses like frogs to hot water. If you throw a frog into a hot pail, it'll jump in response to sudden pain, but if you put a frog into cool water and heat it slowly, you can boil it alive. If a sudden price change hits traders, they jump from pain and liquidate losing positions. On the other hand, losers can be very patient if their losses increase gradually. You can lose a great deal of money in a sleepy stock or a future, such as corn, where a one cent move costs only $50 per contract. If corn goes against you just a few cents a day, that pain is easy to tolerate. If you hang on, those pennies can add up to thousands of dollars in losses. Sharp moves, on the other hand, make losing traders cut their losses in a panic. Once weak hands get shaken out, leaving behind a volume spike, the market is ready to reverse. Trends can persist for a long time on moderate volume but can expire after a burst of volume. Who buys from a trader who is selling his losing long position? It may be a short seller who wants to cover and take profits. It may be a bargain hunter who steps in because prices are too low. A bottom picker takes over the position of a loser who washed out he either catches the bottom or becomes the next loser. Who sells to a trader who buys to cover his losing short position? It may be a savvy investor who takes profits on his long position. It also may be a top picker who sells short because he thinks that prices are too high. He assumes the position of a loser who covered his shorts, and only the future will tell whether he is right or wrong. When shorts give up during a rally, they buy to cover and push the market higher. Prices rise, flush out even more shorts, and the rally feeds on itself. When longs give up during a decline, they sell, pushing the market lower. Falling prices flush out even more longs, and the decline feeds on itself. Losers who give up on their trades propel. 106. Volume and Time. 
Trends A trend that moves on steady volume is likely to persist. It shows that new losers are replacing those who washed out. When volume falls, it shows that the supply of losers is running low and a trend is ready to reverse. It happens after enough losers catch on to how wrong they are. Old losers keep bailing out, but fewer new ones come in. Falling volume is a sign that the trend is about to reverse. A burst of extremely high volume also gives a signal that a trend is nearing its end. It shows that masses of losers are bailing out. You can probably recall holding a losing trade longer than you should have. Once the pain became intolerable and you got out, the trend reversed and the market went the way you expected, only without you. This happens time and again because most humans react to stress similarly and bail out at roughly the same time. Professionals don't hang on while the market beats them up. They quickly close out losing trades and reverse or wait on the sidelines, ready to re-enter. Volume spikes are more likely to signal an imminent reversal of a downtrend than an uptrend. Volume spikes in downtrends reflect explosions of fear. Fear is a powerful but short-term emotion people run fast, dump shares, and then the trend is likely to reverse. Volume spikes in uptrends are driven by greed, which is a slower-moving, happy emotion. There may be a slight pause in an uptrend after a volume spike, but then the trend is quite likely to resume. Volume usually stays relatively low in trading ranges because there is relatively little pain. People feel comfortable with small price changes, and flat markets can drag on a long time. A breakout is often marked by a dramatic increase in volume because losers run for the exits. A breakout on low volume shows little emotional commitment to a new trend. It indicates that prices are likely to return into their trading range. Rising volume during a rally shows that more buyers and short sellers are pouring in. Buyers are eager to buy even if they have to pay up, and shorts are eager to sell to them. Rising volume shows that losers who leave are being replaced by a new crop of losers. When volume shrinks during a rally, it shows that bulls are becoming less eager, while bears are no longer running for cover. The intelligent bears have left long ago, followed by weak bears who could not take the pain. Falling volume shows that fuel is being removed from the uptrend and it's ready to reverse. When volume dries up during a decline, it shows that bears are less eager to sell short, while bulls are no longer running for the exits. The intelligent bulls have sold long ago, and the weak bulls have been shaken out. Falling volume shows that the remaining bulls have greater pain tolerance. Perhaps they have deeper pockets or bought later in the decline, or both. Falling volume identifies an area in which a downtrend is likely to reverse. This reasoning applies to all time frames. As a rule of thumb, if today's volume is higher than yesterday's, then today's trend is likely to continue. Trading pointers The terms high volume and low volume are relative. What's low for Amazon may be very high for a less popular stock, while what's low for gold is high for platinum. 29 volume based indicators 107 and so on we compare volumes of different stocks futures or options only when selecting higher volume trading vehicles most of the time we compare current trading volume of a stock to its average volume as a rule of thumb high volume for any given market is at least 25 percent above its average for the past two weeks while low volume is at least 25% below average. One high volume confirms trends. If prices rise to a new peak and volume reaches a new high, then prices are likely to retest or exceed that peak. Two if the market falls to a new low and the volume reaches a new high, that bottom is likely to be retested or exceeded. A very high volume climax bottom is almost always retested on low volume, offering an excellent buying opportunity. 3. If volume shrinks while a trend continues, that trend is ripe for a reversal. When a market rises to a new peak on lower volume than its previous peak, look to take profits on a long position and slash or for a shorting opportunity. 
This technique does not work as well in downtrends because a decline can persist on low volume. There is a saying on Wall Street, it takes buying to put prices up, but they can fall of their own weight. 4. Watch volume during reactions against the trend. When an uptrend is punctuated by a decline, volume often picks up in a flurry of profit taking. When that dip continues but volume shrinks, it shows that bulls are no longer running or that selling pressure is spent. When volume dries up, it shows that the reaction is nearing its end and the uptrend is ready to resume. This identifies a good buying opportunity. Major downtrends are often punctuated by rallies that begin on heavy volume. Once weak bears have been flushed out, volume shrinks and gives a signal to sell short. 29 Volume Based Indicators Several indicators help clarify volume's trading signals. For example, a 5-day EMA of volume can identify volume's trends. A rising EMA of volume affirms the current price trend, while a declining one points to the price trend's weakness. This and other volume-based indicators provide more precise timing signals than volume bars. They include on-balance volume and accumulation slash distribution, described below. Force Index combines price and volume data to help identify areas where prices are likely to reverse. On-balance volume On-balance volume is an indicator designed by Joseph Granville and described in his book, New Strategy of Daily Stock Market Timing. Granville used OBV as a leading indicator of the stock market, but other analysts applied it to futures. OBV is a running total of volume. Each day's volume is added or subtracted, depending on whether prices close higher or lower than on the previous day. When a 108 Volume and Time Stock closes higher, it shows that bulls won the day's battle, that day's volume is added to OBV. When a stock closes lower, it shows that bears won the day, and that day's volume is subtracted from OBV. If price is close unchanged, OBV stays unchanged. On balance volume often rises or falls before prices, acting as a leading indicator. Crowd psychology Prices represent the consensus of value, but volume represents the emotions of market participants. It reflects the intensity of traders' financial and emotional commitments, as well as pain among losers, which is what OBV helps to track. A new high of OBV shows that bulls are powerful, bears are hurting, and prices are likely to rise. A new low of OBV shows that bears are powerful, bulls are hurting, and prices are likely to fall. When the pattern of OBV deviates from the pattern of prices, it shows that mass emotions aren't in gear with mass consensus. A crowd is more likely to follow its gut than its mind, and that's why changes in volume often precede price changes. Trading Signals The patterns of OBV tops and bottoms are much more important than the absolute levels, which depend on the starting date of your calculations. It is safer to trade in the direction of a trend that is confirmed by OBV. 1. When OBV reaches a new high, it confirms the power of bulls, indicates that prices are likely to continue to rise, and gives a buy signal. When OBV falls below its previous low, it confirms the power of bears, calls for lower prices ahead, and gives a signal to sell short. 2. OBV gives its strongest buy and sell signals when it diverges from prices. If prices rally, sell off, and then rise to a new high, but OBV rallies to a lower high, it creates a bearish divergence and gives a sell signal. If prices decline, rebound, and then fall to a new low, but OBV falls to a more shallow bottom, it traces a bullish divergence and gives a buy signal. Long-term divergences are more important than the short-term ones. Divergences that develop over the course of several weeks give stronger signals than those created over a few days. 3. When prices are in a trading range and OBV breaks out to a new high, it gives a buy signal. When prices are in a trading range and OBV breaks down and falls to a new low, it gives a signal to sell short. More on OBV 
One of the reasons for Granville's success in stock market timing was that he combined OBV with two other indicators the net field trend indicator and the climax indicator. Granville calculated OBV for each stock in the Dow Jones Industrial Average and rated its OBV pattern as rising, falling, or neutral. He called 29 volume-based indicators 109 B D Close Extreme A C Figure 29.1 MCD daily, 22 day EMA, on balance volume. On balance volume. McDonald's Corp is a stable, slow moving stock. You can see a fairly tight trading range, marked with dashed lines. Notice the tendency of MCD towards false breakouts. Notice a kangaroo tail in area A. At the right edge of the chart, the stock market is in a free fall, but while MCD trades near its recent lows, its OBV indicator is trading near the highs. It points to strength and suggests buying rather than selling. That a net field trend of a stock, it could be plus 1, 1, or 0 climax indicator was a sum of the net field trends of all 30 Dow stocks. When the stock market rallied and the climax indicator reached a new high, it confirmed strength and gave a buy signal. If the stock market rallied but the climax indicator made a lower top, it gave a sell signal. You can look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average as a team of 30 horses pulling the market wagon. The climax indicator shows how many horses are pulling uphill, downhill, or standing still. If 24 out of 30 horses pull up, 1 down and 5 are resting, then the market wagon is likely to move up. If 9 horses pull up, 7 pull down, and 14 are resting, that wagon may soon roll downhill. Remarkably, Granville did his calculations by hand. Now, of course, OBV, the net field trend indicator, and the climax indicator can be easily programmed. It would be. I visited Granville in 2005 in Kansas City. Not only did he do all his calculations by hand, he avoided going online, as he was suspicious of pervasive snooping and that was years before the disclosures of government spying. He disconnected his computer from the internet until it was time to send out his newsletter. Granville monitored intraday prices by tuning his TV into CNBC with the sound turned off and a towel draped over the upper portion of the screen, so that all he could see was the tape running along the bottom of his screen. 110. Volume and time. Worthwhile to apply them to a database that includes all stocks of the S&P 500 index. This method may produce good signals for trading the S&P 500 futures and options. Accumulation slash distribution. This indicator was developed by Larry Williams and described in his 1973 book, How I Made One Million Dollars. It was designed as a leading indicator for stocks, but several analysts applied it to futures. The unique feature of accumulation slash distribution is that it tracks the relationship between opening and closing prices, in addition to volume. Its concept is similar to that of Japanese candlesticks, which at the time Williams wrote his book weren't known to Western traders. Accumulation slash distribution is more finely calibrated than OBV because it credits bulls or bears with only a fraction of each day's volume, proportionate to the degree of their win for the day. A slash D equals close open high low volume. If prices close higher than they opened, then bulls won the day, and A slash D is positive. If prices close lower than they opened, then the bears won, and A slash D is negative. If prices close where they opened, then nobody won, and A slash D is zero. A running total of each day's A slash D creates a cumulative A slash D indicator. For example, if today's high-low spread was 5 points but the distance from the open to the close was 2 points, then only two-fifths of today's volume is credited to the winning camp. Just as with OBV, 
the pattern of A slash D highs and lows is important, while its absolute level simply depends on the starting date. When the market rises, most people focus on new highs, but if prices open higher and close lower, then A slash D, which tracks their relationship, turns down. It warns that the uptrend is weaker than it appears. If, on the other hand, A slash D ticks up while prices are down, it shows that bulls are gaining strength. Crowd behavior Opening prices reflect pressures that have built up while the market was closed. Openings tend to be dominated by amateurs who read their news in the evening and trade in the morning. Professional traders are active throughout the day. They often trade against the amateurs. As the day goes on, waves of buying and selling by amateurs as well as slow-moving institutions gradually subside. Professionals tend to dominate the markets at closing time. Closing prices are especially important because the settlement of trading accounts depends on them. A slash D tracks the outcomes of daily battles between amateurs and professionals. It ticks up when prices close higher than they opened when professionals are more bullish than amateurs. It ticks down when prices close lower than they opened when professionals are more bearish than amateurs. It pays to bet with the professionals and against the amateurs. 29 volume based indicators 111 trading rules when the market opens low and closes high it moves from weakness to strength that's when a slash d rises and signals that market professionals are more bullish than amateurs and the up move is likely to continue when a slash d falls it shows that market professionals are more bearish than amateurs when the market weakens during the day, it's likely to reach a lower low in the days to come. The best trading signals are given by divergences between A slash D and prices. 1. If prices rally to a new high but A slash D reaches a lower peak, it gives a signal to sell short. This bearish divergence shows that market professionals are selling into the rally. 2. A bullish divergence occurs when prices fall to a new low but A slash D bottoms out at a higher low than during its previous decline. It shows that market professionals are using the decline for buying, and a rally is coming. A. B. Figure 29.2 Goog Daily, Accumulation Slash Distribution Index. Accumulation Slash Distribution. Coming events cast their shadows before is an old proverb with a lot of meaning for technical analysts. Google Inc. was trending lower for months, but the uptrend of the accumulation slash distribution index showed that big money was buying. The stock has fallen lower at point B than at A, but the A slash D index traced out a much higher bottom. Just as important, it broke out to a new high before prices gapped up following a surprisingly good earnings announcement. Somebody knew what was coming, and their massive buying was identified by the A-slash-D accumulation pattern and its upside breakout. Technical analysis helps even out the imbalance of knowledge between outsiders and insiders. 112. Volume and Time More on accumulation slash distribution. When you go long or short, following a divergence between A slash D and price, remember that even market professionals can go wrong. Use stops and protect yourself by following the hound of the Baskervilles rule. There are important parallels between A slash D and Japanese candlestick charts, since both focus on the differences between opening and closing prices. A slash D goes further than candlesticks by taking volume into account. 30 Force Index Force Index is an oscillator developed by this author. It combines volume with prices to discover the force of bulls or bears behind every rally or decline. Force Index can be applied to any price bar for which we have volume data, weekly, daily, or intraday. It brings together three essential pieces of information the direction of price change, its extent, and the volume during that change. It provides a practical way of using volume for making trading decisions. Force index can be used in its raw form, 
but its signals stand out much more clearly if we smooth it with a moving average. Using a short EMA of force index helps pinpoint entry and exit points. Using a longer EMA helps confirm trends and recognize important reversals. How to construct force index The force of every move is defined by three factors, direction, distance, and volume. 1. If prices close higher than the close of the previous bar, the force is positive. If prices close lower than the close of the previous bar, the force is negative. 2. The greater the change in price, the greater the force. 3. The bigger the volume, the greater the force. Force index equals volume. Close, close today. Yesterday. A raw force index can be plotted as a histogram, with a horizontal center line at a zero level. If the market closes higher, force index is positive and rises above the center line. If the market closes lower, force index is negative and extends below the center line. If the market closes unchanged, force index is zero. The histogram of a raw force index is very jagged. This indicator gives much better trading signals after being smoothed with a moving average. Remember, we're talking about the force of market crowds, not the formula in physics. 113. A two-day EMA of force index provides a minimal degree of smoothing. It is useful for finding entry points into the markets. It pays to buy when the two-day EMA is negative and sell when it's positive, as long as you trade in the direction of the trend. A 13-day EMA of force index tracks longer-term changes in the force of bulls and bears. When the 13-day EMA crosses above the center line, it shows that bulls are in control and suggests trading from the long side. When the 13-day EMA turns negative, it shows that bears are in control and suggests trading from the short side. Divergences between a 13-day EMA of force index and prices identify important turning points. Trading Psychology When the market closes higher, it shows that bulls won the day's battle, and when it closes lower, it shows that bears carried the day. The distance between today's and yesterday's closing prices reflects the margin of victory by bulls or bears. The greater this distance, the larger the victory achieved. Volume reflects the degree of emotional commitment by market participants. High volume rallies and declines have more inertia and are more likely to continue. Prices moving at high volume are like an avalanche that gathers speed as it rolls. Low volume, on the other hand, shows that the supply of losers is thin, and a trend is probably nearing an end. Prices reflect what market participants think, while volume reflects the strength of their feelings. Force index combines price and volume it shows whether the head and the heart of the market are in gear with each other. When force index rallies to a new high, it shows that the force of bulls is high and the uptrend is likely to continue. When force index falls to a new low, it shows that the force of bears is intense and the downtrend is likely to persist. If the change in prices is not confirmed by volume, force index flattens and warns that a trend is about to reverse. It also flattens and warns of a nearing reversal if high volume generates only a small price move. Trading Rules Short-Term Force Index A two-day EMA of force index is a highly sensitive indicator of the short-term force of bulls and bears. When it swings above its center line, it shows that bulls are stronger, and when it falls below the center line, it shows that bears are stronger. Since the two-day EMA of force index is a sensitive tool, we can use it to fine-tune signals of other indicators. When a trend-following indicator identifies an uptrend, the declines of the two-day EMA of force index below zero pinpoint the best buying. 114. Volume and Time Points, Buying Pullbacks During a Long-Term Rally When a trend-following tool identifies a downtrend, Rallies of a two-day EMA of force index mark the best shorting areas. One by when a two-day EMA of force index turns negative during uptrends. 
even a fast and furious uptrend has occasional pullbacks. If you delay buying until the two-day EMA of force index turns negative, you'll buy closer to a short-term bottom. Most people chase rallies and then get hit by drawdowns they find hard to tolerate. Force index helps find buying opportunities with lower risks. When a two-day EMA of force index turns negative during an uptrend, place a buy order above the high price of that day. When the uptrend resumes and prices rally, you'll be stopped in on the long side. If prices continue to decline, your weekly trend is up, weekly trend is up, weekly trend is up. Figure 30.1 ADBE daily, 26 day EMA, 2 day force index. Short term force index. Later in this book we'll return to the all important topic of using multiple time frames to make trading decisions. For example, you may make your strategic decision to be a bull or a bear on a weekly chart and then make your tactical decisions on where to buy or sell short using a daily chart. In the case of Adobe Systems Incorporated, there is a steady uptrend on the weekly chart, confirmed by its rising EMA. When the weekly trend is up, a two-day force index on the daily chart provides an ongoing series of signals that identify buy points. Instead of chasing strength and buying high, it's better to buy during short-term pullbacks, when a wave goes against the tide. Those waves are marked by the two-day force index dropping below zero. Once the two-day force index goes negative, it makes sense to start placing buy orders above the latest bar's high. This will ensure you'll be stopped into a long trade as soon as the down wave loses its power. 115. Order will not be executed. Keep lowering your buy order to near the high of the latest bar. Once your buy stop is triggered, place a protective stop below the latest minor low. This tight stop is seldom touched in a strong uptrend, but it'll get you out early if the trend is weak. To sell short when a two-day EMA of force index turns positive in a downtrend. When trend following indicators identify a downtrend, wait until the two-day EMA of force index turns positive. It reflects a quick splash of bullishness a shorting opportunity. Place an order to sell short below the low of the latest price bar. If the two-day EMA of force index continues to rally after you place your sell order, raise your order the next day to near the previous bar's low. Once prices slide and you enter a short trade, place a protective stop above the latest minor peak. Move your stop down to a break-even level as early as possible. Additionally, a two-day EMA of force index helps decide when to pyramid positions. You can add to longs in uptrends each time force index turns negative, you can add to shorts in downtrends whenever force index turns positive. Force index even provides a glimpse into the future. When a two-day EMA of force index falls to its lowest low in a month, it shows that bears are strong and prices are likely to fall even lower. When a two-day EMA of force index rallies to its highest level in a month, it shows that bulls are strong and prices are likely to rise even higher. A two-day EMA of force index helps decide when to close out a position. It does it by identifying short-term splashes of mass bullishness or bearishness. A short-term trader who bought when this indicator was negative can sell when it turns positive. A short-term trader who went short when this indicator was positive can cover when it turns negative. A longer-term trader should get out of his position only if a trend changes or if there is a divergence between the two-day EMA of force index and the trend. Three bullish divergences between the two-day EMA of force index and price give strong buy signals. A bullish divergence occurs when prices fall to a new low while force index makes a more shallow low. Four bearish divergences between the two-day EMA of force index and price give strong sell signals. A bearish divergence occurs when prices rally to a new high while force index traces a lower second top. 5. Whenever the 2-day EMA of force index spikes down to 5 times or more its usual depth and then recoils from that low, expect prices to rally in the coming days. Markets fluctuate between overbought and oversold, and when they recoil from a down spike, we can expect a rally. 
Note that this signal doesn't work well in uptrends markets recoil from down spikes but not from up spikes. Spikes that 116 Volume and time Point down reflect intense fear, which doesn't persist for very long. Spikes that point up reflect excessive enthusiasm and greed, which can persist for quite a long time. A two-day EMA of force index fits well into the triple screen trading system. Its ability to find short-term buying and selling points is especially useful when you combine force index with a longer-term trend following indicator. Intermediate term force index a 13-day EMA of force index identifies longer-term changes in the balance of power between bulls and bears. When it rises above zero, the bulls are stronger, and when. Figure 30.2 SSYS daily, 26-day EMA, 13-day force index. Long-term force index. Strategies. Inc. is one of the two leading companies in the rapidly emerging additive manufacturing market. In the two years since I wrote the world's first popular ebook on investing in this technology, AM stocks have become investors' favorites. A technical pattern has emerged, with rallies driven by amateurs piling in and sharp declines as they panic and bail out. The 13 day force index does a good job of catching those waves. When the 13 day force index crosses above its zero line, it shows that buying volume is coming in. That's where a longer-term trader buys and holds. When the 13-day force declines below its zero line and stays there, it shows that bears predominate. Near the right edge of the screen, we see a record low of force index, but then bears begin to weaken, as force index starts inching towards zero. Keep your powder dry as you wait for an accumulation pattern to emerge and be confirmed by force index crossing above zero. This seesaw movement of stocks passing from strong hands into weak ones near the tops and back again near the lows goes on forever. Force index can help you position yourself with the right group. 31 Open Interest 117 It falls below zero, the bears are in charge. Its divergences from prices identify intermediate and even major turning points. Its spikes especially near the bottoms, mark approaching trend reversals. The raw force index identifies the winning team in the battle between bulls and bears in any price bar, be it weekly, daily, or intraday. We get much clearer signals by smoothing the raw force index with a moving average. 1. When a 13-day EMA of force index is above the center line, bulls are in control of the market. When it is below the center line, bears are in charge. When a rally begins, prices often jump on heavy volume. When a 13-day EMA of force index reaches a new high, it confirms the uptrend. As an uptrend grows older, prices tend to rise more slowly, and volume becomes thinner. That's when a 13-day EMA of force index starts tracing lower tops. When it drops below its zero line, it signals that the back of the bull has been broken. To a new peak of the 13-day EMA of force index shows that bulls are very strong and a rally is likely to continue. A bearish divergence between a 13-day EMA of force index and price gives a strong signal to sell short. If prices reach a new high but this indicator traces a lower peak, it warns that bulls are losing power and bears are ready to take control. Note that for a divergence to be legitimate, this indicator must make a new peak, then fall below its zero line, and then rise above that line again, but tracing a lower peak, which creates a divergence. If there is no crossover, then there is no legitimate divergence. 3. A new low in the 13-day EMA of force index shows that a downtrend is likely to continue. If prices fall to a new low but this indicator rallies above zero and then falls again, but to a more shallow low, it completes a bullish divergence. It reveals that bears are losing power and gives a buy signal. When a downtrend begins, prices usually drop on heavy volume. When a 13-day EMA of force index falls to a new low, it confirms the decline. As the downtrend grows old, 
prices fall more slowly or volume dries up that's when a reversal is in the cards. Adding an envelope to the chart of force index can help you detect its extreme deviations from the norm, which tend to lead to price trend reversals. This method for catching deviations and potential reversals works well with weekly charts, but not with the daily and intraday charts. This is truly a longer term tool. 31 Open Interest Open interest is the number of contracts held by buyers or owed by short sellers in any derivative market, such as futures or options. If you are unfamiliar with futures or options, Skip this chapter and return to it after you have read chapters 44 on options and 46 on futures. 118. Volume and Time Stock market shares are traded for as long as the company that listed them stays in business as an independent unit. Most shares are held as long positions, with only a small percentage of shorts. In futures and options, on the other hand, the total size of long and short positions is always identical, due to the fact that they are contracts for future delivery. When someone wants to buy a contract, someone else has to sell it to them, i.e., go short. If you want to buy a call option for 100 shares of Google, another trader has to sell you that option, in order for you to be long, someone else has to be short. Open interest equals the total long or the total short positions. Futures and options contracts are designed to last for only a set period of time. A futures or options buyer who wants to accept delivery and a seller who wants to deliver have to wait until the first delivery day. This waiting period ensures that the numbers of contracts held long and short are always equal. In any case, very few futures and options traders plan to deliver or accept delivery. Most traders close out their positions early, settling in cash long before the first notice day. We'll return to the topic of futures and options in part 8 of this book on trading vehicles. Open interest rises when new positions are being created and falls when positions are being closed. For example, if open interest in April COMEX gold futures is 20,000 contracts, it means that bulls are long and bears short 20,000 contracts. If open interest rises to 20,200, it means that the net of 200 new contracts have been created, both bought and sold short. Open interest falls when a bull who is long sells to a bear who is short but wants to cover his short position. As both of them get out, Open interest falls by the size of their trade, since one or more contracts disappear from that market. If a new bull buys from an old bull that is getting out of his long position, open interest remains unchanged. Nor does the open interest change when a new bear sells to an old bear who wants to buy to cover his short position. In summary, open interest rises when fresh blood enters that market and falls as current bulls and bears start leaving that market as illustrated in the table below. Buyer Seller Open interest new buyer New seller Increases new buyer Former buyer sells unchanged former seller buys to cover new seller Unchanged former seller buys to cover former buyer sells decreases Technicians usually plot open interest as a line below price bars Open interest in any market varies from season to season because of massive hedging by industrial users and producers at different stages of the annual production cycle. Open interest gives important messages when it deviates from its seasonal norm. Crowd psychology It takes one bull and one bear to create a futures or options contract. A bull who believes that prices will rise buys a contract. A bear who thinks that prices are going to drop goes short by selling a contract for future delivery. With a trade between a 31 open interest 119 A B C D Figure 31.1 TYH 14 daily, 13 day EMA, open interest Open interest Open interest reflects the number of all short or long positions in any futures or options market. 
Since the two are equal in the derivatives markets, OI reflects the degree of conviction among bulls and bears. Rising OI shows that the conflict between bulls and bears is becoming more intense and confirms the exiting trend. Falling OI, on the other hand, shows that losers are leaving the market, while the winners are cashing in at signals that the trend is nearing its end. Near the left edge of this chart of March 2014 Treasury Notes Futures, the trend is down, but the declining OI warns bears not to overstay the downtrend. OI bottomed out in Area A, T notes in Area B, and in Area C, both were in clear uptrends, with rising OI calling for higher prices ahead. OI topped out in Area D, and while prices continue to rise in Area E, the new downtrend of OI serves up a warning to the bulls near the right edge of the chart. Not all charts of open interest look as smooth and clear as this one. Serious traders don't expect to find a magic tool of a single indicator they use several indicators and act only when their messages confirm one another. New bull and a new bear, open interest rises by the number of contracts they traded. A single trade is unlikely to move any market, but when thousands of traders make similar trades, they propel or reverse market trends. Open interest reflects the intensity of conflict between bulls and bears. It depends on their willingness to maintain long and short positions. When bulls and bears don't expect the market to move in their favor, they close out their positions, reducing open interest. There are two people on the opposite sides of every trade, and one of them will be hurt when prices change. In a rally, bears will get hurt, and in a decline, bulls will suffer. As long as the losers hold on, hoping and hanging on to their positions, open interest doesn't change. A rise in open interest shows that a crowd of confident bulls is facing down a crowd of equally confident bears. It points to a growing disagreement between the 120 Volume and Time Two Camps One group is sure to lose, but as long as potential losers keep pouring in, the trend will continue. These ideas have been clearly put forth in L.D. Belleville's classic book, Charting Commodity Market Price Behavior. It takes conviction among both bulls and bears to maintain a trend. Rising open interest shows that both camps keep adding to their positions. If they strongly disagree about the future course of prices, then the supply of losers is growing, and the current trend is likely to persist. An increase in open interest gives a green light to the existing trend. If open interest rises during an uptrend, it shows that longs are buying while bears are shorting because they believe that the market is overvalued. They are likely to run for cover when the uptrend squeezes them harder and their buying will propel prices higher. If open interest rises during a downtrend, it shows that shorts are aggressively selling, while bottom pickers are buying. Those bargain hunters are likely to bail out when falling prices hurt them, and their selling will push prices even lower. When a bull is convinced that prices are going higher and decides to buy, but a bear is afraid to sell short, that bull can buy only from another bull who bought earlier and now wants to cash out. Their trade creates no new contract, and open interest stays unchanged. When open interest goes flat during a rally, it shows that the supply of losers has stopped growing. When a bear is convinced that prices are going lower and wants to sell short, but a bull is afraid to buy from him, that bear can sell only to another bear who shorted earlier and now wants to cover, take profits and leave. Their trade creates no new contract, and open interest does not change. When open interest stays flat during a decline, it shows that the supply of bottom pickers isn't growing. Whenever open interest flattens out, it flashes a yellow light a warning that the trend is aging and the best gains are probably behind. When a bull decides to get out of his long position, a bear decides to cover his short position, and the two trade with one another, a contract disappears, and open interest shrinks. Falling open interest shows that losers are bailing out, while winners are taking profits. When the disagreement between bulls and bears decreases, the trend is ripe for a reversal. 
Falling open interest shows that winners are cashing in and losers are giving up hope. It signals that the trend is approaching its end. Trading Rules 1. When open interest rises during a rally, it confirms the uptrend and gives a green light to add to long positions. It shows that more short sellers are coming into the market. When they bail out, their short covering is likely to push the rally higher. When open interest rises as prices fall, it shows that bottom pickers are active in the market. It gives a green light to shorting because those bargain hunters are likely to push prices lower when they throw in the towel. If open interest rises when prices are in a trading range, it's a bearish sign. Commercial hedgers are much more likely to sell short than speculators. A sharp 121 Increase in open interest while prices are flat shows that savvy hedgers are probably shorting the market. You want to avoid trading against those who likely have better information than you. 2. If open interest falls while prices are in a trading range, it identifies short covering by major commercial interests and gives a buy signal. When commercials start covering shorts, they show that they expect the market to rise. When open interest falls during a rally, it shows that winners and losers alike are becoming cautious. Longs are taking profits, and shorts are covering. Markets discount the future, and a trend that is accepted by the majority is ready to reverse. If open interest falls during a rally, consider selling and getting out. When open interest falls during a decline, it shows that shorts are covering and buyers are taking losses and bailing out. If open interest falls while prices slide, take profits on short positions. 3. When open interest goes flat during a rally, it shows that the uptrend is getting old and the best gains have already been made. This gives you a signal to tighten stops on long positions and avoid new buying. When open interest goes flat during a decline, it warns you that the downtrend is mature and it is best to tighten stops on short positions. Flat open interest in a trading range does not contribute any new information. More on open interest The higher the open interest, the more active the market, and the less slippage you risk when getting in and out of positions. Short-term traders should focus on the contracts with the highest open interest. In the futures markets, the highest open interest tends to be in the front months. As the first notice day approaches and open interest of the front month begins to drop, while open interest in the next month begins to rise, it signals to roll over your position into the next month. 32 Time Most people conduct their lives as if they will live forever repeating the same mistakes, not learning from the past, and hardly ever planning for the future. Freud showed that the unconscious mind doesn't have the notion of time. Our deep-seated wishes remain largely unchanged throughout our lives. When people join crowds, their behavior becomes even more primitive and impulsive. Individuals may be ruled by the calendar and the clock, but crowds pay no attention to time. They act out their emotions as if they had all the time in the world. Most traders focus only on changing prices but pay little attention to time. That's just another sign of being caught up in mass mentality. The awareness of time is a sign of civilization. A thinking person is aware of time, while someone who is acting impulsively is not. A market analyst who pays attention to time becomes aware of a dimension hidden from the market crowd. 122. Volume and Time. Cycles. Long-term price cycles are a fact of economic life. For example, the U.S. stock market tends to run in approximately four-year cycles. They exist because the ruling party inflates the economy going into the presidential election every four years. The party that wins the election deflates the economy when voters can't take revenge at the polls. Flooding the economy with liquidity lifts the stock market, while draining liquidity pushes it down. Major cycles in agricultural commodities are due to weather and fundamental production factors, coupled with the mass psychology of producers. For example, when livestock prices rise, farmers breed more animals. 
When those animals reach the market, prices fall and producers cut back. When the supply is absorbed, scarcity pushes prices up, breeders go to work again, and the bull slash bear cycle repeats. This cycle is shorter in hogs than in cattle because pigs breed faster than cows. Long term cycles can help traders identify market tides. Instead, many traders get themselves in trouble by trying to use short term cycles to predict minor turning points. Price peaks and valleys often seem to flow in an orderly manner. Traders measure distances between neighboring peaks and project them into the future to forecast the next top dot then they measure distances between bottoms and extend them into the future to forecast the next low. Cycles put bread and butter on the tables of analysts who sell forecasts. Few of them realize that what appears like a cycle on the charts is often a figment of the imagination. If you analyze price data using a mathematically rigorous program, such as John Ellers's Mesa, you'll find that approximately 80% of what looks like cycles is simply market noise. A human mind looks for order and even an illusion of order is good enough for many people. If you look at any river from the air, it appears to have cycles, swinging right and left. Every river meanders in its valley because water flows faster in its middle than near the shores, creating turbulences that force the river to turn. Looking for short-term market cycles with a ruler and a pencil is like searching for water with a divining rod. Profits from an occasional success are erased by many losses due to unsound methods. Indicator Seasons A farmer sows in spring, harvests in late summer, and in the fall, lays in supplies for the winter. There is a time to sow and a time to reap, a time to bet on a warm trend and a time to get ready for a frost. We can apply the concept of seasons to financial markets. Taking a farmer's approach, a trader should look to buy in spring, sell in summer, go short in the fall, and cover in winter. Martin Pring developed the model of seasons for prices, but this concept works even better with technical indicators. Their seasons help recognize the current stage. This cycle was grossly distorted by the Fed's quantitative easing following the 2008 debacle, but it's likely to return, once we crawl out of the Great Recession. 123. Of the market cycle. This simple but effective model helps you buy when prices are low and sell short when they are high, setting you apart from the market crowd. We can define the seasons of many indicators by two factors, their slope as well as their position above or below the center line. For example, let's apply the concept of indicator seasons to MACD histogram. We define the slope of MACD histogram as the relationship between two neighboring bars. When MACD histogram rises below its center line, it is spring, when it rises above its center line, it is summer, when it falls above its center line, it is autumn, and when it falls below its center line, it is winter. Spring is the best season for going long, and autumn is the best season for selling short. Indicator slope position relative to center line season preferred action rising below. Spring go long rising above. Summer start selling falling above. Fall go short falling below. Winter start covering. When MACD histogram is below its center line but its slope is rising, it is spring in the market. The weather is cool but turning warmer. Most traders expect the winter to return and are afraid to buy. Emotionally, it is hard to buy because the memories of a downtrend are still fresh. In fact, spring is the best time for buying, with the highest profit potential, while risks are relatively small because we can place a protective stop slightly below the market. When MACD histogram rises above its center line, it's summer in the market and by now most traders recognize the uptrend. It's emotionally easy to buy in summer because bulls have plenty of company. In fact, profit potential in summer is lower than in spring, while the risks are higher because stops have to be farther away from the market due to heightened volatility. When MACD histogram is above its center line but its slope turns down, 
it's autumn in the market. Few traders recognize that change and keep buying, expecting summer to return. Emotionally, it's hard to sell short in autumn it requires you to stand apart from the crowd. In fact, autumn is the best time for selling short. When MACD histogram falls below its center line, it's winter in the market. By then, most traders recognize the downtrend. It is emotionally easy to sell short in winter, joining many vocal bears. In fact, the risk slash reward ratio is rapidly shifting against bears, as potential rewards are becoming smaller and risks higher because stops have to be placed relatively far away from prices. Just as a farmer must pay attention to the vagaries of weather, a trader needs to stay alert. An autumn on the farm can be interrupted by an Indian summer, and a market can stage a strong rally in the autumn. A sudden freeze can hit the fields in spring, and the market can drop early in a bull move. A trader needs to use several indicators and techniques to avoid getting whipsawed. The concept of indicator seasons focuses a trader's attention on the passage of time. It helps you plan for the season ahead instead of mindlessly following other people. 124. Volume and Time Sell 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 by summer, autumn by winter, spring. Figure 32.1 VRTX daily, MACD histogram 12-26-9. Indicator seasons. We can apply the concept of seasons to most indicators and time frames, including intraday. This can be done with a multitude of trading vehicles, even though this example focuses on the daily MACD histogram of Vertex Pharmaceuticals, Inc., a stock in the NASDAQ 100. Autumn the indicator is above the center line but falling. This is the best season for establishing shorts. Winter the indicator drops below its center line. Use weakness to take profits on short positions. Spring the indicator turns up from below its center line. It is the best time to establish longs. Summer the indicator rises above its center line. As the weather gets hot, use strength to take profits on long positions. MACD histogram looks very smooth in this example, but be prepared for brief fluctuations, both above and below the center line. Spring can be interrupted by a frost, there can be a warm spell in winter, etc. Market time we measure time using calendars and watches, but seldom stop to think that our own perceptions of time are far from universal. We keep track of time in human terms, while huge areas of life move on vastly different timelines. For example, we think that the ground under our feet is stable, while in fact continents move constantly. They traverse only a few inches per year but this is enough to radically change the face of the globe over millions of years. Within shorter time frames, weather patterns change over centuries. Ice ages and warming periods alternate with one another. 125. At the other end of the scale, there are physical particles that survive only a tiny fraction of a second. There are insects that are born, mature, procreate, and die within a single day. Turning to trading, let's keep in mind that time flows at a different speed in the market than it does for us as individuals. The market, composed of huge masses of human beings, moves at a much slower speed. The patterns you recognize on your charts may have predictive value but the turns they anticipate are likely to occur much later than you expect. The relative slowness of crowds can bedevil even experienced traders. Time and again we find ourselves entering trades too early. Beginners are typically late. By the time they recognize a trend or a reversal, that move had been underway for so long that they miss most, if not all of it. Newbies tend to chase old trends, but the more experienced analysts and traders tend to run into an opposite problem. We recognize approaching reversals and emerging new trends from far away and jump in too soon. 
We often buy before the market finishes tracing a bottom or sell short well before it completes a top. By getting in too early we can end up losing money in trends that are too slow to turn. What should we do? First of all, you need to become aware that the market time is much slower than your own. Second, consider not putting on a trade when you notice an early reversal signal. A better signal may well emerge later, especially at market tops, which take longer to form than bottoms. It pays not to be greedy and trade a smaller size. A smaller position is easier to hold while a reversal is taking its sweet time. Be sure to use multiple time frames for market analysis, this is the essence of triple screen, the system will review in a future chapter. The factor of 5 Most beginners casually pick a time frame that looks good to them it can be a daily or a 10 minute chart, or any other and ignore others. Few are aware of the fact that the market lives in multiple time frames. It moves simultaneously on monthly, weekly, daily, and intraday charts often in opposite directions. The trend may be up on the daily charts but down on the weeklies, and vice versa. Which of them will you follow? And what will you do about the intraday charts, which may well contradict either the weeklies or the dailies? Most traders ignore all time frames except for their own until a sudden move from outside of their time frame hits their account. Keep in mind that neighboring time frames are linked by the factor of approximately 5. If you start with a monthly chart and proceed to the weekly, you'll notice that there are 4.5 weeks to a month. As you switch from a weekly to a daily chart, you know that there are 5 trading days to a week. Turning to intraday analysis, you may look at an hourly chart and there are approximately 5 to 6 hours to a trading day. Day traders can proceed even further and look at 10 minute charts, followed by 2 minute charts. Each is related to its neighboring time frames by approximately the factor of 5. 126. Volume and Time. The proper way to analyze any market is to review at least two neighboring time frames. You must always start with the longer time frame for a strategic view and then switch to the shorter time frame for tactical timing. If you like using daily charts, you must first examine weekly charts, and if you want to day trade using 10 minute charts, you first need to analyze hourly charts. This is one of the key principles of the triple screen trading system. 33 Trading Time Frames how long do you plan to hold your next trade? Do you think it'll be a year, a week, or an hour? A serious trader plans the expected duration of every trade. Various time frames offer different opportunities and carry different risks. We can roughly divide all trades into three groups. One long-term trading or investing the expected duration of a position is measured in months, sometimes years. Advantages requires little day-to-day -day attention and may lead to spectacular gains. Disadvantage, drawdowns can be intolerably severe. Two swing trading the expected duration of a trade is measured in days, sometimes weeks. Advantages, a wealth of trading opportunities, fairly tight risk control. Disadvantage, will miss major trends. Three day trading the expected duration of a trade is measured in minutes, rarely hours. Advantages, great many opportunities, no overnight risk. Disadvantages, demands instant reflexes, transaction costs become a factor. If you decide to operate in more than one time frame, consider making those trades in different accounts. This will allow you to evaluate your performance in each time frame rather than lump together apples and oranges. Investing. The decision to invest or trade for the long term is almost always based on some fundamental idea. You may recognize a new technological trend or an exciting product that can greatly increase the value of a company. Investing demands a firm conviction and a great supply of patience if you are to hold that position through the inevitable pullbacks and periods of flat prices. These tough challenges make successful investing extremely hard. Major trends that are easily seen on long-term charts appear uncertain and foggy in real time, 
especially when a stock enters a drawdown. When your investment 33 trading time frames 127 drops 50% or more, wiping out the bulk of paper profits a common development for long-term positions few of us have enough conviction and fortitude to continue to hold. Let me illustrate this using an example of Apple Inc. A darling of several bull markets. AAPL survived its near-death experience in 2003, when its battered stock was rumored to be a takeover candidate, and grew to become the highest capitalized, publicly traded company in the world, before collapsing from that top in 2012. Its uptrend looks grand in retrospect, but ask yourself, honestly, would you have been able to hold though multiple drawdowns, some of them exceeding 50%. Remember that such drawdowns often mark the ends of uptrends. A sensible way to deal with the challenge of investing is to implement your fundamental idea with the help of technical trading tools. When you decide to buy, check out technical signals to ensure you're getting a relative bargain rather than paying full price. If your investment soars, use technical tools to identify overvalued zones, take your profits there and be ready to repurchase during the inevitable pullbacks. This plan demands a high degree of attention, focus, and perseverance. Figure 33.2 is an example that was taken from my trading diary. 1. 234. Figure 33.1 AAPL Weekly. Investing. The tremendous challenges of holding an investment, even a market leader like Apple Inc., can be seen on this 10 year chart. 1. 2003 AAPL collapses below $10. Company survival in question. Would you buy? 2. 2006 AAPL rallies to $86, then sinks to $51. If you had a thousand shares, would you hold? Would you sell when it got back above $80 and appeared to stall? 3. 2008 AAPL rallies to $202, drops to $115. If you had a thousand shares, showing an $87,000 drawdown, would you hold or sell? 4. 2009 AAPL recovers to $192, sinks to $78, below its previous low. Your drawdown is over 50%. Are you holding or cashing out? 128. Volume and time. 2. 3. 1. Figure 33.2 F monthly. 26 and 13 months Emma with the impulse system, auto envelope, MACD lines, and MACD histogram, and force index 13 months Emma with ATR channels. Technical analysis with fundamentals. 1 2007 Ford was on the ropes when the new CEO arrived, the man who earlier spearheaded saving Boeing. In the heady atmosphere of a bull market, Ford seemed to have a shot at recapturing its $30 high. I saw a false downside breakout coupled with a bullish divergence and bought. I then grimly held through the bear market. 2 2011 Ford spiked above its monthly channel, which was narrower at that time, tracing a kangaroo tail, while monthly MACD weakened. I took profits. 3 2011 As monthly prices stabilized in their value zone, I repurchased my position. Fundamental analysis can help you find a stock that may be worth buying. Use technical analysis to time your entries and exits. Be prepared to buy and sell more than once during a major uptrend. Swing trading While major trends and trading ranges can last for years, all are punctuated by short-term upswings and downswings. Those moves create multiple trading opportunities, which we can exploit. Many charting examples in this book feature swing trades. I especially recommend swing trading for beginning and intermediate traders. The more trades you make, the more you learn, provided you manage risk and keep good records. Swing trading teaches you faster than long-term investing, whose lessons take years to complete.
Swing trading gives you time to think, unlike day trading, which demands instant reactions. Day trading is too fast for beginners. 33 trading time frames. 129. Short term swings can be substantial enough to generate meaningful profits, without the gut wrenching drawdowns of position trades. Swing trades don't require watching the screen all day. In SPIC e trade, come, where hundreds of traders compete, most trades last a few days. Some members carry their trades for weeks and even months, while others hop in and out within hours but the holding period for most members is measured in days. Swing trading hits the sweet spot among time horizons. I piggyback one or more of the SPIC E-Trade group's picks almost every week. The chart of he's in figure 33.3 comes from my diary of one of those trades. My profit in the he's trade was $1.92 per share. You can calibrate the amount of risk you accept and the size of potential profit by deciding how many shares to trade. We'll address this essential question in chapter 50, in the section on the iron triangle of risk control. Short 75.22 Cover 73.32 Figure 33.3 He's daily, 26 and 13 day EMA with 4% envelope, MACD lines and MACD histogram, the impulse system, and 2 day force index. A swing trade Professional traders are just as comfortable selling short as buying. The signals are similar but the action quicker stocks fall twice as fast as they rise. This chart shows where I shorted the stock of Hess Corporation as it was tracing a short term double top, with bearish divergences in all indicators. I covered and took profits, as prices appeared to stall just below the value zone between the two EMAs, while the indicators became oversold. 130. Volume and Time. One of the best learning techniques involves returning to your closed out trades two months later and replace outing their charts. Trading signals that looked foggy when you saw them at the right edge of the screen become clear when you see them in the middle of your chart. Now, with the passage of time, you can easily see what worked and what mistakes you may have made. Creating these follow up charts teaches you what to repeat and what to avoid in the future. Updating the charts of closed trades turns you into your own instructor. The chart and text in figure 33.4 come from spikeytrade.com. Each week the spiker who won that week's competition posts a diary of his trade. Different people use different indicators and parameters. Peter's trade gained almost 11% in 3 days. Of course, we can't allow ourselves to get intoxicated by such numbers. A beginner looks at them, multiplies them. Sell $3.35. Buy $3.02. Figure 33.4 TRQ daily, 22 and 12 day EMA with 11% envelope, MACD lines and MACD histogram, and 20 day RSI. A swing trade near the bottom. This trade was submitted by Peter D., a long-term spiker from the Netherlands. His post was headlined fishing near the lows. Weekly conditions, indicators don't show much movement. MACD very shallow but positive and RSI slowly improving. Daily, MACD was about to confirm a positive divergence, and so was RSI. Prices dove last week but stopped near support. I set the initial entry at $3.02, in line with recent lows. It was hit on Monday morning, which turned out to be one cent above the low for the day and the week. Price closed near the high of the day and continued surging on Tuesday and Wednesday. My target was hit on Wednesday, on the way up. The rest of the day saw some pulling back, but price kept in range to close the week on a relatively high note. 33 Trading Time Frames 131. By the number of weeks in a year, and goes crazy throwing his money at the markets. Such spectacular gains are inevitably interspersed with losses. 
a professional trader carefully manages his money, quickly cuts losing trades and protects his capital to allow his equity to grow. If investing is like hunting the big game, swing trading is like rabbit hunting. If your livelihood depends on hunting, shooting rabbits is a much more reliable way of putting meals on the table. Carefully entering and exiting swing trades, while cautiously managing money, is a realistic way of surviving and prospering in the markets. Day trading Day trading means entering and exiting trades within a single market session. Rapid buying and selling in front of a flashing screen demands the highest levels of concentration and discipline. Paradoxically, it attracts the most impulsive and gambling-prone people. Day trading appears deceptively easy. Brokerage firms hide customer statistics from the public, but in 2000, state regulators in Massachusetts subpoenaed brokerage house records, which showed that after six months only 16% of day traders made money. Whatever gaps you may have in your knowledge or discipline, day trading will find them fast and hit you hard in your weak spots. In swing trading, you have the luxury of being able to stop and think, but not in day trading. The person who is learning to trade is much better off using end-of-day charts. After you grow into a consistently profitable swing trader, you may wish to explore day trading. You'll use your already developed skills and will only need to adjust to a faster game. A market newbie who stumbles into day trading is a gift to the pros. Make sure to write down your action plan for day trading, what will prompt you to enter or exit, to hold or cut. Be prepared to invest plenty of time, day trading choose up long hours in front of multiple screens. Another difficulty of day trading is that you shoot at much smaller targets. This is reflected in the height of price channels. Elsewhere in this book, you'll read that a good measure of a trader's performance is the percentage of the channel or an envelope he captures in a trade. Taking 30% or more of a channel's height earns you an A grade, while capturing 10% of that channel earns you AC. Let's apply these ratings to several stocks that are popular with day traders. The exact figures will change by the time you read this book, but today I get the following numbers for channel heights on the daily and 5 minute charts. Daily channel A trader C trader 5 minutes channel A trader C trader AAPL 55. 16.55.52.5 0.750.25 AMZ and 27. 8.12.72.2. 0.660.22 .2 Mon 7. 2.10.70.6. A swing trader who uses daily charts can do very well in these active stocks. He can really clean up if he is in a level trader, but even if he is a C trader, taking only 132 Volume and time 10% out of a channel, he can stay comfortably ahead of the game while learning to trade. On the other hand, a person who day trades the very same stocks must be a straight A trader in order to survive. Anything less and his account will be ground up by slippage, commissions, and expenses. If, after developing a successful track record as a swing trader, you decide to day trade, you'll be able to use most of the tools and techniques you've already learned. You'll find an example of using triple screen in day trading in Chapter 39. When a friend who is an Olympic rowing coach taught me to row, he focused on developing the correct stroke. A competent rower always moves his oars exactly the same way, whether it's a leisurely weekend row or the final stretch of a race. What changes are power and speed? The same with day trading, the technique is the same, but the speed is different. If you learn to swing trade, you can apply your technique to day trading. And then you can go in reverse, and apply day trading techniques to swing trade entries and exits. Day trading can be a profitable pursuit, but keep in mind that it's a highly demanding professional game and most definitely not a casual activity for beginners. PART 4 PART 6
General Market Indicators You can use technical indicators reviewed in previous chapters to analyze any trading vehicle, a stock, a future, an index, etc. Such tools as Moving Averages, MACD, Force Index, and others, can provide signals for any ticker in any time frame. Now we turn to a different group of tools, General Market Indicators, which analyze the entire market rather than any specific stock. They are worth following because general market trends are responsible for as much as half the movement in individual stocks. While there are dozens of general market indicators, this is not an encyclopedic review I'll simply share the tools that help me trade. You may use the same or different tools select those that appeal to you and test them on your market data. We can trust only those indicators that we have tested. 34 The New High, New Low Index Stocks that reach their highest level in a year on any given day are the leaders in strength. Stocks that fall to their lowest point for that year on the same day are the leaders in weakness. The New High, New Low Index tracks the behavior of market leaders by subtracting the number of new lows from the new highs. In my experience, NHNL is the best leading indicator of the stock market. In 2012, I wrote an ebook with Kerry Lovorn on the New High, New Low Index. We publish nightly updates on its signals on spikeytrade.com. 133 134 General Market Indicators How to Construct NHNL The New High, New Low Index is easy to calculate, using information that appears in many online sources and in major newspapers. NHNL equals new highs new lows. Most data services in the United States report the daily numbers of new highs and new lows, but it is shocking how loosely they define their data. Some are too narrow and track only the NYSE stocks, ignoring other exchanges. Others are too broad and track everything, including interest rate ETFs. My favorite source of reliable data is I take their data, subtract new lows from new highs, and plot the result underneath the daily chart of the S&P 500. The task of constructing NHNL is harder for traders outside the United States, in countries where such data isn't reported. There you'll need to do a bit of programming. First, run a daily scan of the database of all stocks in your country to find those that have reached the highest high and the lowest low for the year during the day. Once you have those two lists, take the above formula and apply it to the numbers you found. On the days when there are more new highs than new lows, NHNL is positive and plotted above the center line. On the days when there are more new lows than new highs, NHNL is negative and plotted below the center line. If the numbers of new highs and new lows are equal, NHNL is zero. We normally plot the new high, new low index as a line, with a horizontal reference line at a zero level. While I plot NHNL underneath the S&P 500, Keep in mind that it has a much broader reach than the S&P NHNL includes data from the NYSE, Amex, and NASDAQ, excluding only ETFs, unit investment trusts, closed-end funds, warrant stocks, and preferred securities. The chart of the S&P 500 is there simply for a comparison.